good morning and good day on behalf of aocmp 2021 organizing committee i am honored and delighted to welcome you to the 21st asia oceania congress of medical physics aocmp 2021 in dhaka bangladesh in covid 19 pandemic there are several restrictions in travel restriction in different countries quarantine protocol non issuing visa of conference and tourism for in bangladesh instruction from the health ministry and lately the omicron virus has impacted the aocmp congress but we have tried our best to give you a good congress environment to exchange views and share experiences with high level professors colleagues friends representing many well known universities and research institutes together with member of relevant international organization the scientific con contribution of this aocmp 2021 is really amazing six keynote speeches from iaea iomp afomp afom efom mefom and dgmp as well as 22 invited lectures from well known professionals have been enlightened our scientific program there are also five mini symposia with a series of panel discussion on various topics many excellent oral and poster session would have been presented by a broad group of physicists researchers students and others this session is a very special session of a afom in each year we do professor you know kyo nari inamura memorial afom oration hour and we are very grateful and it is our honor this year professor tesu sa su past president of our afom is been awarded of this professor kyo nari inamura memorial award and also this session we will see show the our life achievement award of afom to the professor endo masahiro so i am requesting our afom president professor dr orun chaugule to give this eration award to professor te suksa thank you over to professor orun uh, good morning participant good morning to all the invited speakers and the organizers welcome to aocmp 2021 which is being held in dhaka united international university and the organizers are bmps bangladesh medical physics society thanks to professor anupama and her entire team for putting on all the efforts in this odd and very, very difficult situation and making this three-day conference possible. And you can see the scientific program. It is very, very rich in the scientific content. The efforts they have done is highly admirable. The efforts they have taken, the pains they have put it. It's unfortunate because of the COVID-19 we cannot be present in person. I have planned to be there in uh, Dhaka for this conference, but the last moment because of the visa problem, I am, you can say, at the border of the Bangladesh uh, in uh, Shillong now and addressing you. As uh, uh, Professor Anupama, the Secretary General, very dynamic, very active uh, uh, person, she has told about the oration. AFOM has started this uh, Professor Kionari Inamura Memorial AFOM oration in 2018. It was during the World Congress uh, in 2018 in June. Uh, Professor Kon NG asked me, why can't you have a oration in AFOM? And that is how we started and the first oration was held in 2018 and this is the fourth AFOM oration, Kionari Inamura Memorial AFOM oration. And we are fortunate today to have uh, the orator as Professor Dr. Uh, tai Suk Su, 
who is the immediate past president and hugely contributed to the development of the AFOM initially as a secretary general and then vice president and president, thanks to Professor Tai Sook for building this AFOM on a very strong footing, which we are carrying forward. So every year, this is a ritual to start with the, the scientific program with the, the oration. And I will read the citation from the AFOM as the president of the AFOM. Kyo Nari Inamura Memorial AFOM Oration 2021. And the orator is Professor Dr. Tai Suk Su. The Kionari Inamura Memorial Affirm Oration of the Asia Oceana Federation of Organizations for Medical Physics, that is AFOM, is held annually at the Asia Oceana Congress on Medical Physics, AOCMP. It is held to honor the contribution to medical physics by Professor Inamura, who was one of the founder of and contributed significantly to the sustained development of AFOM. The 2021 orator is a professor, Dr. Tai Suk Su. Professor Su is a professor of medical physics at Department of Biomedical Engineering, director in Research Institute of Biomedical Engineering and Advanced Research Center for Medical Physics at Catholic University of Korea and whom I am associated with for last uh, almost 18 years. He obtained Bachelor of Science in Nuclear Engineering from Seoul National University of Korea and received Master's in Science and PhD in Medical Physics from the University of Florida, USA. Professor Su's career has spanned more than 40 years a period which has witnessed huge advances in radio surgery, hardware, and planning system. He has contributed greatly towards the development of radio surgery optimization technique. He was the first to understand flattening filter-free FTFLF beam-based radio surgery in the clinical setting. He also pioneered many other technologies, including the development of radiation treatment planning system and three active shield magnetic resonance imaging. Having established his academic career in Korea, Professor Su has served as an editor and editorial board member of many international journals of medical physics. He organized World Congress on Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering in 2006, WC 2006, and I have one of the participants under his hostship. Uh, and he also organized three Asia Oceana Congresses of Medical Physicists in Korea. In One is AOCMP 2002, in 2006, and 2011. As Secretary General of AOCMP, AFOM, during nine years since 2003, he has been doing a lot of job in promoting the development of medical physics in the and mutual support among the medical physics organization in the AFOM. He has been working as a chair of publication committee of IOMP for six years. He has also worked as IMPCB record and registry committee called as RRC chair. Professor Su received awards from IOMP and AFOM, outstanding contribution over the last 50 years in 2013, IDMP 2020, etc. Dr. Su published over 300 peer-reviewed papers and more than 1,300 proceedings. The Asia Oceana Federation of Organization for Medical Physics 
is honored to have Professor Tai Suk Su, the 2021 Kionari Inamura Memorial Apom Orator. The citation is signed by Professor Arun Chogle as president of the Apom. So it's a proud privilege to have Professor Tai Suk Su as the Kionari Inamura Memorial Apom fourth orator for this 2021 AOCMP. So with this uh, introduction, I hand over the floor to Professor Tai Suk Su for giving his oration speech. Professor Tai Suk Su, floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Arun Choguli, uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you very much, APOM members and my colleagues for this honored award. Uh, it is my great honor and privilege uh, to be here uh, at this special event as a speaker for Inamura Oration Session of 2021 Asia Oceania Congress of Medical Physics. Uh, first, I would like to thank our organizer of 2021 AOCMP, uh, Professor uh, Anapuma Hathin, uh, for inviting me and organizing this wonderful uh, Congress. Uh, I would also like to thank APOM President, uh, Professor Arun Chogli. APOM EXCO members and all the delegates uh, for the Congress. Okay, today uh, I am going to talk about uh, advancement of image guided technology in radiation therapy. Uh, before I give a talk, I would like to take a moment to honor uh, Professor uh, Gionari Namura. Uh, it was great sadness to know the passing of our beloved friends and colleague, uh, Professor Gionari Inamura, uh, four years ago. I personally have known Inamura for over 20 years uh, since the initiation of AFOM in 2000. Uh, Professor Inamura was a very gentle and dedicated man and Professor Inamura and I shared many ideas and enjoyed APOM related work. Professor Inamura actively organized APOM meetings, IOMP meetings, uh, Japan and Korea joint meetings. Professor Inamura organized 2008 AOCMP in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, Vietnam. I remember uh, Professor Inamura and I enjoyed touring Jeju Island in Korea at 2008 Korea-Japan joint meeting uh, when he was a president of AFOM. I worked as Secretary General of AFOM. Professor Inamura and I were very close friends and colleagues. Uh, as you see in the photos, he was always a present and dedicated to organize a form. He made a significant contribution to the growth of a form. I surely miss Kyo, and he will be always remembered in our heart. Uh, with this, I would like to now uh, give my talk. Uh, recently, advances in medical imaging technology have accelerated the development of radiation therapy. And many new imaging techn technologies have been developed and tried in medical field. Uh, since the Lenjen and Madame Curie discovered the X-ray and radium, many radiation medical equipment have been developed. X-ray, 
ultrasound, PET, CT, MRI, and diagnostic imaging, and the radium cobalt-60, and linear accelerator in radiation treatment. In currently, uh, advanced technology have been utilized in medical area, functional imagery, uh, multimodal imagery, and biological treatment and heavy particle treatment, etc. New technology, and such as 3D printing, artificial intelligence, and big data are also implemented with the current technology. And whose combined technique uh, will be uh, developed as new technique in medical physics in the future. And this diagram shows the development of medical physics technology. Uh, the technology has been developed from uh, conventional radiation therapy and diagnostic radiology uh, to advanced uh, technology. Today, I'll focus uh, more or less IGRT and biological RT. But in the beginning, a conventional imagery a modality such as general X-ray, CT, MRI were developed. But recently, more advanced imaging technology, such as functional and metabolic molecular imaging, uh, has been uh, developed and tried to utilize in clinic area to diagnose region of patients more accurately. So while all radiation therapy are more or less image guided and traditionally, especially image guided application in radiation therapy are classified into two major aspects, a multimodality imaging and 4D imaging. So in this presentation, multimodality imaging and 4D imaging in radiation therapy will be uh, highlighted with some emphasis on the principal and recent studies of our colleagues. The conventional images such as CT MRI and advanced imaging, functional and molecular imaging is very useful to define a uh, tumor and functional change. So multimodality images have been uh, utilized uh, to define the tumors and, and functional changes more accurately, uh, combining uh, various uh, single uh, image modalities. 4D images have been also applied to localize moving target accurately in radiation therapy. So in this presentation, I will let focus on the application of multimodality images and 4D images in radiation therapy. So first, I would like to uh, discuss and show some uh, uh, conventional imaging modality and advanced imaging modality. The conventional imaging modalities are uh, generally general X-ray and CT, ultrasound, MRI, nuclear medicine, uh, such as PET. I think most of you uh, already know the history of uh, conventional uh, imaging, X-ray and uh, CT, ultrasound and MRI, and PET, etc. Advanced imaging technology are high resolution imaging, functional imaging, and molecular imaging, and virtual reality imaging. And this shows some example of advanced imaging modalities 
Uh, this shows a case to measure the sensible smell and uh, using a uh, functional MRI. And molecular imagery is very useful to find out molecular change of early stage of cancer. So uh, now first, uh, I'd like to uh, discuss multimodality images. So if I talk about the application of multimodality image in radiation therapy, uh, I would like to show some of the application used in uh, diagnostic uh, imaging uh, for investigating the tumor definition and functional change. Uh, this table shows the typical characteristics of CT, MRI, and PET. As you see in this table, CT is a suitable for obtaining an accurate localization without a distortion. MRI is good uh, for obtaining a detailed morphology, especially showing good tumor uh, detection in soft tissue. PET is uh, uh, better uh, for evaluating the pathology and detecting uh, staging malignancy. So if we combine uh, these image modalities, we can obtain the advantage of each image. So why do we need to uh, use multimodality imagery? And uh, when we combine anatomic imagery, uh, CT, MR, with uh, biological imaging, SPEC, PET, MR spectro spectroscopy, uh, we can uh, generate hybrid imaging, uh, that is multimodality imaging, PET, CT, PET, MRI. Uh, this multimodality image are very useful for investigating the tumor uh, definition and functional change. Here is one example uh, for defining a tumor using PET MRI, although the PET image is unclear. Uh, however, the target is well defined. So when we fuse uh, PET with the MRI, we can see the uh, clear target with a nice morphology in MR. Uh, this shows the multi, uh, uh, this is another example uh, uh, to utilize the multimodality images. The multimodality images are very useful for diagnosing uh, especially neurodegenerative uh, diseases such as uh, Parkinson's uh, or uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, using a PET MRI or a SPECT MRI. We did, we did a lot of research, but uh, I will not discuss this issues in detail here. Uh, you might see more information uh, in my uh, previous uh, publication. Uh, this shows a multi-parametric mapping based on functional uh, maps. So uh, generally in MR imaging, high-grade uh, glioma indicate the high blood flow rate in RCBB imaging, so a regional uh, uh, cerebral blood volume map and uh, low diffusion coefficient in ADC map, uh, F, uh, apparent diffusion coefficients map. So using uh, this uh, uh, multi-parametric mapping image, we can uh, easily uh, localize uh, the tumors here easily uh, because the high value is clearly presented in this region through uh, this multi-parametric mapping procedure. 
therefore, uh, multimodal and uh, post-processed images are used to determine the high-risk tumor volume in a high-grade glioma. As you see in this uh, figure, you can extract a malignant uh, residual tumor volumes on ADC map uh, with a, a quantitative analysis of uh, for uh, suspicious high risk region. So uh, now I'm going to uh, discuss the application of multimodality imagery used in uh, radiation therapy. Uh, CT is generally used in radiation therapy uh, because the dose is directly correlated with the CT number. Uh, MRI and PET are also used to define tumor more accurately. Uh, this shows the dose distri uh, distribution on combined CT MR images, uh, which is helpful for confirming uh, radiation coverage in radiation therapy uh, planning. Okay, this is another example of utilizing multimodality images in RT radiation therapy. And this figure shows the tumor shape of non-small cell carcinoma. Uh, in left uh, figure, uh, the target is shown as a blue or a green uh, line using the soft tissue and a long window of the CT. In light figure, the target is shown as a red line from PET. Uh, the target from PET is uh, uh, more clear uh, with a 36% uh, reduction in the planning target volume, uh, which is quite good in radiation therapy uh, to minimize the dose to the normal structure. Uh, recently, uh, biological radiation therapy techniques have been developed using the multifunctional images. A biological RT technique includes software to analyze a functional images, analysis of biological parameters based on multifunctional images and mapping of the biological parameters on tumor volume. And this slide shows our research for applying various functional images and molecular imaging to evaluate the radiation effect. The result, we can see the, some uh, radiation effect here uh, through the uh, animal uh, study. Uh, actually, we collaborated with the molecular imaging team at Stanford University, MIPS, uh, to evaluate the radiation treatment effect on memory carcinoma cancer cell uh, using multimodality uh, molecular imaging. Uh, so multimodality image is very useful to define the tumor and functional change. However, before we apply multimodality imaging to human, it's very important to evaluate the uh, registration algorithm uh, using uh, uh, algorithm using the phantom. So we developed a brain and lung phantom, and this is a whole procedure how to uh, verify the registration algorithm. Uh, most of uh, verification of a registration error uh, uh, was within uh, one or two millimeter, uh, which is uh, acceptable in medical imaging. Then we can apply the uh, multimodality image to the human. So now I'm going to talk about the application of 4D images in radiation therapy. <clears throat> Excuse me.
Uh, an article, this article uh, that explained the necessity of image guided radiation therapy, what is called IGRT, was published in Nature in 2012 by uh, David Jeffrey. And so uh, in this article, the IGRT is very useful uh, to treat the uh, uh, moving target in radiation therapy. I'll briefly discuss uh, uh, these four steps, localization and planning, verification and delivery of IGRT. The first, uh, localization. The localization of the moving target is based on respiratory signal uh, and or uh, image guidance. So uh, respiratory signal usually uh, used for uh, gating the radiation beam and image guidance uh, is useful uh, for tracking the uh, radiation beam. <clears throat> so uh, in this figure, we can obtain the respiratory signal using a spirometer and some ester and bell transducer and CCD camera is useful confirm the uh, position again. Uh, this diagram shows the entire procedure uh, for developing a, a respiratory signal acquisition system. As shown in this figure, uh, the signal from the uh, bell tune inducer as well matches with the uh, real uh, uh, fluoroscopic data. So, Uh, so we can see the, we can compare the, uh, some respiratory signal from belt inducer uh, to compare with the real uh, movement of the uh, target uh, using uh, uh, fluoroscopic data. And this shows the multiple respiratory signals uh, obtained from uh, uh, acquisition system uh, that we uh, developed a long time ago. Uh, this system can analyze a respiratory signal obtained from various uh, sensors, uh, spirometer, bell trends, and CCD camera. And uh, this system is very useful for verifying the accuracy of the respiratory signals uh, by comparing signals from uh, each uh, sensor. So as you see here, uh, two signals show same pattern, uh, which seems to be uh, reliable. And this slide shows our, our respiratory guide, uh, guidance system on the abdominal compression. So the developed uh, system consists of uh, abdominal compression pad, a gas pressure sensor, and a, a visual a biofeedback device. Uh, we expect that the system improves the quality of respiratory motion management uh, because of its capability of providing a a real-time uh, surrogating signal on the compression and enabling a uh, visual uh, biofeedback. For the image guidance is a direct method for localizing a moving target. Uh, although a 4D MRI and 4D pad are used to evaluate the motion of the target, a 4D CT is typically employed to obtain a more accurate localization of a moving target. In past years, in both geometry computed tomography, IGCT, uh, what we call, uh, uh, we, we can compare with the uh, 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 beam uh, computer tomography, uh, but IGCT is very useful 
to localize moving target. This IGCT consists of a uh, uh, large array of source and small detector system. Uh, we investigate the 4D IGCT imaging method for radiation therapy, but uh, I'm not going to discuss this method in detail here. Uh, you can refer to the paper published it, uh, in PMB uh, this year. Uh, but uh, in conclusion, the 4D IGCT uh, show a very uniform image intensity while uh, Combeam CT shows uh, some uh, not uh, shows not uniform uh, uh, image intensity. Also, IGCT uh, produce less scatter and less combeam artifact. Therefore, uh, IGCT uh, could be good for the localization of the moving target uh, in the future. Uh, let me introduce more image guidance researches for the localization of the moving target. Uh, we developed a uh, respiratory guided uh, 4D uh, digital thermosynthesis to improve image quality and uh, reduce uh, imaging dose. Uh, you can refer to uh, this paper published in PMB Journal. And uh, Dr. Yamamoto team at UC Davis uh, developed a pulmonary functional IGLT using 4D CT ventilation imaging. Uh, please also uh, report to the Journal of the Medical Physics and Red Journal for more information. So planning. Uh, uh, this shows the whole procedure of image guided Adaptive radiation therapy planning and uh, 4D uh, planning is required uh, for IGLT planning. Uh, we need to uh, develop many advanced techniques uh, to enable 4D uh, planning. I will not discuss those techniques in detail here uh, because of limited time. I will uh, introduce uh, re uh, research based. IGRT RTP system uh, that we developed a few years ago. Uh, this is a prototype of IGRT RTP system. Uh, it's not for commercialization. Uh, we implemented many useful modules for IGRT study, uh, corrected the software, and uh, still improving uh, this system. Uh, we compared our uh, plans from this system with the commercialized RTP system uh, for the, some uh, clinical studies. Uh, recently, uh, we have tried to implement artificial intelligence and big data to investigate the possibility uh, of AI-based RTP system. We also investigated the usefulness of 4D planning compared to a 3D planning. And this shows the study to evaluate dose in the target and normal tissue using 3D and 4D dose planning for a liver SVRT cases. As shown in uh, DVH and the table, uh, we could confirm was significant dose difference in both the target volume and the normal tissue for liver SBRT cases uh, uh, between uh, 3D planning and 4D planning. So therefore, uh, 4D planning is needed for the accurate dose calculation for the uh, moving target. So next verification, uh, the main concern in 4D verification is to check the uh, position and dose of moving organs. Uh, the verification of a moving target is very difficult. 
as the motion uh, cause uh, many uh, variation. Generally, uh, there are many uncertainties in localization, planning, and delivery uh, conducted by human and machine. So uh, it's very important to verify the accuracy uh, with regard to uh, each part. To uh, evaluate the moving target, uh, we uh, developed various type of moving phantoms. Uh, I'm going to show some of our uh, development. Uh, this diagram shows the entire procedure for developing the moving phantom. Okay. Uh, this shows uh, uh, some programmable nonlinear uh, moving phantom uh, simulating patient motion. Uh, first, the 40 CT patient data were transferred to a personal computer and motion control software uh, was employed to control the uh, moving phantom. Uh, finally, the motion was uh, verified by a stereo uh, uh, CCD camera. Uh, this thing is very nice to, ch uh, to check the dose of the organ uh, in patient. Recently, we developed a 4DA moving phantom to simulate internal uh, tumor motion. Uh, this figure uh, show component of a 40 moving phantom, uh, three axis motion platform and motor drive and uh, power supply and dosimetric phantom and imaging and phantom and, <clears throat> and surrogate motion uh, can be uh, recreated for monitoring motion uh, such as belt and uh, camera system. So to control the uh, 40 uh, uh, moving phantom and the personal computer uh, dedicated uh, motion control software was implemented and model phase or real uh, clinical uh, data. Uh, can be recreated using the uh, developed software. So we tested this 40 moving phantom in linear room, uh, assuming a real uh, patient uh, treatment, uh, and the result uh, was good. In addition to a sweet rigid body motion, we developed a deformer along phantom. Uh, this phantom was developed to investigate the possibility of a real uh, deformer long phantom, uh, which I will uh, some uh, discussed uh, later. Uh, we acquired 40 city images of a deformer phantom during uh, breathing cycles, and then evaluate uh, the formation magnitude uh, using image uh, subtraction. I think it's still challenging to develop 4D deformal moving phantom to simulate exact deformal motion of a patient. Uh, this shows the film dosimetry. Uh, of a static target and a moving target, uh, planning and static and moving with a 10 millimeter, moving with 20 millimeter. So static uh, uh, actually distribution is quite uh, similar to the planning as we expect. 
Uh, however, when the target move, you know, the more, then we can obtain more broad uh, those this uh, those distribution. So therefore, uh, uh, we need forty uh, those plan. Uh, usually uh, in IGLT, we consider a uh, uh, big movement of the target, but how can it consider very small or tiny movement of the target, especially under the immobilization? So in this study, we propose a new verification system that used the uh, tactile array sensors to verify very small movement under the immobilization. A computer can evaluate and provide error image map. Uh, therefore, we should consider patient alignment error even under the immobilization too. So uh, <coughs> finally, excuse me, uh, a delivery. <clears throat> Uh, 4D delivery is uh, based on gating or tracking. A uh, tracking is a direct method. However, it's difficult uh, to track a moving target. Uh, I would like to show some research work regarding uh, dynamic MLC, DMLC tracking uh, conducted in collaboration with uh, Stanford research teams a few years ago. Uh, among the feasible 4D delivery solutions, uh, dynamic DMLC, uh, uh, dynamic MLC, uh, what we call DMLC, tumor motion tracking, uh, was introduced uh, by uh, Dr. Paul Kiel's group. Uh, DMLC tracking uh, is very uh, nice and fast. However, the tracking efficiency is limited by a poor delivery efficiency, especially for tracking a perpendicular uh, to the leap direction. If the a target moves uh, along the leap direction, it's okay. But however, if the target move perpendicular to the uh, leap direction, then it's very difficult to, to track the target. So main concern is how fast the DMLC can uh, track a, a target motion. So as you see in this figure, uh, the tracking efficiency is limited by a MLC, a mechanical constraint, especially the fast uh, tumor motion perpendicular to the MLC deep uh, travel direction. So the efficiency was decreasing as movement is faster, as you see in this figure. So real-time tracking is not a good uh, for the moving target, especially perpendicular to the leap direction. So as an alternative solution to the real-time tracking, uh, we investigated the moving average tracking. And this slide shows a schematic of the moving average tracking study. And this work was performed as a collaborative research with Paul Kills Group. At Stanford, the moving average tracking algorithm uh, was implemented in the DMLC tumor tracking system. And using the 4D phantom, the moving average tracking performance was evaluated in terms of uh, delivery efficiency and geometry and dosimetry accuracy. 
So when we use moving average tracking, all the efficiencies were improved. And these two guys were my uh, PhD students. And this is Paul K, uh, who is now in Sydney University. And, and this work was published in Medical Physics Journal. So uh, let's briefly talk about some new technology. This new technology about 3D printing, AI, and big data are implemented with image guided technology in radiation therapy. And this slide shows our current research using 3D printing, AI, and big data. Uh, we uh, developed the bolus for electron treatment using a, a 3D a printing and technique uh, using uh, uh, the uh, imaging modality. We also uh, developed AI-based RTP system using uh, AI and big data. Uh, let me show some uh, our result. Uh, actually, we cooperate with the UC Davis to develop 4D long phantom using 3D printing to confirm uh, pulmonary, pulmonary functional IGRT. Uh, this is a model which we uh, suggested and uh, presented in WAPM and in other uh, Congress. And uh, this work was uh, uh, published in last year. Uh, this is a prototype of AI-based RTP system that we developed recently. And this shows how we utilize artificial intelligence and big data for RTP planning. No contour, no dose calculation, and no uh, big data, uh, so etc. cetera. Uh, I will discuss in detail here. So in the future, uh, so new technologies such as uh, artificial intelligence and big data will be very uh, useful to uh, combine with the image guide the radiation therapy uh, technology. In summary, the medical uh, physics technology has been uh, so rapidly developed. The analysis of multimodality images such as a pass it to a PET MRI and image registration uh, provide a useful information for uh, delineating the target volume for uh, radiation therapy planning. A more reliable definition of the local tumor volume leads to better definitive local control through clinical studies. Uh, we need biological imaging tools for the better definition of the tumor volume using various multi modality and advanced imaging technique. We need to develop a more accurate time and reserve the 4D localization technique for modeling the intrafraction organ motion using a 4D imaging technique. We should develop new 4D radiation treatment planning possibly AI-based RTP in the future and delivery scheme, incorporating the motion deformation of the organ. Definitely, we need the accurate verification system and AI and big data could be important modality in image guidance, radiation therapy in the future. Uh, I believe that a well-prepared uh, protocol and high technology uh, regarding image guided technique uh, are crucial for radiation therapy to uh, move forward. Uh, finally, I would like to thank all the colleagues who support this uh, presentation. Uh, uh, this is the last slide. A uh, long time ago, uh, uh, Professor Gyo Inamura find out uh, the idea of APOM logo uh, from this scene. 
Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Facebook, sir, for your nice and excellent presentation on imaging techniques. And we are very grateful and we are very happy to have you this award. Thank you, Facebook. Now it's the time to have the AFOM Lifetime Achievement Award. So I am, we are honored, AFOM is honored to have this Lifetime Achievement Award in this year, AOCMP 2021, Professor Masahiro Endo. So I am giving this award something about him. Lifetime Achievement Awards of the Asia Oceania Federation of Organizations for Medical Physics Recognized Persons for their outstanding contribution to medical physics education, training, research, and medical physics profession development in AFOM region. The award was established in 2020, and Professor M. Endo has been awarded this honor in 2021 for his enduring contributions to a large range of medical physics activities in the AFOM region. Masahiro Endo entered the University of Tokyo in 1967, earning a bachelor's degree in 1971, and a master's degree in 1973 in the field of physical science. After working at the National Institute of Radiological Sciences, NIRS, on development and application of medical imaging devices, such as CT and PET, he received his PhD in the field of medical science from Chiba University in 1982. It is characteristics for the broad view taken by Professor Endo on medical physics that he applied his expertise on imaging to the evolving research project to treat cancer using heavy ion beams. He joined the HEMAC Heavy Ion Medical Accelerator in Chichiba Construction Group, where in addition to image guidance and motion management work, he developed the three-dimensional treatment planning system, high plan, that continued to be used until 2012. Masahiro Endo was promoted to Director of Medical Physics at NIRS in 2001 and joined at the Saga Himat project as the Chief Technical Officer. Here was the instrumental in the construction of the fourth heavy ion radiotherapy facility in Japan. One of the Professor Endo's most important contributions to science has been the development of a cone beam CT system in the 1990s. This was a visionary achievement for which he was awarded several awards from the Japanese government. He also was named one of the outstanding medical physicists to celebrate the 20th anniversary of AFOM in 2020. In addition to all his scientific and development work, Professor Endo was actively involved in the professional life. He laid the founding of the Japan Society of Medical Physics, JSMP, in 2000 and served the organization as president for 10 years and auditor for three years. He also served as the organizing chair of the 5th Ocean Asia Oceania Congress of Medical Physics, AOCMP, which was held simultaneously at the fourth Japan-Korea meeting in 2005. It is an app that Professor Endo's most recent work includes a history of medical physics, radiology physics technology 2021, a history to which he has contributed significantly. AFOM would like to congratulate Professor Endo to being awarded the AFOM Lifetime Achievement Award 2021. Thanks, and we are congratulate Masahira Endo. So I, I would like to uh, request to, to give you a certificate on the Life Achievement Award. And this <coughs> is the Professor Masahira Endo. We are very happy and you are a distinguished career for your, in your fields and serving the profession and community, AFUM is providing this Lifetime Achievement Award 2021.
Now I would like to request you to say something about this. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Thank you, Hassan and Pama Azahari. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, today I am delighted and honored to receive the prestigious Ahon Lifetime Achievement Award. I would like to say a few words of thanks. First of all, I would like to thank the Ahon's Award and Honors Committee and Executive Committee for their great effort in selecting this award. I would also like to express my respect and gratitude for the effort of the President and other organizers who held the Congress in the unprecedented difficulty of the COVID-19 COVID pandemic. Ahon was founded 21 years ago at the International Conference on Medical Physics in Chicago, with just over 10 representatives, including myself. At first, Ahon was a very small organization and the 2005 Kyoto Congress, which I held as the president, had very little participant from Ahon countries, except Japan and South Korea. However, a large number of presentations will be submitted at this DACA meeting, DACA Congress. And I think that hundreds of, hundreds of people will participate, including online. I hope that Ahon will develop further and become the center of the world in medical physics and contribute to the health and welfare of humankind. Finally, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to everyone who participates in this ceremony. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Endo. So we have now at the end of the session. So I would like to request Dr. Oun Jagle to have some concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lupoma. Congratulations to Professor Tai Suk Su for the prestigious Professor Kionari Inamura Memorial Affirm Oration. Congratulations to Professor Masahira Endo for the Affirm Lifetime Achievement Award 2021 for his great contribution for the development of medical physics, uh, especially in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you, Masahira, and also thank you for joining live. Thank you, Professor uh, Su, for joining live. Thanks to the organizers for making all these efforts to make this conference successful. And I know how much uh, uh, stressful, how much hard work they have put in to make this conference successful. Despite of that thing, I see a smile on the face of Anupama. Yes, why not? The beginning we have done is a great beginning. And you can look at the scientific program, the entire team under her leadership, and also Professor Jakaria, back of them uh, supporting has uh, made this conference. Also, thanks to United International University, uh, which has given the platform the space. It's unfortunate that uh, because of the difficult situation, we are not there in person, but the great efforts uh, by BMPS, great efforts by UIU and every one of you. And also thanks to uh, Nitu Gupta and uh, her team for the technical support, flawless support they have given. Thanks to them because the technology is very, very important in this era when you are doing virtually. So we had a very informative and very good uh, oration by a very renowned Professor Tai Suk Su. And also we have heard remarks from uh, Professor Masahira Indo, 
about his uh, achievement of getting the form lifetime achievement award with these words thanking each one of you who have contributed directly indirectly for the development of this form and also the aocmp 21 thanking with this thing i hand over the floor to anupama and i think uh, the next sessions regarding she will talk about so thank you once again each one of you thank you professor arun and professor tesu professor endo for your kind presence and your live presence and now we are ending this sessions so we are going to our next session in 10:30 in bdt time and in the meantime from 10 to 10:30 there will be the sponsor promotional video so thank you all and have a nice week so Thank you, Arunan, Anapoma, and also congratulations, uh, Professor Endo. I'll see you in next session. Okay, bye.
I still remember that morning, the day I first set foot on the campus as a student. I couldn't imagine that the campus of a private university is so large. Yes, I'm talking about United International University. Built on 25 bigas of land, 30% is built up area and 70% is open space. There was a large corridor in front with a lot of students. I went ahead with a surprised look. As soon as I entered the class, all the new faces stared at me. They were my university classmates. Sir entered the classroom, lesson started. The way of teaching was different. He explained everything in a simple way. Beyond theory classes, there were associated laboratory classes on different subjects. A large number of computer labs for meeting the needs of CSE students. Socket lab, machine lab, digital lab, microprocessor lab, communication lab. All are equipped with modern setup for producing competent AAA graduates. Civil engineer labs to prepare civil engineer students to design and build modern infrastructure. The robotics lab is the place for innovation and discovery in this era of fourth industrial revolution. In advanced intelligent multidisciplinary systems lab, researchers are exploring the application of IT in multifaceted domains including health sector. Center for Energy Research, CER, is dedicated to the research in producing clean energy. It is thus helping the country to combat against effects of climate change. It has modern servers and data centers of international standard to keep the campus live online without interruption for a second. Proverb goes that the more you read, the more you learn, there is a spacious library stuffed with so many books and a pleasant calm environment for serious reading. Spending time with friends in a lovely green environment was really very exciting. Large playground over the horizon cannot be forgotten. Suddenly, I was in trouble. It would be too late to get money from home. A friend advised me to go to the DSA office. I went and got an interest-free education loan. What a relief it was for me. There is no end to the benefits. There's a game room, gymnasium, nice canteen, large auditorium, plenty of benefits. Is it possible to pass without good results? So study, study and study. I got scholarships several times along with many of my classmates. The wheel of success of this organization is moving forward under the leadership of our Honorable VC Sir, Professor Dr. Chaudhary Mafizur Rahman. And that's why United International University has been accredited by ACBSP, IEB, SEMA, and has been ranked in Asia by QS. The main secret behind this is the quality of education and all the modern facilities. Time passes by. A special day comes. I got the certificate of graduation from the chancellor. Today, during my busy schedules at work, even though I'm far away, I still remember the key contributor of my success, the United International University. Today, Graduates of United International University are working successfully in home and abroad, bearing the flag of this noble institution, United International University, quest for excellence. Launching a new era. PTW Beam Scan, the new water phantom. Automated, wireless, fast. PTW.
beams you up to a new era in 3D water scanning. Cancer touches us all in one way or another. That's why we're dedicated to connecting all care to realize a world without fear of cancer. We're achieving that through intelligent cancer care, through building shorter paths from research to remission, bridging the distance between Manhattan and Mozambique, driving a direct link from high tech to high impact, and resolutely facing today's unique challenges by connecting the world through more personalized treatment, more data-driven decision-making, more direct access to care, and a new, more unifying, smarter standard on oncology. We're all connected through intelligent cancer care. We're not waiting for the future. We're creating it. Imagine radiation treatment that's easier, more efficient, and delivers therapies in record time without compromising on quality. Because quality of care is so important, there's innovative beam shaping technology combined with 100% image guidance and patient positioning. This is a new way of thinking, a transformation designed to help more patients enhance their well-being and comfort in less time. Together with our customers, we've led radiotherapy innovation for years. Now we're creating its future. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, Akhtar. Good to see you. Hello. 
Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21st Asia Oceania Congress of Medical Physics. Hosted uh, plenary session one, hosted in the online hall A. We have the pleasure to introduce you to Professor Thomas Kwan and Dr. Muhammad Akhtar Zaman. Professor Thomas Kwan, after he migrated to Australia in 1989, where he commenced his career in radiotherapy in physics. Then in 2001, he moved to Canada, where he worked the London. London Regional Cancer Center on the commissioning of the one of the first chemotherapy units. In 2005, Thomas became principal research physicist at Peter McCullum Cancer Center in Melbourne, Australia, where he is now director of physical science. Thomas holds academic appointments at Wollongong, RMIT, and Melbourne University. Now in 2021, he has an interest in the education of medical physicists, dosimetry of ionizing radiation, image guidance, and clinical trials demonstrated by more than 90 invited conference presentation and 300 papers in referee journals. <clears throat> now, uh, Professor Thomas Kwan is our chair and our co-chair is Dr. Mohammed Akhtar Zaman. He completed his, his graduation in medical physics. In the same year, he joined as a faculty of member of medical physics at the same university because of his academic excellence. Then he moved to Ahasania Mission Cancer and General Hospital, Dhaka, to enrich his professional skill in radiation oncology physics. Dr. Akhtar Zaman is currently working as a head of medical physics at the Labid Cancer Hospital since November 2018. In the meantime, he has been awarded as a Doctor of Philosophy in Medical Physics from the Maria Skodowska Curie National Research Institute of Oncology, Warsaw, Poland. Dr. Akhtar Zaman is currently contributing to BMPS as General Secretary and always actively work for any conference or workshop organized by BMPS. He is also a member of Science Committee of the Asia Oceania Federation of for Medical Physics. Now I hand over the authority to conduct this session to our chair and co-chair, Thomas Kwan and Dr. Akhtar Zaman. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, since this program is really broadcast all around the world, I would like to start by saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, uh, wherever you are uh, in the world to join us for this session. I'm greatly honored uh, to have the opportunity to chair this session, and I'm even more honored to chair this session uh, with my friend and colleague, Akta, uh, who has been involved in the organizing committee of this conference. I would like to start off by thanking the organizers uh, for putting together a fantastic program uh, under rather challenging uh, conditions. Uh, I very much look forward to the conference and I hope everyone here is also looking forward to this session, uh, which has three highly distinguished speakers uh, lined up. Uh, I do not want to uh, uh, take too much time in the introduction uh, because I want to give the speakers as much opportunity uh, to present as possible. Uh, I would like to also just note that the speakers will present very distinguished organizations uh, uh, internationally, IAEA, IOMP, and AFOM, and I don't really need to introduce any of them uh, to a great uh, extent. However, I want to notice something which is quite interesting and distinguishing in all three of them. These speakers are highly distinguished in their international organizations, but they are also excellent scientists. Uh, and what we are going to hear is both the reflection on science and medical physics as a profession, as well as an international view of all this. 
And I would like to start uh, off by introducing uh, Ola Holmberg, uh, who is from the IEA. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, my Zoom environment does not give me the CV, the very distinguished CV of all the, the speakers. Uh, so I can just say that I had the pleasure of, of meeting Ola many, many years ago. And I've always really admired his presentations, uh, which combine the sense of good governance with the science uh, of uh, good medical physics uh, and more. So I would like, without uh, further ado, uh, hand over uh, to, to Ola Holmberg uh, for his presentation on radiation protection, education, and training of health professionals. Uh, please, Ola. Hello, my name is Ola Holmberg, and I'm the head of the Radiation Protection of Patients Unit at the International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA, in Vienna. First of all, many thanks to the organizers for inviting the IAEA to talk about radiation protection, education and training of health professionals. And before I proceed, I would also like to acknowledge my colleague Jenia Vasilva, who has provided some of these slides here. So why speak about radiation protection, education and training of health professionals in a plenary session on recent advancement on medical physics? Well, I think it's a fundamental topic. It's of fundamental importance for the safety of patients, workers and the public. And I would like to remind you uh, about uh, what the ICRP has said in uh, uh, some publication, that purchasing new equipment without a concomitant effort on education and training is dangerous. The International Atomic Energy Agency has the mandate to work for the safe, secure and peaceful uses of nuclear science and technology contributing to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. A fundamental statutory function of the IAEA is to establish standards of safety and to provide for the implementation of these standards in all fields of application of ionizing radiation, including in medicine. The international safety standards place requirements on radiation protection in medical uses of ionizing radiation. Medical uses of radiation is one of the high technology areas of medicine and one of the most rapidly developing areas. And while technology development, including equipment and software, has an extreme importance for the effective diagnosis and therapeutic outcome for patients, humans behind the machines who develop the technology and who use this technology in clinics are the keys to it all. Medical uses of ionizing radiation involve a number of health professionals performing diagnostic examinations, interventional procedures or treatment, whose knowledge, skills and competence are of critical importance for the radiation protection and safety of patients, workers and the public. The IAEA Safety Standards, GSR, Part 3, or the International Basic Safety Standards, require specialist education and training in a particular discipline, including radiation protection and safety, for each of the key roles of the radiological medical practitioner, the medical radiation technologist, the medical physicist, the radiopharmacist, and for the referring medical practitioner. There are also many other professionals who are involved and who also need knowledge on radiation use and risks tailored to their specific role. Specific roles and responsibilities for ensuring compliance with these requirements are delegated to governments, to the regulatory authorities, to licensees of the medical radiological facilities and professional bodies. So how do we define the competence of health professionals? Well, the competence is defined as the ability to do something successfully or efficiently 
and includes acquiring needed knowledge or the theoretical basis, the skills or the ability to apply this knowledge, and the attitude or the personal and interpersonal behaviour needed to perform duties with high quality and safety. The acquiring and maintaining of competence in a particular health profession involving the use of uh, ionizing radiation includes a whole learning pathway and this should include competence in radiation protection and safety. So what are the key documents shaping the program of the IAEA when it comes to education and training of health professionals in radiation protection and safety? Well, the first one to mention and the most fundamental one is the IAEA statute from 1956. This was approved by the Conference on the Statutes of the International Atomic Energy Agency, which was held at the headquarters of the United Nations. And it states the mandate of the IAEA to include, to establish or adopt standards of safety for protection of health and minimization of danger to life, yes. and to provide for the application of these standards. We have already mentioned the International Basic Safety Standards, or GSR Part 3, as it is also known. But this is the second one of the fundamental documents for shaping the program. The current International Basic Safety Standards were published in 2014. It was jointly sponsored by uh, these organizations that you can see on screen here. And while it's not mandatory for member states, it's part of the standards that the IAEA must use in its own operations and which states then can apply by means of their regulatory provisions for nuclear and radiation safety. And many member states do uh, adopt uh, these um, standards. The text in the International Basic Safety Standards um, mentions the following that the regulatory body shall ensure that the authorization for medical exposures to be performed at a particular medical radiation facility allows personnel to assume the responsibilities specified in these standards only if they meet the respective requirements for education, training and competence in radiation protection. And these um, Specified personnel includes the radiological medical practitioners, medical physicists and medical radiation technologists and also other health professionals with specific duties in relation to radiation protection of patients. The third key document that I would like to mention here for shaping the program of the IAEA on education and training uh, in radiation protection is the SSG 46 or the Specific Safety Guide 46 on radiation protection and safety in medical uses of ionizing radiation that was published in 2018. This document was jointly sponsored by the IAEA, the International Labour Organization, the Pan American Health Organization and the World Health Organization and it provides guidance on fulfilling the requirements of the international basic safety standards with respect to medical uses specifically of uh, ionizing radiation. And just to quote the SSG 46 here, uh, it says that the education, training, qualification and competence of the respective health professionals underpin radiation protection and safety in medical uses of ionizing radiation. And further, it states that the institutes and organizations that provide education and training in radiation protection to health professionals should use the international BSS and this safety guide as resources on the requirements for radiation protection and safety in medical uses of radiation. The final key document I would like to highlight 
for you for shaping the program is the bond call for action from 2012. This bond call for action came out of the International Conference on Radiation Protection in Medicine held in Bonn, Germany in 2012. It was organized by the IAEA and co-sponsored by the World Health Organization. And the Bonn Call for Action contains 10 actions to improve radiation protection in medicine in the next decade, as agreed at that conference. And uh, out of these different actions, action number four is to strengthen radiation protection education and training of health professionals. And I would just like to highlight a couple of sub-actions to this uh, uh, Bonn Call for Action number four. And the first one is to prioritize radiation protection education and training for health professionals globally, targeting professionals using radiation in all medical and dental areas. So this is uh, what we are discussing here now. Second one is to further develop the use of newer platforms such as specific trainings applications on the internet for reaching larger groups for training purposes. And that's what I'm gonna go into uh, in the next part of the presentation and show how the IAEA is doing this. And um, the fifth sub action here is to pay particular attention to the training of health professionals in situations of implementing new technology. And this is what I started off the presentation with uh, mentioning. The next section of this talk, I will give some examples of programmatic activities of the IAEA when it comes to education and training in the radiation protection of patients. And I will try to show um, how some newer platforms are used for the uh, specific application of uh, reaching larger groups when it comes to training in this uh, topic. So training activities in radiation protection of patients or RPOP are done either in person or as online based activities. And this is an overview of the different uh, activities uh, that we have. And I will give some examples uh, from uh, all of these. The in-person training are done as training courses and workshops through the IAEA Technical Corporation or as fellowships or individual or group scientific visits. We have the pandemic now, of course, but the last proper year we had for in-person training, 2019, we held 48 regional and national training courses and workshops in radiation protection of patients with 1,450 participants under both regional and national technical cooperation projects. So that's the in-person training, but we also have a lot of material online for distribution. And these are three examples here of free training packages where there are numerous PowerPoint slides. In total, we provide 13 free training packages on topics in radiation protection in medicine. And the material here reflects the IAEA standards and the international consensus on best practice. They are all available in English and some of them are also available in Spanish and Russian. They are for free download and use by trainers. They may be copied, distributed and displayed as long as you acknowledge the source of the material and they can freely also be incorporated into customized presentations. We are also trying out other types of hybrid material. Uh, this particular example here was launched in 2021. It's the radiation safety culture trade talks. So radiation safety culture in healthcare. And it's a handbook for students that you can download it's intended for in-person workshops, but it's complemented by digital presentations 
on how medical facilities can address improvements in safety culture in practice. Our POP started providing e-learning courses at the end of 2016 and there have been more than 12,000 users to date. Uh, here are four examples of e-learning courses. Uh, dose management in uh, computed tomography, safety and quality in radiotherapy, uh, radiation protection in fluoroscopy guided interventional procedures and uh, also um, a specific uh, course for radiographers on tips and tricks in radiation protection. And um, these are available in English, all of them, and also some in other languages. One of the newer e-learning courses has another format. It's uh, on radiation protection and interventional procedures, and it contains 13 short interactive videos with practical tutorials. And um, the focus is to learn the effect of various factors on patient and staff dose. We have also a fairly new uh, e-learning course on radiation protection in dental radiology intended for dentists and other dental professional staff, and it contains of, uh, nine modules. Our POP webinars are also done quite uh, regularly since 2016, and um, to date there have been uh, well over 10,000 participants from 100 member states attending these. These are online lectures on topics in radiation protection of patients and workers. And they're done in different languages. They're often held in cooperation with uh, other organizations such as the IOMP. Like the e-learning, they are free to register to and to attend. And after a webinar has been held, the recording is available for viewing. So all of this material that I've presented and much more than that is available on the RPOP website and if you haven't looked at it just Google RPOP and it'll be top of the list. Uh, this website has annually more than 1 million page views and it contains a lot. So we've come to the final part of this presentation. In 2021, an IAEA survey was conducted with the objective to collect information in order to provide insight into the current educational practices and resources and barriers to the education and ongoing training in radiation protection of healthcare professionals in the IAEA member states. There was a total of 135 responses received from 59 countries from all regions. And by profession, 40% of the responders were medical physicists. And you can see uh, the rest of the distribution here. I'm going to present just a couple of results from this. We can see from the survey that it is felt that radiation protection is generally well included in the basic professional educational programs of medical physicists and also other key groups, but insufficiently in the education of non-radiologists performing fluoroscopy guided intervention procedures, and especially in the basic medical and dental education or nursing schools. One of the results of concern, depending on the profession, was that a considerable number of respondents reported that no mandatory radiation protection training exists as a part of the uh, CPD. And uh, we can see that here. And finally, when asked about the most important educational topic that the participants of the survey believed needed to be improved or added in their country or profession or organization, when it comes to radiation protection education and training of health professionals today, the top scorer was uh, the approaches for optimization of protection of patients and staff, and followed by justification, followed by teamwork and safety culture, benefit risk communication to patients, and then 
the basic of radiation protection. So we can see overall from the survey that um, there is more to do. So thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. Yeah, Ola, uh, thank you so much for the, uh, this wonderful presentation. I, I think it has highlighted a number of really important uh, issues. Uh, I was pleased to see that medical physicists uh, do answer surveys. That is good, good to see. But I must say I was shocked about the CPD, uh, the lack of CPD in, uh, the, in the program. Do you think uh, that this is related to a wrong perception uh, of radiation safety being seen as something static? Yeah, that's, that's a very uh, good question. Good morning, uh, and uh, I, I should say to, to everyone, or good afternoon. <clears throat> um, yes, I think uh, there, there, is, there's, there are many uh, misconceptions about radiation protection, I think, and... Uh, one of them being that uh, it might be seen as a static, um, as you say. Um, there, overall, I think uh, the misconception that um, that still exists about uh, that the patient doesn't need to be protected also. I think when you mention radiation protection, many people think about shielding just. And... Uh, but the, the the really important thing is to to uh, and and that's of course also important. But you always need to think about the patient protection, and that is a struggle to to discuss this, which has gone over decades. I think it's very difficult to move um, some of the. Uh, uh, some of the thought processes in, in people is, is very difficult to influence. And, and uh, so one of them being that uh, it might be seen as a static thing, while this is a very developing field, and especially when taken into account that the development in uh, the technology and the procedures is so big in all of these areas, we have to follow with the radiation protection aspects also this technological development uh, that we see in this field so it is something which where we do need to have cpd programs we do need to um, update our knowledge regularly so uh, thank you very much for bringing that up Thank you, Ola. Uh, and I, I think the dynamic of the field is, is really beautifully seen in the RPOP web page. Uh, each time I visit it, it, there's something new, or maybe I discover something new. It's a fantastic resource indeed. Thank uh, you. Um, unfortunately, we, we have to move on to, to the next speaker. I just would like to remember, uh, remind the audience that you can put questions in the Q&A and chat uh, environment, which we do uh, uh, look at. We may not be able to answer all your questions uh, immediately, but we will try to do that uh, potentially in, in writing. So that's a good time for me to hand over to my co-chair, Akta, to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Professor Thomas. So our next speaker is Professor Madan Rihani. Uh, Professor Madan Rihani is an eminent expert in medical physics across the world. Throughout his career, he has been devoting himself for the development of medical physics education, training, and professional as well. He is the current president of International Organization for Medical Physics, IOMP. He is an emeritus member of ICRP and author of nine annals of ICRP. Professor Rehani is the author of 170 five publications, 40 chapters in books, and he has edited five books. Currently, he is acting as a director of Global Outreach for Radiation Protection at the Massachusetts General Hospital, Boston, USA. So it is my pleasure to invite Professor Madan Rehani to present his excellent presentation here, and I would like to welcome him at the 21st Asia Senior Congress of Medical Physics. Please, Professor Modern Rehani. 
Hello. At the outset, let me thank the organizers of ACMP for inviting me to speak to you today. I wish the deliberations of ACMP great success and to the viewers of AAC, AOCUMP, I am going to talk today on our imaging medical physicist equipment and technique focused or patient focused. Although the title contains a uh, word on imaging medical physicist, but essentially the talk will as well be useful to the therapy physicists. I am conscious and aware that in large part of Asian countries, mostly radiation oncology physicists are involved in the work of the medical physics and there is a dearth of imaging medical physicist. But once again, it is the approach which I am going to focus and that will be widely applicable. To start with, let's just see when it comes to the patient focus and the best is to consider the doctors who are day to day in, involved in day to day on patient focus. They have to deliver what the patient wants, the focus on patient physician relationship. So it is a question of having the interaction and the outcome of interaction, response to patient questions and the look for remove and remove obstacles to patient centered care and know your patients. So everything depends upon how one deals with the patient and meets with the needs of the patient. And if one looks at, let us say, other aspects of life, for example, all of us travel by air, and what is that which makes travelers happy? There are hundreds of things involved in that, starting from ticketing, from the coming in the check-in process, then the security, and then traveling, the services provided by the stewards and the food and all that thing. So in that way, when we as medical physicists work in the hospitals, the patients are our target and there are so many factors on which patient satisfaction is uh, centered around. I'll take the, myself back to the time when I started uh, as in the medical physics profession in 1970s. At that time, if I recall, the clinical medical physicist world was hardly existing. So it used to be physicists primarily or medical physicists hardly the clinical medical uh, uh, physicist. Of course, at that time, again, the large uh, component of the physicists were working in radiology and somewhere in between in nuclear medicine. So the clinical orientation has been coming with time and it is not something which was there right in the beginning. At that time in 1970s, the focus was on equipment and the equipment quality control used to be one of the major uh, tasks of the medical physicists and more so in the diagnostic medical physicist. So if we have a question to deal with that, is there an example that demonstrate that medical physicists are equipment focused, more equipment focused than the patient focused? So let's deal with this question. And I have taken the example of the radiation dose optimization in CT, which is something which every one of us is concerned with. If one looks at the PubMed, the publications, uh, and I took the 2019 year as an example, and uh, I analyzed the data, and we found that there are three to five papers every week on CT dose optimization in 2019. And when we normalize these publications to the overall publications in radiology, so even that 
component also is has been continuing to increase since uh, the early time of 2002 in the re recent years but if one looks at the profile of these papers there is a lot of emphasis on the technique for optimization the equipment features which help in optimization and those is with its own focus on a single exposure and that goes towards the technique optimization so with that in background uh, this is the work which we started doing uh, two years ago and uh, although it was supposed to be in, on the cumulative uh, radiation doses patients get but then ultimately we found that we had one lesson to obtain from this work that uh, although the technique focus was delivering its results in reducing the radiation exposure to the patients in individual CT exams but when we assess the recurrent CT exposures which many patients undergo when we assessed their magnitude and the reasons for imaging then we found that oh we were missing the important part and that was the we were not patient focused and we were technique focused so from these uh, publications which i cited in the previous slide we found that 0.6.4% uh, to 3.4 percent uh, of the patients obtained over 100 millisievert in the defined period of one to five year in different centers and the average value was 1.33 percent that is roughly one percent and that implies one out of every hundred patient who undergoes CT exam gets 100 millisievert plus from the CT alone this does not include the radiation dose patients were getting from nuclear medicine exams or the therapy imaging and therapy we extrapolated the data to 35 oecd countries and we found that over a period of five years uh, the number of patients who may be getting more than 100 millisieverts were around 2.5 million patients in 35 oecd countries and we had their distribution plotted in this curve with the us japan iceland luxembourg on the higher side and finland slovenia italy ireland on the lower side so that way it gave us information as to how many patients are likely getting more than 100 millisievert in five year period per five, per uh, thousand population so this was normalized to the population this was simply unbelievable and shocking to most colleagues who were totally equipment focused or technique focused they thought that the technique of uh, CT is now much more better than what it used to be around 10 20 years ago and we are having the low doses in CT so for uh, most people to realize that patients are getting such high doses from recurrent imaging that was something which one had not uh, thought of so uh, as if this was not enough there were further revelations uh, from the work uh, which we had and then we had uh, more work done also which we published uh, in 2021 this year in which we found the number of patients who obtained 50 millisievert in a single exam or 100 millisievert in a single day so we had this data from uh, more than 260 uh, centers in US in which we found that uh, the, uh, the number of exams patient had uh, and uh, one out of every 125 patients had 50 millisievert plus through single exam and three out of 10,000 that is 0.03 percent had 100 millisievert in a single day and 9.4 percent of them underwent more than one CT exam in a single day so nearly one third of those with 50 percent 50 millisievert were uh, less than 50 years of age so it is not that these exams are being performed on uh, very old patients 
um, and we identified the top 20 imaging protocols that were leading to the uh, high doses of 50 millisievert in a single exam and also we found that uh, the frequency of these protocols leading to high doses. So the point that emerged is uh, can we tell millions of these patients who are getting such high doses that CT is a low dose imaging modality. So which is the case which was there till we had these findings everybody was confident that oh CT is a low dose imaging modality it gives much lower dose today than as it compared to many years ago. So if we maintain that stand, that will be so if medical physicists consider their responsibility only to the level of a single exam rather than the patient as a whole. And we debated this point uh, among ourselves, among few colleagues uh, in a point counterpoint article in medical physics, which uh, you can look at it. This was uh, in uh, early part of 2020. So this brings us the uh, issue of responsibility and uh, if medical physicists have responsibility towards patient radiation safety or they think that their responsibility lies only towards equipment quality control. So if we confine ourselves to equipment and uh, one should realize that we are appointed many of us uh, because the national regulations required and th those requirements came from radiation safety. So that is what created the requirement for appointment of medical physicists at first place in many developing countries. Of course in developed countries there are other research and teaching duties for which one is appointed but in most developing countries it is the radiation safety requirements which uh, have helped to create the positions. So the point to note is that uh, we started the work in this direction of patient radiation dose, cumulative patient radiation dose and then it has opened a new area of research in the last two years itself. There are some of these publications which I have put up here which have come up either in 20 or in 2020, 20 or uh, 21 or year before so last two years. And there are many more publications which are coming uh, now almost every couple of months. So this created a new area for research and this is a, there is a special issue of British Journal of Radiology which came out last month and uh, it had six articles on uh, recurrent imaging and there is a complete focus on radiation protection in uh, radiological imaging. Uh, initial publications uh, did not focus on the overall dose so because that is difficult to obtain so it was CT based so now we have uh, some data on uh, nuclear medicine exams particularly PET CT and uh, this is the data which is under publication in which we have found that one out of five patients had more than two PET CT exam in a calendar year and in patients in this cohort uh, those with less than or equivalent to 40 years were 12%, 41 to 60 years 27% and more than 60 years 61%. So there were a sizable number of patients in the uh, 40 or below and between 40 and 60 also. And the top three malignancies associated with uh, serial imaging included melanoma, non-Hodgkin's and gastrointestinal tract. So th these are not the really malignancy which have uh, short life expectancy so one can uh, not ignore them. Uh, as of now there is dearth of publications which may have estimated that total cumulative dose to individual patient from all imaging exams combined whether it is CT or fluoroguided intervention, nuclear medicine, imaging and radiotherapy. So that is something which is still to be done. So within I believe one year or two years uh, there will be publications dealing with that. So that will create more patient focus and less uh, uh, rather than the technique focus. Somehow there is a common myth which uh, many of our colleagues have and many times I have to face this situation dealing with most colleagues 
most people will say most our medical colleagues will say oh cancer patients get lot of radiation in any way thus why should we be concerned about radiation from imaging studies well i have to explain to them that cancer patients are given radiation only to the tumor and this is where medical physicists come medical physicists are employed there are millions and billions of dollars of salary which goes to the medical physicists for confining the radiation dose primarily to the tumor so this is precisely our job that we want to minimize the radiation dose outside the tumor volume and maximize the dose to the tumor so when we do that uh then uh, that means we are not exposing the known tumor part and we have no right to think that cancer patients are getting lot of radiation so it is not the cancer patients but the tumor where the radiation is being delivered so rest of the human body rest of the patient's body is like any other person and we have to see that we avoid every possible a kind of unnecessary radiation uh, for for that and uh, with that i will like to summarize what i talked about in this short presentation that uh, just don't be satisfied with the equipment quality control uh, in the last 30 years there has been a lot of progress in many physicists having the private uh, uh, consultancy services uh, being run and uh, having the uh, Uh, services for equipment quality control that is all fine but uh, that is not all everything what medical physicists should be concerned with uh, the medical physicists physicists have to analyze how our work is helping patients health so it is not just patient but complete patient's health many time it may be patient safety as i mentioned that patient safety is our one of our main domain area and we have to design our action and orient and steer them in direction of patient's welfare and again i am repeating not only technique and equipment but on patients with that i wish to thank you for your patient listening thank you uh thank you very much for your excellent presentation and there is a clear message to the medical physicist by your presentation that medical physicist should not be concerned about only the equipment quality control but it should be our concern to the radiation dose uh to the patient and there was a very clear cut information how much radiation dose is getting patient by recurrent imaging and this is really very shock for us even uh, especially for the developing countries where there is no strict radiation safety laws and every day we face problem for example myself i work as a radiation oncology medical physicist but during the ct simulation always we have a argument with the medical doctors regarding the ct simulation so for example if you are going to treat the patient with a lung tumor sometimes we want to have the ct scan from neck to uh, middle of the you know thigh or you know the lower of the pelvic regions so my question is how we can make the argument where there is no medical physics standard up to the mark to argue with our consultant that we cannot do that or we should do we should be concise the area of the scanning i think uh, professor rehani is not here and could you make a comment professor thomas about that uh th this is really an, an excellent question and i i think the medical physicists have an important role to play in in that that context because they are also familiar in the radiation oncology 
environment at least about the need for the length of the, the scan uh, in order to perform the treatment planning. So I think this must be a, a, a discussion uh, amongst the professions, the oncologists and the medical physicists. And I, I think it is great to see that more medical physicists actually become patient focused by actually being present at the CT simulation, which is already a huge step forward because only if we know what happens can we apply our knowledge and all the principles Professor uh, Rehani has given us uh, to patient protection. I think this is a really excellent comment. Uh, well, thank you, Professor Thomas. And now, now I would like to hand over you uh, to call the next presenter. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, the, the next presenter really does not require any introduction. Uh, we are here at an AFOB conference uh, and uh, Arun Shigule is really, let's say, Mr. AFOB. Uh, at the moment, uh, he has done so much work with, with AFOB in so many different levels and uh, certain uh, environments uh, that it is an absolute pleasure uh, for me uh, to in introduce him. He, in particular, uh, since he has again performed wonderful work in science, in radiation biology, wonderful work in administration as dean of faculties, as uh, a senior professor, and wonderful work in terms of education. Uh, and uh, it is that where we will hear a bit more about uh, in the presentation on medical physics education and professional status in AFOMP region, the role of international organizations and a way forward. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Shibuli. Thank you, uh, Professor Thomas, for the kind introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, thanks to the organizers of AOCMP for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Welcome to AOCMP 2021. Unfortunately, because of the COVID, uh, this conference again has gone into hybrid mode. And I was planning to be in Dhaka for this conference, everything was planned, but unfortunately, because of the visa issues, I couldn't make it. It's very, very unfortunate. Okay, technology has given a way to communicate, and I am virtually communicating with you. I'll be talking today about the medical physics education and professional status in FOM region role of international organization and what is the way forward. Please accept my greetings on my own behalf, on behalf of the AFOM on the occasion of AOCMP 2021. Thanks to the organizer for putting in their efforts despite of this odd situation, very, very difficult situation. The theme of this AOCMP 2021 is science for radiation medicine. Very important because after the discovery of X-rays in 1895 and just after that, the discovery of radioactivity, it has put into medical diagnosis and treatment and has revolutionized the health care. And therefore, this is a science of radiation medicine. As you very well know, that IOMP celebrates IDMP every year to showcase the contribution of medical physicists. And every year, the themes are different. The theme, one of the theme was uh, medical physicist as a health professional. Now, this year's theme is communicating the role of medical physicists to the public because despite of a huge contribution medical physicists do for the healthcare, they are not known even to the other health profession, leave aside the public. And therefore, this year's theme was communicating the role of medical physicists to the public, which was celebrated on 7th of November 
2021. As you very well know, medical physicists work in various areas of the healthcare. They take the lead in optimizing the use of radiation to treat the cancer, estimate the radiation doses from radiological imaging processes, understand newer technologies, therapy technologies, and train others to use them. If you look at the themes of earlier IDMP, you can see that education in medical physics better medical physics, better cancer care, medical physics providing holistic approach, and all these medical physics for patients are there, which depicts or which showcases the importance of medical physics education and also the role of medical physicists play in health care delivery system. So medical physicists, is a bridge between the medicine and physical sciences. Medical physics is destined to ever changing. It is changing very, very rapidly. Medical physics is a discipline that is responding to technological and scientific problems faced in the medical field. Let it be in diagnosis, let it be in therapy. Most important long-term effect of research will be in identifying an individual susceptibility to a disease. It's a tailor-made, patient-specific in prevention, early diagnosis, as well as reduction of the complications with this smarter therapies. Developments in medical physics sometimes strongly overlap with the development related to disciplines of biomedical engineering or biophysics, and they go hand in hand, and the collaboration is very, very important. Basically, the application of physics in medicine is in radiotherapy, diagnostic radiology, nuclear medicine, and radiation protection. However, there is greater role of a medical physics in other areas also like cardiology, neurology, ophthalmology, otology, surgery, and many more, which one should venture on. Now, as I talked about 125 years, lot of technological development have taken place in terms of diagnosis as well as the treatment. And therefore, the complex treatment and diagnostic equipment, they need a very competent, clinically qualified medical physicist. Though IOMP policy statement has uh, uh, recognize medical physics as a health professional policy statement to gives about the education curriculum of medical physicists how to become. And therefore, the high quality education training program was needed with the help of IAEA, IOMP, AAPM. They have brought out the syllabuses, the curriculum, and many. Uh, educational program have started across the world, even into the form region, but the quality of education program, the accreditation certification is very, very important. According to IAEA, the, to become a clinically qualified medical physicist, you need to have a basic degree in physics or in Ning sciences or equivalent, and at least two years full-time equivalent structured clinical in-service training uh, undertaken in the hospital. That is the residency program of two years after master's in medical physics. And they say mere academic master's in medical physics, you will not be uh, able to recognize as a clinically qualified. To be a clinically qualified medical physicist as a professional, you need to undergo at least two years full-time equivalent structured clinical in-service residency program. And that is what in nutshell, that is a basic degree in physics or engineering, and then from uh, about two years master's in physics, then two to three years residency, you become a clinically qualified. Again, certification and recertification, you need to acquire certain CME, CPD points, and then that should lead to a state registration. As you know, uh, the ILO, the World Health Organization, IAEA, recognizes the medical physics as a health professional. Despite of all these things, many countries 
yet this profession and more so in a farm region they are not very well recognized as a health professional as they deserve to be or they need to be this is what all about the ILO and other things ISCO has talked about. IAEA safety standard, the BSS also says health medical physicists are the health professional specific education and training in concept and techniques of applying physics to the medicine for diagnosis and treatment. And uh, many organizations like AFOM, we have European Federation of Organization of Medical Physics in Europe, and uh, they have given the guidance that medical physics health profession where principle of applied physics is mostly towards the application and European Union, European reference document like a European Council directive that mentions that medical physicists are health professional. IAEA document uh, about the health service 25 role and responsibilities and education and training requirement for clinically qualified medical physicists and international basic safety, they fully recognize. Croatian parliament finally voted in favor of recognition of medical physicians in healthcare. Why do we need this recognition? Why do you need a registration? Why do you need certification? Because official recognition of so much importance because it opens the door to change of status of the medical physicist as a profession, as a health profession, as the nurses, the doctors, the pharmacists, and introduction of the education training accreditation programs and the establishment of appropriate qualification framework for medical physicists working in the clinics. These changes are not possible without the recognition of the medical physics as a health profession. So that is very, very important. As I talked about the IAEA, IBS is that the basic safety standard recognizes them as a health professional. And therefore, uh, because IAEA document goes to the member countries as a uh, recommendation, and therefore every state and the different countries, uh, they have to develop the mechanism to uh, uh, have uh, the proper training education for the medical physicians recognize them as a medical uh, health professionals. You directives, uh, as you know that uh, the in Europe in a form region, the you directive which is a, a mandatory and they all countries has to follow such directives are not there in the FOM region. Every country has their own uh, laws, education. There is no homogeneous or one uniform code. And EU directive also says that uh, recognize medical physics as an independent professional health care, ensure that uh, activities are performed by the CQMP under their supervision, establish the training program, follow up. All these things have been recommended into the EU directives. IAEA roles and response of the medical physicist in HHS document 25 has given this thing, recommended that the accreditation of a medical physics education program, certification of a individual medical physicist and registration of a medical physicist as a health professional like other health professional, the mechanism has to be there, that is what I said. Recently, IAEA has brought out a guideline and that is training course series 71 in February 2021, which gives you the guidelines for certification of clinically qualified medical physicists. This has been endorsed by IMPCB and IOMP and I am the one of the drafting member of uh, this uh, document which is freely available on the IAEA website. What uh, do patient and society expect from their medical physics as a health professional? And I told you uh, medical physicists are health professionals and therefore what they do expect a professional competence, educational qualification certification is recognized, well documented, problem solving, practical skills, integrity, and so many things as a health professional. Now I come down, what about, talk about uh, the Asia Ocean of Federation of Organization for Medical Physics form, which was uh, founded in year 2021 years 
I go and now we have 19 countries or 19 uh, member organizations are full member and two are affiliate member of the reform and almost more than 11,000 medical physicists work uh, in this uh, region, which is uh, highly, hugely populated, 4.7 billion amounting to 60% of the world population. Even in the form, there is a lot of heterogeneity. Still then, the area of healthcare is a very fastly dynamism and the role of medical is becoming highly demanding as more and more countries are embarking on implementation of high quality medical technologies. And I talked about Asian countries. There is no binding force like a European directives and every country has evolved is its education, its directives, its own way. APOM is trying to harmonize uh, the medical physics education program. Now, APOM has a very dynamic website. You can log in, you can get a lot of information on these things about uh, the AOCMP activities, IDMP, APOM webinars, all those things. And as you very well know that uh, uh, the IOMP, uh, it's 89 country NMOs are there and uh, we have six regional organization, APOM, uh, the number one of the largest medical physicist number, almost about 11,000, but at the same time, huge population, we require still more. Presently in the IOMP region, about 25,000 medical physicists are there, but we need in coming 10 years, almost we need to double this requirement to take care of a growing healthcare requirement. So, if you talk about the uh, FOM region and education training, we have various status of medical physics in Asia, Oceania region because of the heterosity of a diverse culture, social, education, economic background, very rich country to low income countries, shortage of medical physicists in Asian countries, insufficient clinical training program to cater to the rising needs, fewer qualified medical physicists, though number is to be 11,000, the population is huge. Migration of medical physicians to more advanced countries like USA or Europe and lack of recognition of the medical physics standard practice in many Asian countries. These are some of our problems. Uh, if I look at the number of uh, medical physicists and uh, the population and per million population, how many medical physicists are there, you will look at 0.56 medical physicists for 1 million population as low in Myanmar to 20 medical physicists per million population in Australia. If I just talk about the Bangladesh, it is 1.81. Average of the FOM is 2.67. It is much below than compared to the uh, USA, Canada, and EFORM, which I will show one of the slides. So we have almost 106 educational program in uh, these EFORM uh, countries, and uh, most of them are two-year program. And many countries, majority, if you look at India and Japan, have the maximum number of uh, medical education program followed by Iran. So these are the institutions, but we need more programs in China, in Bangladesh and other countries, more populated this thing. So even if you look at uh, the students per year uh, uh, intake, uh, Bangladesh around 15 to 20, and uh, the registration is not there. MP residency program is not very well structured. So even if you look at this 20 countries, only 10 countries have a medical physics residency program. Only nine countries have the registration of medical physics, either health or allied health into that thing. So only 50% of that thing. So need to uh, go ahead. Only eight country programs are accredited. So a lot more needed to be done. And this is just uh, in nutshell that the uh, positive program 
uh, is available required on site training that is uh, the residency certification yes and but many countries they do not have uh, the uh, residency program neither the certification and accreditation and i would just wanted to compare the number of medical physicians per million population us and canada is almost 24 to 25 medical fees per million population e form is around 12 medical physicians per million population and they are planning to raise it to 18 and as compared to that the FOM region is very very low and some countries which is 0.56 is much much below 100 times less than the very advanced countries so we have to go a long way FOM has brought out six policy statement on various aspects roles and responsibilities and status of the clinical medical businesses then also the education and training the accreditation cpd program the ethics all this is available on the form website and uh, biggest problem in many countries of the form is unclear job description no accepted certification job security remuneration varies a lot difficulty to attract the best student and therefore the professional standard iomp has started the medical physics education program accreditation and they do accredit the masters and the graduate program started accreditation of the postgraduate program and also we have started the accreditation of continuous professional development courses residency program uh, all this is available on the iomp website and the first program to be accredited by the IUMP was Master's Advanced Studies in Medical Physics, MMP, which is ICTP and University of Trieste. And this was accredited in 2016. We have accredited in 2019 three. Uh, uh, medical physics education program, Catholic University, Korea, Yonsei University, and CAST. And all these three universities are accredited by the IUMP for three years till 2020 reaccreditation bill. And we issue a certificate of accreditation is very, very important. And the IUMP website, you will get all this information. We have International Medical Physics Certification Board, IMPCB, which certifies the boards actually the, the the certification boards are certified or accredited by the impcb and where this certification boards are not in the country their individual uh the certification by the impcb and this is a website you will find a lot of information and during this aocmp 2021 also uh many candidates will be giving the examination for the impcb certification so what does do this international certification board accreditation uh, the validation of the certification boards, IMPCBs, serves as a competent authority in accreditation of the national certification boards, sets standards and procedure for professional certification, help countries to establish their own national certification system. And just I uh, will tell you that uh, the, uh, the uh, IAEA has brought out the guidelines for the establishing the national certification uh, boards. Uh, and this is endorsed by IMPCB and IOMP, and also conduct the examination for certification of the individual medical people where countries do not have certification boards. So that is also there. So already certification board, uh, IMPCB has accredited Korean Medical Physics Certification Board, Hong Kong Institution of Physics and Medicine Certification Board, Hong Kong Association of Medical Physics Certification Board, and in line uh, College of Medical Physics of India is in line, Chinese society, the things are going, and Bangladesh uh, Medical Physics Certification Board has shown an interest and the work is in progress. IMPCB individual certification also does, and this has started since 2017. So far, exams have been held into ICTP, Dhaka, Prague, Mexico, many countries, and now again in Dhaka, it's being held, 450 have started into examination process 46 have completed all part there is a part one two three and they are got a diploma of impcb fully certified so now we look at uh, the second part that is a medical physics education research way forward because 
it is a profession it is not a static one it is a evolving it is a developing and we have to tune to that so most of the medical fees are currently involved in radiation therapy as i told you more than 70% are in merit so consequently future developments in radiation oncology will have the strongest impact on most of the medical fees so medical fees are good at developing and refining technology which should remain our first and primary goal medical fees are good at interacting with physicians and other basic scientists but it is essential to become much better at it because multidisciplinary approach is very very important uh, in this so diversity of medical physics as well as the strong connection to other similar disciplines like biomedical engineering might bring other areas into focus because data mining ai technology so a lot of things are coming the major area of focus for the major development we are coming in a personalization of the therapy individual tailor made treatment molecular imaging molecular targeted therapies particle therapies clinical trials translational research simulation of complex system artificial intelligence and data mining and therefore uh, the medical physicists must get involved into clinical trials involving advanced imaging and also into the therapy uh, trials focused on the radiation therapy chemotherapy or molecular target therapy in carpet uh, uh, imaging clinical procedure also involves consideration of the clinical protocol requirement and in point good knowledge of patient anatomy physiology most important tumor biology is a very important mm -hmm. so we have to diversify it is not just gtv ctv qaqc you have to diversify our vision translation research and other big area which has come up uh, uh, where traditional medical physicians have not been significantly involved and need to be involved and our education training should uh, be targeted oriented towards that thing medical physicians are extremely active in clinical research involvement in basic research except for radio biology is not very common part of the reason might be lack of their basic biological uh, knowledge tumi ki amar kotha shunte pachho also their typical employment within okay. clinical radiation oncology department might contribute to this situation so simulation of the complex system physicists have typically great ability of abstraction designing and testing models and performing models and therefore medical physicists have mastered modeling and simulation of the particle transport as well as modeling of the whole treatment planning chain expansion of their knowledge and yeah. expertise to simulate okay, okay. the complex okay. system should not be difficult from a technical mm -hmm. perspective and therefore they should venture in this area much more interdisciplinary transdisciplinary approach is required with much more interaction with the physicians as well as other basic scientists is that is a multi uh, disciplinary research multidisciplinary work will have to do clinical and biologically relevant research to be relevant into healthcare rather than base program on the traditional medical physics course special care should be taken to incorporate enough imaging biological and translational research component into the program rather than preparing a medical physics for the present we have to think of the future one of the problem is that all dedicated medical program as well as other education program from where people enter the field of medical physics have typically very limited biological training and that need to be increased so lot things to be done and to take care of this thing uh, the uh, to because the major outcome of the academic program is to provide the students with a thorough grounding in medical physics critical thinking scientific rigor and adequate professional ethics to facilitate the integration of the graduates in the healthcare profession where the benefits of the patient is at the center of the all activities and therefore our curriculum our training has to be tuned to that and therefore apom has taken the initiative and considered a task force to uh, model a curriculum syllabus for the medical physics education etc iump and iue also has uh, 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 redrafted the uh, training course series tcs 56 and this will come very soon now i will talk about the medical physics organization contribution to medical physics as you know 
International Council for Science, ISCO, under that International Union for Physical Engineering Sciences, almost 22 other scientific uh, unions are working, IUPAC, IUPAC, and IUPASM. And if you look at the organization, International Union of Physical Sciences Engineering in Medicine, that's IUPASM, and it has uh, the International Organization for Medical Physics, IOMP, and International Federation for Medical and Biomedical Engineering, IFMBE. So when we talk the World Congress, this IUPSM, and we have the IOMP and IFMBE included into this thing. So under this ISQ, IUPSM, under that IOMP, under IOMP, there are regional, sub-regional medical physics and national organizations. Uh, IOMP was established in 1963, 89 member countries, almost about 35,000 medical physicists representing the IOMP. And uh, this is the whole six, uh, uh, the regional organization, APOM, almost 11,000, starting from the uh, New Zealand to Iran, straight over this thing. The regional organization I talked about, APOM, EFOM, CFOM, MEPOM, ALFIM, AAPM, all these are PAMPO. Uh, we have uh, this medical physics organization, then sub regional organization also there. Then we are bringing a lot of journal, medical physics, physica medica, and uh, so many other. Uh, uh, in 2005, a world conference on physics and sustainable development was held, and physics and health. It is a commemorating 100 years of uh, the Einstein's publication. And uh, one of the four fields of applied physics was physics and health. And I was fortunate to participate into this conference. And after that, as you know, the initiatives were taken. And now the medical physicists are the uh, recognized by ILO uh, as a health professional. Now, Asia Oceana Federation of Organization, if you talk about, as I told you, from New Zealand to this, uh, the Iran, it has spread 19 full member to affiliate member. We have, we have an agreement with the MEPOM MOU was signed in 2017 to enhance the collaboration into education and training. IAU has hugely contributed to the medical physics and a lot of document of the, you can see that uh, uh, human health series number 25, very important document about the roles and responsibilities and education and training requirement of the clinically qualified medical physicists, which has been brought in 2013, it is there. post graduation medical academic programs for uh, the uh, things which have been uh, endorsed by IOMP and other organization guidelines for certification of clinically qualified medical physicists, which has come just recently in February 2021, uh, endorsed by IMPCB and IOMP. They bring out a lot of uh, books which are freely available, downloadable. You can get them. You have a web-based e-learning material available freely, radiotherapy, uh, diagnosis, medical phases, training events, and all that is available for brachytherapy, 2D to 3D and the migration. They have brought this uh, document. Web-based learning I talked about, cyber learning, it is available. Diagnostic radiology, a lot of publication, quality assurance and all. And now a recent publication, how you can do virtual QA, QC and thing has come up, which is available for nuclear medicine. A lot of documents they are brought out, they are available on the website and they are freely downloadable radiotherapy publication they are available other relevant who also has contributed hugely for the medical physics and then they have brought out this who medical devices technical series and under this thing for radiotherapy equipment how important is medical physicists and what role medical physicists plays into radiotherapy has been uh, spelled out, documented there for nuclear medicine also, the WHO has done that. ICTP contribution in the field of medical physics, ICTP 
that is uh, the, uh, the now it is Abdul Salam, uh, the International Co 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 College on uh, the Theoretical Physics. Among seven major research areas, medical physics is an important research topic under the applied physics of the category under ICTP and uh, uh, 400 advanced scientists uh, in developing countries researchers they have uh, given access to 70,000 books, journals, provide sandwich technical education program, synchrotron radiation and applications in medical radiation physics they provide. 2014 ICTP took a big step for starting a Medic Masters of Advanced Studies in Medical Physics with University of Trieste. It has started in 2000. It's a two-year program. Training courses, many, many training courses. They are uh, doing a uh, trail that is a training in research and Italian laboratories, ICTP Masters in Medical Physics. Uh, then ICTP provides training and skills for scientists from developing countries. Every year organizes about the 60 schools, colleges, and they have completed what is called as a College of Medical Physics, uh, CMP, began in 1988. And the Slavic Tobacco is very actively, Franco Milano, they are all uh, very actively evolved with this thing. ICTP, IAEA collaboration activities, they have started, regular associateship, and things I published an article about the contribution of ICTP to medical physics in a form newsletter. You can search for that thing. Then radiological emergency, IAEA has brought out this document, how medical physicists can uh, contribute to radiological and uh, nuclear emergencies. These diverse skills and contribution of the medical in healthcare and radiation protection make them to be a potential asset at the disposal of the national nuclear and radiological emergency response mechanism. We have organized an international conference on this thing to help the medical physicists to learn. So our uh, research, teaching, and knowledge. Knowledge is going exponentially, rocket speed, research, very gap. This need to be feel this gap has to be filled and then only we catch up so our education training has to be tuned medical physicists should expand their horizon beyond the traditional boundaries dosimetry qaqc etc and be a part of exciting multidisciplinary research team i am very very optimistic and no matter what situation life throws at you, no matter how long the treacherous your journey may be, but remember there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So be positive, tune to your this thing. Medical physicist has a great role to play with this thing. I end my talk thanking you all the participants, the organizer for giving me this great opportunity. Thank you very much. One, two, oh. uh, Thank you, Dr. Chogula. Dear, dear Professor Shigule, this has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, that is medical physics, uh, international education and everything in uh, the, a short period of time showing what an exciting and what a wonderful profession uh, we are all, all in. Unfortunately, time has uh, really flown in, in during that presentation. Uh, so I, I think we have to, to move on. Uh, and I'm delighted to hand over to Professor Zakaria, uh, who will uh, chair the next session. Thank you all very much. Uh, for a job that session, I would like to thank all the speakers uh, and give them a very strong virtual applause. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in the 21st Asia Oceania Congress of Medical Physics. This is the sponsor's presentation. It will be presented by our chair and co chair, Professor Dr. Golam Abu Zakaria and Professor Said Mohammed Akram Hussein. <clears throat> Professor Dr. Gulam Abu Zakaria, who's also the patron of this event, is the founder chairman of South Asia Center for Medical Physics and Cancer Research. In 2019, he was the board of directors of Global Oncology University under Harvard Medical School, Boston, USA. And in 
And again, in 2019, he was the awardee of the Global Radiation Oncology Distingu Distinguished Leader Award 2019 by Global Health Catalyst of the Harvard Medical School. Back in 2018, he was nominated as the chairman accreditation committee to the International Medical Physics Certification Board, IMC, IMPCB, and vice chair of, of the International Organization Medical Physics, IOMP, accreditation board. In 2010, he was the honorary advisor at the National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital, Dhaka, Bangladesh. And in 2009, the Oncology Club and SAARC Federation of Oncologists honored with a highly prestigious award Outstanding Personalities of the Decade 2000 to 2010 for the unique contribution to establish medical physics in Bangladesh. And the honorary membership of the Bangladesh Cancer Society. And back in 2003, he was a professor and of clinical engineering on Halt University of Applied Sciences, Quentin, Germany in 2001, chairman of the DGMP Task Group Medical Physics in Developing Countries of the German Society for Medical Physics, Germany in 2001, founder and patron professor and coordinator for international cooperation of the Department of Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering at Gono Bishwa Vidyale University at Shabar Dhaka, in 1987 to 2019, he was the former chair, chairman and professor at the Department of Medical Radiation Physics, Klinikum Overberg, Kamusbach Academic Teaching Hospital, University of Cologne, Germany. And now introducing Professor Said Mohammed Akram Hussein, who is the senior consultant clinical of clinical oncology and radiotherapy at Square Hospital. Professor Dr. Said Mohammed Akram Hussein uh, has had MBBS, FCPS, FPC, FRCP, FSCP. He is a physician of oncology uh, who's working in Square Hospital Limited with his prominent reputation in education, skill, and adequate experience in working in various capacities of hospital and at home and abroad. He has had 25 years of practical experience and expertise in the field of clinical oncology. Professor Akram has a very rich track record of working in different organizations in his career. Previously, he performed as chief consultant, clinical oncologist in Lab 8 Specialized Hospital. He was senior consultant of Asanya Mission Cancer Hospital. He was the founder, professor, and chief oncologist of the Northeast Cancer Hospital in Silet. Professor Akram is also known uh, as the founder, chairman of oncology department of the SMMU. Throughout his ca uh, challenging career, he has earned professional degrees uh, from National Cancer Institute, uh, Bangkok uh, KOICF Fellowship, National Cancer Institute. Uh, South Korea, WHO Fellowship on Medical and Radiation Oncology, Tata uh, Memorial Hospital, India, FRCP from Glasgow, and FRCP from Edinburgh, FACP from USA, MRCR from UK. Thank you very much. Now I hand over the authority con to conduct the session to Dr. Golam Abu Zakaria. Professor, we can't hear you. Hello. Yes, Professor. Yes, we sir. can hear you. Now. I start once again. Thank you very much. 
uh, for giving me the chance in this Bhindor session as a chair. My co-chair is uh, Professor uh, uh, Hussain. He is a radiotherapist and medical physicist, so it is a good combination uh, to, to uh, have this uh, conference. I'm just, just speaking from Dhaka, the venue. It is a beautiful day in, in Dhaka. Uh, it is a sunny day and the venue is also very nice. I just thank the university here, United International University. There is a new campus. I am also very much happy to be here. Uh, I miss you all, everybody, uh, to this nice uh, compass. Uh, I thank also uh, the AFOM and its president, uh, Professor Chokle, and the team. Uh, they allowed us to do this conference in Dhaka. This is a very useful and important conference. And uh, it is also a very important year for Bangladesh. It celebrates its 50 years of independence and 100 years celebration of the national, uh, nation's father, Bungabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, this is a very nice and good and useful uh, session. We have a uh, vendor session. We have four vendors. Uh, they are just giving their talk and you will hear very soon. And you know the vendor is actually the quiet star. Without their support, we cannot arrange such types of organization. They do not only they do not only sell the machines and uh, equipment, but they also support conferences, seminars, and everything. In this pandemic uh, time, they also support us so we can organize uh, this beautiful uh, uh, conference. In this session, we have four vendors: the Team Best, Electra, and um, uh, variants and of course the PTB. So, uh, first of all, I asked the team best to present uh, their uh, presentation, and uh, the team best cannot present here because of time difference, but they sent us slides. And so, our team present the slides. And uh, when you have any question, after the uh, after the talk, we can discuss about this. Thank you. So we can only show the slides. Nobody is present for team best, so we cannot comment on the slides. Please Akash, go one by one. Akash, sound. There is no sound. Please play the sound as well. Akash.
Professor, you're on mute. Thank you, Team Best, and thank you, Dr. Krishnan Shuthan Diran. Uh, this is a detailed uh, information, and after finishing all the presenters' presentation, we can discuss uh, a final discussion. Our next represent representer is Electra. The topic is Pioneer in Precision Radiation Medicine. Uh, here we have three. Uh, three speaker. The one is Associate Professor Dr. Bora Tas, and uh, second one is Anup Kumar, Mr. Anup Kumar, and then Mr. Juboras. Electra is also a global player. Everybody in clinical discipline, especially in radiotherapy and diagnostic, know Electra very well. And I invited the speaker to present uh, their presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Golam. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Boratash. I am Associate Professor in Medical Physics. I have more than 10 years clinical experience. And nowadays I am leading the LINAC and MR LINAC business line in region Timea. Timea means Turkey, India, Middle East and Africa region. So I would like to talk about our latest linear accelerator. Uh, during the pandemic uh, last year, we launched this Electa Harmony linear accelerator. So if we talk about the reality, as you know that uh, we need to treat more and more patients because more and more patients needs uh, radiotherapy treatment. Unfortunately, the number of the cancer cases are increasing day by day and we have a less resources. Unfortunately, we have a limited number of the linear accelerators. We have a limited number of the clinicians. And at the same time, we need to really improve the patient care as well. So therefore, this is the reality. But what we are trying to do, we would like to really stay ahead of increasing the demand and treat high patient load. So therefore, in the, this new linear accelerator, we focus to treat more and more patients in the same treatment slot. And also, we didn't want to lose any versatility because at the end, we, if you improve the uh, treatment quality, if you uh, protect organ risk in a better way, also it will improve the life quality of the patients. So therefore, with this machine, we focus more to the versatility and also high productive linear accelerator. So therefore, we believe that we managed to get the perfect balance of productivity precision and versatility while using this Electra Harmony Linear Accelerator. So uh, actually we have uh, five uh, up and running departments in worldwide. These are in the Europe region, two of them in Turkey, two of them in Germany, and also one of them in France. These are the pilot sites for the Harmony Linear Accelerator. And first site is Ajibadam Hospital in Turkey. And when they start to treat the patients, even in day one, they have started to treat more than 80 patients while using these machines uh, in a single day. And until now, we got to 26 orders, and uh, really the numbers are increasing in a quick way. So the system has a CE mark and also FDA as well. So uh, we really wanted to make the most productive Linux we ever made, and we wanted to reduce especially the treatment slow time up to 25%. So the issue is that speed starts at setup, because we know that the most time we invest in during the setup time, and also we have a new software system, which is Aqua, and while using this Aqua system, it's like an assistant of the physicist, so therefore you can do fast and simplified daily QA, machine QA, auto check, fully automated tests are coming with the system and therefore safety test functionalities, you can do it as well. Even you can do imaging tests. So normally the physicist might rest around one hour time for this kind of the test, but nowadays within like 10 minutes, you can finish all kind of the test easily with the system. And also, as I mentioned, that the main time in the treatment session is the setup time. And as you see that the technicians need to uh, walk inside of the room to do several workstations. And therefore, they are losing really huge time 
while doing the setup. But with this new workflow, we wanted to make it totally redesigning the room experience. So therefore, the technician doesn't need to move at all inside of the room because they can reach everything uh, from where they stand close to the patients. We have also new accessory verification system, as you see in the video, that when you put the correct accessories on the table, then the system is recognizing these accessories, then it lets you to treat the patients. As you see, we have a hub system in the middle of the gantry, and when you put the correct immobilization devices on the couch, then you can see the green light then you can start the treatment. So this is also important for safety region. So you cannot forget if the patient has bolus, if the patient has some different immobilization devices, you need to make the correct setup as the CT room as well, as you know. And another important thing is that it never gets a face wrong. So we have a facial recognition uh, system as well. So when the patients come to a department hospital, then uh, we are scanning the patient's face after checking auto patient auto verify system, then everything's become as you see on the setup pictures. All informations become uh, becomes uh, uh, you can read it from there, and also the all uh, data from the mosaic is automatically opening. So therefore, you cannot treat accidentally the wrong patients. Exactly the same patients data will open in the mosaic system. And you can easily see the all setup pictures while looking to the uh, hub system. As you see that we have a new patient uh, pouch control panel. So therefore, the technician is standing just close to the uh, patient. And while looking to the hub system, and we can, he can control all uh, parameters from uh, the couch control panel. So they can open the XVI system. They can open the IV system. They can rotate the gantry. So everything is visible. So therefore, the fast track technology reduced setup time up to 50%. But versatility is also important. And you know that the agility MRC system is best in class. So therefore, in this harmony, we again use the agility MRC system. Therefore, you can match this system with the other electrolinear accelerator like Roots HD or Infinity, if you have it, with the agility MRC system. So we can easily match this system. We have a, a FFF beam and also flattening beam as well, because for 3D planning, as you know, that the FF normal uh, flattening beams are necessary. So therefore, you can treat the patients in 3D mode. You can treat the patients in the IMRT BMAT and even DCAT mode. And also, we have six times more modulation in a single arc. So it means that while treating the patient with the single uh, arc, you can get very nice dose distribution because of the high modulation. And therefore, you can reduce the beam on time instead of using the several arcs. Less than two minutes, you can treat like breast cancer, lung cancer, or even prostate cancer. So the Agility MSC system, I believe all uh, market or the audience know this, but I would like to highlight some uh, key features. As you know that in the Agility MSC system, we have 160 MLCs, and each of them has a 5 millimeter leaf width, and overall field size is maximum 40 by 40 centimeters. So therefore, you can easily treat very small size tumor, and you can treat also large field size tumor as well. In my clinical practice, even I was treating the whole body irradiation by using the multiple art technique as well when the patient's on the couch. So this is also uh, important. As you see that, yes, we say we have five millimeter liquid, but we have one millimeter virtual liquid as well. It means that we have a jaw tracking. In the each segmentations, our jaw speed is so fast. Therefore, in each segmentation, rows are coming and closing some part of the MLCs. And it is creating like one millimeter virtual liquid. So it is very important while treating the stereotactic patients. And with the 40 by 40 field size, also it is very useful because with single ISO center, you can treat multiple targets in an uh, easier way. And also with this new uh, linear accelerator, we have a new Monaco version as well. We are providing Monaco 6 with the Harmony. 
And this is personalized and offline adaptive radiation therapy for every patient. Integrated planning capabilities with the streamlined uh, workflow. And of course, you know that in the, in the Monaco, we use the Monte Carlo algorithm. So this is the golden standard. And as you know also that uh, between our Monaco and the agility, linear uh, agility MLC system, we can get six times higher modulation than the other systems. The reason that we have a 1,024 up to control points, we can provide it. So in a single arc, in some gantry ranges, we can do high modulation. In some gantry ranges, we can do less modulation. So instead of using the several arcs, even with the single arcs, we can get much better uh, dose distribution than the other system. So therefore, the delivery time could be shorter, lower doses organ at risk, and superior plant quality we can provide it. So this is a quick video, as you see that because the main complaint about the Monaco was the quite slow system because of the Monte Carlo algorithm. But as you know that with the new computer system, this is not any, uh, this is not a case anymore. As you see, this is the five clicks and under two minutes, you can do the plan of the lung SPRT with the dynamic conformal art therapy, or you can also use the VMAT therapy as well. So this system is really so robust and quite much faster than the before. It's very convenient system. And also with the new Monaco 6, we have a script version. So it is much more automated. So physicists doesn't need to wait in front of the computers. Uh, physicists can determine the, which steps uh, we, we need to go with the multi-criteria optimization. Then the system can create the best plan easily. And also with the, this new system, the Mosaic new version is coming, which is Mosaic 3.0. And this is increasing the workloads, cancer care, uh, it's ensuring the efficient working enhance clinical oversight and also evaluate alignment. So with this new version, we can do more automation, more integration and more standardization. So we can really reduce the workflow complexity, enhance efficiency, accuracy, constancy and performance. So it is really much more user friendly than previous versions. So while using this new Mosaic 3.0, we have a really treatment setup workspace, it's really streamlined workflow. It is easy to manage everything in a single screen. And also, as you know, our Mosaic is comprehensive solution. So therefore we provide also Mosaic Plaza. In the Mosaic Plaza, we have different features, depends on your clinical requirement. Some of them are the, like a smart clinic, accessing the information you need whenever, uh, whenever, whenever and wherever you are. And also uh, kite we have for the patient engagement system. We have a metric system. We have analytic voice automation, elect access, aqua. So we have different type of the features. Depends on your clinical requirement. We can easily add these features to our Mosaic Plaza uh, interface. And also we have a quite comprehensive motion management. We can provide for the CBCT, especially for moving target if target is close to the diaphragm, as you know, it is moving quite high. And while using this 4D CBCT technology, deviceless 4D CBCT technology, you can see that your target is in your margin or not. You can do it pre-treatment and you can do it also during the treatment and you can evaluate the uh, results for the during treatment for the second arc after the treatment. And also we have a critical structure avoidance feature. As you know that normally we met just the targets, but we don't much consider about the organ at risk, but time to time the targets are moving. And therefore with this uh, critical structure avoidance, it is checking at the same time target and organ at risk. So we don't wanna exit also the organ at risk toxicity level as well. And also we have a new interface for the for 2D image review and approval. Just with one click, you can review and you can also approve the images as well. So it is really useful and streamlined workflow. So while using this linear accelerator, almost all indications you can treat with single platform. You can get also multiple photon energies. You can have 2D, 3D and 4D imaging capabilities. You can also do VMAT, DCAT, IMRT, 3D as, as your request. And also you can do the motion management with the 4D CBCT, 
or ABC system, active grade control system for the breath hold technique, but even the system is compatible with the surface guided system as well. So therefore, almost all indications with 3D DCAT with 4D CBCT in 40 by 40 field size, you can treat stratectic cases, you can treat large field size uh, targets with, while using the single, plot, uh, single ISO center. So therefore, this machine is really so productive machine. We believe that especially in emerging market, this is really the, one of the biggest need because yes, you need to be fast, but you need to also provide high quality uh, treatment for the patient. So that's why I'm saying that most productive linac we have ever made is Electra Harmony Linear Accelerator. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, uh, thank you very much for this nice uh, presentation. You have given uh, details, uh, interesting uh, equipments and machines. Yeah, the machines are always uh, going to very intelligent. And still, the medical physicist and radiotherapy has huge uh, tax, I think so. Uh, I give my, I hand over my co-chair, uh, Professor Syed Akram Hussain, uh, please, Professor Hussain. So good afternoon, uh, Professor Dr. Jakaria. So thank you so much for inviting me to co-chair this uh, meeting. Uh, Asia Oceania Medical Physics is a huge uh, opportunity, particularly for health in Dhaka in Bangladesh. It's the first time uh, such meeting we have been here. This is a very, very fantastic time for all of us in Bangladesh. So though we are not able to meet in person, but I think this is a wonderful uh, opportunity for all of us. Thank you, Professor Jekari, and thank you for the, all the organizers who are involved in this Asia uh, Oceania Medical Physics Summit or the conference meeting. So the next meeting, next, uh, issues of the Bandor sponsored program. So to have actually that there are two presentations for the next one. Uh, one is actually uh, a framework for developing the multi-center knowledge based planning model for the state wide use uh, will be uh, by C. Yeah, I think uh, the connection is just loose. Uh, we can continue. Uh, please, uh, Mrs. Katrin uh, Lover. Thank you. <laughs> Varian. Uh, yeah, Katrin. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. okay the, so the land rapid plan model for the radical radiotherapy, Katrin Lawford. Please go on. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'll just start by saying I'm not actually from Varian. I work for Pedimac in Australia, but Varian asked me to give this talk. Um, so I've lost my disclaimer slide, sorry. I did have a disclaimer slide, which seems to have gone, but Varian have asked me to um, give this talk and have reviewed it for content, but the content is my own and my own opinion, not that of Varian's. Um, so I just want to start by talking about what is rapid plan. Um, rapid plan is knowledge-based planning and Varian implement this in their Eclipse planning system as a um, package called rapid plan. Um, so knowledge-based planning is essentially when we use a library of previously pla pan planned patients um, to predict the estimated DVHs for organs at risk for new patients based on their anatomy, so their individual anatomy, the prescribed dose, and the field arrangement for that particular patient. So a whole lot of previously planned patients are used to predict the DVHs for a newly planned patient. Um, when this is uh, when the 
CVH is estimated. It also uh, generates some line objectives to help the optimizer achieve estimated DVHs. So I'll just go through this graphically. Um, this is a optimization for a lung plan. And we've got four main organs at risk in the lung plan, the heart, lungs, esophagus, and spinal canal. So when this patient was run through rapid plan, these are the estimated DVHs that rapid plan um, says that the plan is the optimizer is capable of achieving. And you'll see it's quite a wide band, or some of them are narrower, and that's the estimated range that it can achieve. So it can't predict an exact DVH, but it's, it says that the DVH should fall within this range. It then gives you this line optimization objective. And so while you're optimizing, it optimizes along the whole DVH, the, the lower end of the band, trying to push the DVH down to meet that lower edge of the estimated DVH. And then this solid line is the achieved DVH for that plan at the end of the optimization. So in this case, it, it really did meet, um, you know, the sort of bottom end of the estimated band. My slides are in the wrong order, sorry. I'm not sure what's happened here. Anyway. Um, there was a really nice paper that I wanted to show you um, that's a review of, sorry, I don't know what I've done. Hang on. I'm just gonna, that's the wrong one. I'm so sorry, hang on. Can you see that? Okay, I'm nearly there. Um, okay, got the right talk. There's the disclosure slide. What is rapid plan? Okay, so there's this really nice um, review paper, I'm sorry about that, um, that reviews a whole lot of different methods of knowledge-based planning. And the conclusion of that paper um, says that further development of knowledge-based planning is warranted for more rare and more complex cancer sites, but larger data sets that are integrated across multiple institutions will be critical to achieve these more challenging goals. Um, so what that means is, you know, one institute might not have enough cases of the specific cancer type to create a model with enough variation of cases. So it's, it's useful for centers to join together and contribute cases to create models. And that's where the Victorian Public Sector Rapid Plan Group came into existence about five years ago. It was initiated by the Victorian Department of Health um, for validating multi-site, for developing and, and validating multi-site rapid plan models. So just a quick bit of background, there's a map of Australia. Victoria is this bottom right-hand side state down here. It's about one and a half times the size of Bangladesh, um, but we've got about 125th of the population of Bangladesh. So the sites that are included in the rapid plan group are shown by these red dots, sort of spread out across the state. And there's four main providers with different campuses. So there's about um, nine centers altogether who contribute uh, plans to the model. Um, the perceived benefits of this group when it was initially set up was that we would increase the number of plans for rare, rarer patient groups. An example of that is the anus BMAT model that we've come up with that uh, Peter Mack say, which is the biggest center in Victoria, we only get 25 anus cases a year to treat from radiofret therapy. Um, but combining from all the centers, we managed to get 70 patients treated within the last year um, to create a rapid plan model from. It also uh, is intended to improve planning consistency across the state. So if, the, if all the centers across the state are using the same rapid plan model, we should be getting very similar quality radiotherapy plans for our patients. Um, it also shares the workload of creating um, rapid plan models. Um, obviously we can, one center can just create a model and then share it with everybody. And it's really brought us together for statewide collaborations. So all of the centers, are, we're, we're communicating a lot when we're developing these models, which has been a real benefit. Um, so the framework we have uh, in the group for developing the models um, goes through a series of steps. I'll just go through the steps in detail. So first of all, we agree on 
So this is all of the centres getting together. We agree on dosimetry objectives, contouring guidelines, structure names, and the scope of the model. Um, and we sort of come up with documentation similar. So this, this is the lung model that I'm going to use as an example throughout this talk, um, which we've recently published just about a month ago. So we sort of agree on contouring guidelines for each of the organs at risk and the dosimetry objectives we're aiming for, which can be difficult because obviously we've got radiation oncologists across different centers and even within centers having to agree on objectives, which isn't always easy. Um, the group then decides a lead site and a support site. Um, ideally, they have the same eclipse version, but that, that has caused some issues in the past. Um, and then everybody who wants to contribute patients to the model exports their anonymized patients to this platform we have called PDX, um, which is a Victorian public sector initiative. So again, sort of statewide. Um, platform, online platform that allows us to transfer patient information between public institutions and now it includes private institutions as well. So for when we're having patients being retreated at a different centre, it's a really convenient way of sending that Vicon data between centres. But it's also got the, um, the storage space for the Victorian group to share patient data for developing rapid plan models as well. The next step is the lead site downloads all of this data from PDX and creates the model and then goes through an evaluation process and adds in any extra optimization objectives that we think are needed. Um, just showing for the lung model who contributed patients. So out of the five institutions, most of them came from Peter Mac, because we're the largest center, but um, patients contributed from five centers, which makes it a really diverse patient group, um, for, and which makes the model more, more robust. Um, you can see that most of them were uh, BMAP plans, there were a few IMRT plans in there, fairly even balance of which side they're on. Um, slightly higher number were Acuros, but we had a very substantial number of AAA plans in there as well. And then we've got the diagnosis down here. And then this is what um, prescription doses. So most commonly was 60 gray and 30 fractions, but some varying prescriptions as well. Um, so once we develop the model, the next step is to validate it. And we have a rule for the um, group that it has to be validated on at least 15 patients independent from the training set for, um, from three different hospitals. And then the lead site prepares the model documentation. So I'll just go through our validation quickly. We, we had 18 patients, six from each of three sites. And to validate the model, we just planned, we had the clinical plan that was treated for each patient. And then we just planned using the rapid plan model, so predicted the DVHs and the line objectives and ran that model without any interaction from the planner. So it was just run it through one iteration um, and no adjustment of any parameters. And then that plan was compared with the clinical plan. Um, and that comparison was done both quantitatively and qualitatively, which I'll go through. So for the quantitative analysis, analysis, we looked at all the DVH metrics that we decided on in the first place and um, produced these DVH, uh, these um, estimation plots, which are a really lovely graphical way of showing a comparison between two planning techniques. Um, so each line on here is one of the 18 validation patients. And the first point on the line is the clinical plan. And the second point on the line is the rapid plan plan. So the rapid plan with no interaction. So you can sort of see at a glance that there's a general downward trend, um, meaning that the mean heart dose was lower in general and the rapid plan plan than it was in the clinical plan. And that's also shown by the dot, the black dot, which is just below the zero line, um, showing that on average for those 18 patients, the heart dose, mean heart dose was lower with rapid plan. So we produced these plots for all organs at risk that were included in the model. So we've got heart ones in the first box, um, mean dose and B30. We've got a couple of esophagus metrics, lung metrics, and then spinal canal metrics at the end. And just at a, at a glance, the black dot is below zero for all of the organs at risk, except spinal canal is pretty much on zero, meaning that all the metrics, there may be a couple of patients that increased with the rapid plan model, but on the whole, the organs at risk, the metrics that we look at were lower with the rapid plan model. We also then went to look at um, target metrics. Now the targets aren't models or aren't predicted as part of the model. Um, so really uh, they're just optimized using some preset optimization objectives. But what was really nice here is you can see that on the looking at this GTV D99, there's a quite a wide spread of results for the clinical plan. And then they all converge to a much tighter spread for the rapid plan plan. 
And that's really showing that we're sort of achieving our aim of standardizing that plan quality across the state. Um, so if this model was used for all patients across the state, we'd be getting a much more consistent um, target coverage um, and also sort of the hotspot size as well, looking at the PTV D2 um, and median dose. So all of the target metrics really converge to a more uniform value. Um, and again, conformity, CI95 and CI50 both decreased on the whole as well. Homogeneity did increase slightly, so the plans did get slightly hotter, but by a very small amount. Um, so once we'd done the quantitative validation, we then asked an RO to look at all of the plans and we, we blinded her from which plan was which. So for each of the 18 patients, she looked at two plans. One was the clinical plan and one was the rapid plan plan, but she didn't know which was which. And we asked her to choose which one she would prefer to treat with. And she chose the clinical plan for eight of the patients and the rapid plan validation plan for seven of the patients. And the other three, she just couldn't choose. She said on the whole, the plans were so similar, it was very difficult to choose between them. So that result sort of shows us that um, by using the rapid plan model with no interaction, we're getting plans that are equally as good as the clinical plan and the RO found it very difficult to choose between them. So a much more efficient way of producing plans. Um, we also ran them all through multi-criterial multi optimi optimization, which is a feature um, available in Eclipse where you can um, try and improve, it sort of has sliders for each of the organs at risk and you can try and improve um, the dose to one organ at risk and see what the cost is to other organs at risk. And we found that really we could only um, improve the doses to the organs at risk for one plan without compromising target coverage or other organs at risk. Um, meaning that really the rapid plan model was achieving plans with the best dosimetry that we could hope for. Um, the support site then completes an independent review of the whole process. So they look at how the model was developed, um, the patient training set, and what validation work was done. And then once they've signed it off, the lead site will up upload the model and the documentation to PDX, the platform that we have across the state. And it is, all models are validated locally. So um, once the model's sent out, before you implement it in your own center, you are expected to run it through five patients just to check that you're happy with it clinically for your own department. And then the model's signed off and we do ask for feedback within six months and each model is reviewed um, every two years to make sure that it's still clinically relevant, um, patient case um, featured or prescription doses haven't changed or planning techniques haven't changed. So it was a great, really good process developing um, this lung model, but there were definitely some challenges that we find um, as doing this as a group. Um, Eclipse versions is one. So models aren't generally backwards compatible. I think they, I think they are backwards compatible for one version, but that's all. Um, so if one center is sort of left behind on an Eclipse version, they can't, they can't use the models that are created by other centers with more recent Eclipse versions. Um, Efficiency, it does take a long time to transfer all of the patient data. It needs to be anonymized, exported, uploaded to PDX, downloaded to create a model. But that does all take quite a lot of time. And in any case where you have decision by committee tends to slow things down a bit, even though it has lots of benefits, it can slow down the process as well. Um, the contouring and naming consistency across you know, many hospitals in one area um, can cause challenges, but we're definitely improving that over time, especially with publications of DG63 and things like that. Um, different RO require requirements may lead to plans that have different priorities in included in the model. Um, you know, as I said, even within the sense of the ROs don't always agree on what they're trying to achieve um, from a plan. Plan normalization, so different centers may have different normalization practices, which may, which may mean that the validation that's done um, at one center may not actually be applicable to another center because they may just then go and um, normalize all of their plans differently when using the model. Um, then that calibration conditions was a small one, but just made, we had to be careful, um, but we took that into account when we were comparing plan complexity. And planning algorithms. So we had to do some um, quite a lot of work on whether the model was both valid for both AAA and Acuros, which it definitely turned out it was. So we're very happy with the model being used for either algorithm. So despite all those challenges, we have been quite productive in the last five years. We've got um, models for seven sites. 
Um, and some of them are on up to their third version of being updated as well. So, and lots of patients, um, you know, that we can, we've managed to get into these models from all different sites. So in summary, we have successfully rolled out models for seven sites, um, each using training cases from at least three institutions. Um, the lung model validation has shown that using the rapid plan model reduces organ risk doses on average and standardizes the target metric coverage metrics. Um, and there are some challenges in group model development, but there's many benefits as well. And we've sort of shown that the statewide planning approach um, both standardizes the treatment quality, um, but also per personalizes using rapid plan. Um, the planning um, optimization because you know you're using each patient as inputs to predict the deviations for that patient. Definitely, it improves planning efficiency, um, and the collaboration between the hospitals in the state has been a really great benefit. We're all getting to know each other a lot better working in this group. So thank you, and I'm very sorry I managed to start presenting the wrong presentation. Um, this is just the acknowledgements of everybody who's currently in the group and who's previously been in the group. It's lots of people have been involved in the last five years um, and some the doctor at Peter Mac for reviewing all the plans and physics help as well. So thank you. My good here is now. Uh, uh, Just one, oh, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Catherine Lockford. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, because particularly the rapid plan is coming up in the future and also controlling issues and the intelligent uh, using of the contouring and other planning. So it will minimize our time in the real field and practice. Particularly, uh, we know actually we have a uh, we, time is a very short. We have to serve many patients, particularly like country like Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excuse me, Professor Hussain. We have modified yep. our program. Uh, the Electra, uh, we have uh, the Electra, one speaker already speak, spoke uh, 15 minutes. Another two speakers have 15 minutes allotted time. So we we ask the uh, Electra, Mr. Anup Kumar, please say, give your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, yeah. I I really appreciate and once again a thanks to the whole of what you can call the organizers to giving us an opportunity to show our product line. Uh, my name is Anup Kumar. I am the business line leader for the Neuroscience Division of Electa. But of course, uh, I'm going to present a product which is right now being appreciated well by the radiation oncology community as well. One of the main reason is that, as you know, we were talking about the efficiency, the, the new uh, environment of COVID where you need to have more collaborative work, where you need to have some sort of what you can call a work from different approaches. So that's the product I'm going to work upon. So please let me share my screen. Uh, is it possible to see my screen? Yes. Okay, I'm putting it into the, the uh, what you can call the presentation mode. So I'm going to talk about a little about the gamma knife, the technology, the treatment planning, and the new development. The, the main reason why Electa, even though we are having the state-of-art linear accelerators, new and new development in the linear accelerators, we are still hard, uh, promoting our gamma knife, which is still having the highest appreciation not only from the neurosurgery community, but also from the radiation oncology community. The increased appreciation is coming right now from the radiation oncology community. The main reason is that, as you know, the most important organ in the body is the brain, because every single millimeter is important in the whole brain. Whether it is, as you can see, that every single part of the brain is associated with some of the functionality of the human being. So what we need to do is that to treat, but preserve the healthy brain as much as possible. And, and you, as you can see that the most of the latest guidelines, which is coming from the, uh, uh, what you can call the radiation oncology or the medical oncology or the medical physics, you can see that the new guidelines are telling that when it comes to the brain, please try to use the stereotactic radio surgery as the first or the most preferable approach in the brain. The reason is that they want to preserve as much as healthy brain, just to treat with the accuracy and preserve the healthy brain as possible. 
So how the gamma knife is different from the other technologies available? As you can see from this picture, we are using 192 independent cobalt beams. They are non-coplanar simultaneous beams focusing on one single isocenter. And then using these multiple isocenters, because we give one shot at one center as an isocenter, and then you fill up using this multiple isocenters into the entire volume. Whereas you can see that with all the other technologies, you use a field to treat the tumor or the lesion in once as a single isocenter. So what happened is that there will be a lot of extra spillage of the, the, the radiation to the normal brain, which can definitely impair the cognition. With the new technology, you are improving the life of the patient, improving the expectation, expectancy or the life expectancy higher. But if the cognition is declined, then you have a problem. I'm just showing a small graphics video just to show how the technology of the gamma knife work. So this is an earlier version of the model where we were using a frame to fix the patient. And once the patient is fixed with the frame to the machine, the machine automatically do the collimation or the collision checks. Okay, you can see that the collision checks are done. And then what happens is that the machine will automatically will move into the treatment mode. In the treatment mode, all the collimators will move automatically to the prescribed dose positions. And then the cobalt will start coming into the position to give the, uh, the treatment. You can see that 192 independent beams will be focusing in one single area to give the highest dose. So what happens is that by using the umbra and penumbra by clearly defining the umbra and penumbra which is generating from the cobalt you fill up the tumor volume or the lesion volume with the energy which means the spillage of the extra dose to the brain is totally avoided so this is why gamma knife is the golden standard in the brain so let me just jump into because of the time uh, uh, what you can call the limitation let me just jump Version, I want to talk to you. So in this new gamma knife, when I mentioned about the technology, how the technology has evolved. So in the new gamma knife, what has happened, which is known as ICON, what we are doing is that we give the, uh, what you can call the facility to work with the frame, also with the mask. The mask, as you know, you all are very familiar. So what you can do that the entire process has been changed. Now the patient come with an MRI, you plan on that MRI. During the day of treatment, you put the patient with the mask, like a radiotherapy equipment, you put the mask, let the machine do a cone beam CT. And this cone beam CT is a volumetric cone beam CT, allowing the machine to understand that the patient is exactly in the isocenter. Then this information, the volumetric information will be transferred automatically to the gamma plan. And inside the gamma plan, the gamma plan will automatically co-register using this positional correction. So now what happened is that whatever the prescription you have already been worked upon the, the MRI, including the DVR, everything you can do the verification and you export it into the treatment console. Once you press the, what you can call the treatment button, automatically you can see that infrared rays will be closely monitoring the patient. So here, what happens is that we put a small sticker on the tip of the nose of the patient, and then the machine will be constantly monitoring the movement by using infrared, which means we are not using any X-ray additional to do the positional correction. This is a very important thing because in many patients, when you're treating, you don't want additional radiation going into the body to create secondary cancer. And you can see that the position here is just between zero and millimeter. That is less than one millimeter. And as a doctor or a physicist, you can make the threshold. What should be the, the 0.2 millimeter or 0.3 millimeter like that. And once what you can see that small movement, when the patient is above the threshold, the beam stops. There is no technology which makes like this. So it's not only doing the positional correction verification, it also stops the beam when the patient is outside the limit of the range you are talking. 
That is why gamma knife, we are giving a 0 0.3 millimeter accuracy in our statement, because this is the only machine which can give you the highest accuracy that is needed in the critical area. So gamma knife is the gold standard. Okay, from a physics point, you know, gamma plan is the main physics or the, 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 uh, the planning station. We give a comprehensive solution, which includes everything. It includes the basic gamma plan. It includes the emerge merge. You can merge a MRI with CT, with a SPECT CT, with a, uh, what you can call a PET, SPECT, everything. You can also uh, <clears throat> merge a DSA as well. We give you the atlas because in case if there are functional treatment to be done, we have the functional license and the atlas. You also have a, a, a license which is known as retreatment. That means in one metastasis, if you treat the patient in one time, next time if you want to retreat that patient, the gamma knife take into consideration how much radiation has already been given to this patient and then give the tolerance level based on that. Right now, I am also want to promote two products which has recently come, which is known as Lightning. Lightning is the new generation software, which is a new generation inverse planning based on a AI, artificial intelligence, this one, where just by telling the system, okay, this is my target and this is my radiation dose I need to, the prescription dose I need to give, you just press a button in less than two minutes, you will get the entire treatment plan done. And then by changing the tolerance of the organ at Dr. risk. Kumar, Dr. Anup Kumar, yes. let's yes. add another speaker, I think, or are you are the last speaker? No, no, I'm, I'm finishing. This is the last slide. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And so the lightning helps the, uh, the physics community as well as the planning to done it in very high speed. We also have something known as the remote. That means we can connect the gamma knife from anywhere using a laptop so that collaboration can happen. So this is the thing which I wish to promote to you. Thank you very much for the time because, uh, because of the time limit, I have to stop here. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you for the interesting talk. I think you have the last speaker, uh, Mr. Juboras, please short your uh, presentation. Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Professor. You, yeah, please. Yeah, uh, just sharing my screen. Just uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yeah. it's been nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks for this opportunity for providing us and uh, myself, Yuvraj, and the Baki team leader for Team Young and uh, medical physicist. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the Uncentra brachytherapy as a comprehensive treatment planning system for brachytherapy used in um, uh, Electa. And Electa is the uh, world leader in brachytherapy since 1975 with a global market share of 60% and uh, tailoring treatments to the patients through internal radiation alone or a combination of external and the internal radiation. Uh, it's time to focus uh, on what account as uh, Bracky offers a variety of uh, uh, smart tools that facilitates uh, many repetitive tasks for you and, uh, uh, and why Hansendra Bracky. Uh, easy mapping of patient anatomic contouring in arbitrary planes and a reduced implant reconstruction time and the implant modeling and applicator modeling and the simplified procedures of uh, automatic dose optimization methods which we offer it. As I said, it's an easy for the uh, patient anatomy for contouring in the arbitrary planes and uh, and OnCentra allows you to navigate freely in the image data sets, uh, whether it is CT or PET or ultrasound or MR based images. And you can scroll through uh, images in any directions, uh, providing full flexibility when uh, contouring a region of interest uh, in combination for the instance where the uh, tools, uh, the Perl tool and in any arbitrary planes, you can have a real 3D contouring possibilities. Uh, 
as shown over here, you can see the uh, all three arbitrary planes. You can give the region of interest which you are uh, going to want. The, the same concept is a uh, uh, free navigation uh, of arbitrary plane viewing is used for the catheter reconstruction mode as well, and giving the user flexibility in viewing the image data sets in the relation with the applicator positions. And it uh, increases the fast and easy use of reconstruction and highly accurate reconstruction for the applicants. And applicator modeling offers extremely fast and easy modeling of binary applicators in CT and MR datasets. And uh, implant embodied software is uh, incorporated on Sintra and uh, easy navigation of applicator positioning through the extra coordinates system. And also the implant modeling offers the option to use uh, reconstruction implants in brachytherapy and uh, first and uh, easy to create. And continuing with the applicator modeling, Electra supports for the uh, Electra rigid gynecological applicators and uh, especially for the ring applicators and shielded applicators uh, in on central practice accounts the dose attenuations and also the shielders are fully visible in the applicator model. And you can see the advanced visualization of the 3D of the applicators and the capture reconstruction uh, and accurate positions of the modeling of applicator modeling. And you have the access of uh, catheter movement and uh, reposition, and you can align your applicators as per your anatomy. And we introduce the implant modeling uh, 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 builds on the virtual uh, applicator modeling features uh, to reconstruct the multi catheter implants in a few seconds. Uh, uh, fits for the model data sets by implant and catheter manipulation, and you can. Uh, even if any catheter is bent, you can be able to do uh, adjustments with this. And you can see the, uh, the applicator assembly of uh, implant modeling with the real patient breast patients. Uh, and the final uh, point which we need to simply uh, is about the optimization techniques, uh, the simplified procedures. Uh, we have a solution of uh, IPSA and HIPPO, uh, which is uh, advanced uh, uh, inverse panning optimization techniques and uh, hybrid inverse uh, panning optimization techniques. And here we can uh, do the source activation of uh, optimization and normalization and prescription with the combined in a single steps. And you can, with a single click, when you do the optimization on based on the targets and OARs which you have uh, given the constraints. And in HIPSA, we have an additional feature uh, which improves that uh, you have the option of locking catheters for a particular catheter from the calculations. And here the source position and needs to be defined by us and also able to lock certain catheters from the optimization. And it's very useful when you are using the uh, ring applicator, vaginal ring applicators with the, uh, treating the ex uh, perineal extension diseases. And Electa uh, introduced the latest uh, algorithm with the uh, advanced collapse prone engine, uh, which as per the recommendation of task group 186 recommendations, uh, which uh, similar accuracy and faster calculation time to comparison with the Monte Carlo. And it is fully integrated with the Uncentral Bracky with the uh, uh, latest hardware and very fast uh, calculation time. And collapsed cone. Uh, has improved the discrepancy of PG46 with respect to the patient's skin dose and the agreement between the AS and Monte Carlo uh, reduces the better skin dose to the patients. And you can see the comparison of uh, on a brush patients, the, how the PG46 dose takes into the account of heterogeneity uh, around this uh, source and uh, the uh, AS comparisons of the dose distributions. And this is the workflow for the Uncentra Bracky. Uh, it's a fully DICOM compatible. You can be able to do import and export of DICOM images and uh, uh, fast 3D contouring with the uh, tools which were available for and easily navigate to these catalog managers for contouring and a reconstruction uh, faster with the help of implant modeling, applicator modeling and automatic reconstructions and also with the arbitrary plane reconstructions. And uh, as I said, the dosimetry optimization, we have the latest and advanced one like uh, Ipsa and HIPPO and also additional is uh, for heterogeneity calculations uh, 
advanced collapse cone engine. And, and we have some of the new features with our uncenter 4.6 bracket therapy, which improved a lot of uh, state of hearts and security and protection with the customer systems and also the uh, we implemented the customer suggestion. Is it yeah. possible, yeah. possible to shorten your lecture? Yeah. Yeah. It's my last, last slide. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 And implementation of uh, customer suggestions uh, and it's better uh, hardware and uh, improved uh, collapse cone engine for calculations of heterogeneity. And some of the new functionals, uh, just uh, making it faster. Uh, and new function of on center 4.6 to recognize the tip and reconstruction uh, orientation of the applicator. So it will uh, improve the customer's error of the reconstruction methods, and you can easily visualize the tip and connect trend of the applicator in the 3D. And also, as I said, uh, we have uh, providing uh, the well, uh, very uh, latest hardware for the collapse cone engine to get the fast and accurate calculation of those algorithm. And, uh, and our on center is compatible with all uh, microselectron HTS, which is provided by Electra, like the microselectron and the plexitron hardware. And what our user sees of our products, and these are some of the glimpses for your reference. And thanks for the time and the opportunity for me to present our work on center. Thank you so much for the interesting uh, lectures on brachytherapy. Brachytherapy has huge scope still in all over the world. It is also less cost uh, than uh, teletherapy. Thank you. Uh, thank Professor you. Thank Hussain, please. Thank you, Dr. Akram, as well. Yeah, I can, I can, I can see you. Well, thank you, Jubara. So yeah. long time I see you. Thank you. How are you today? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, thank Jubara. You. Thanks, sir. Okay. So thank you so much to see you again. I, I feel very good to see you again. So just actually, we have the we have a short of time. Actually, I have uh, we have the next presentation on uh, beam scan, the first truly automated wireless 3D water phantom. The Ruby, the new modular phantom platform for the high precision radiotherapy and SRS SBRT in the QA uh, by Masjid Sharab from P PTW. Yes, thank you, Sharab. Yeah, welcome. Is unmute, Mr. Yes. Now you can hear me. Yeah. Well, I hope you can hear me now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we we can hear Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the time and the invitation. I appreciate it very much. So uh, we are proud to be with you again, especially in the country Bangladesh, which uh, we love the country actually. But now presenting for the whole continent of Asia and Oceania. I'm sharing my uh, screen. So you have my screen now? Okay, just, just double check with you if you, uh, if you see my, um, my presentation in a proper way. Is it okay now? Okay, can start. So I'm talking today about a beam scan as a feature show and uh, well, how to how to start present the beam scan. I was thinking how, how I can uh, present it. And the best and the simplest way is to start with the workflow. So how it works, this is a beam scan in the bunker and um, the story starts with aligning the beam scan uh, according to the lasers that you have in your treatment machine. So you drive inside the bunker and uh, put the beam scan uh, uh, in the, in, in, let's say with the, with the uh, linear accelerator together to lock the wheels, plug in the power cable and the beam scan is ready for operation. As you see, there is no dosimetry cable here all everything is integrated inside the beam scan. Actually, you have a, a dodge, do, uh, dodge channel electrometer here inside, and you have the control unit inside integrated. You have the water reservoir here behind the water tank. So everything is in one system, all in one, and this is wireless. So you see there is only the power cable that you need. All measurements will be sent by Wi-Fi to the control room. We will see it in the next slides how it works. So the next thing would be to take your smartphone out 
and connect your smartphone with the beam scan. This is again a, a, a wireless, we should mention this is a wireless control pendant that you can control your, your uh, water fandom using your smartphone. And this the first thing that you would see after connection of the smartphone to the, to the beam scan, uh, the first thing you see, you see, you will see a wizard or the smartphone. So with helping uh, of this wizard, you can go step by step uh, controlling and doing the setup for your, uh, for, your, for your water phantom. The first thing that you will touch, uh, it will be the reference run and finding the zero positioning. Touching it, uh, all three arms will move and touch the wall, come back to the middle of the water tank, and this is the zeroing. Reference run also gives you the limits or the movements. So after that, the water phantom knows uh, how far the arm and the detector can move to each direction, not to touch the wall after you mount a chamber on that. So this is, this is the reference run and the zero position. Now this is the time to fill it with water. The next button on your smartphone is match water level to sensor. We have a water sensor here, as you see in the picture. And if you bring this arm down, you fill the water phantom with less water. If you bring it up, you can fill it completely uh, according to your needs, how much water and how, how much depth you would need. You adjust this water sensor with your mobile phone again, and then you touch the bottom match water level to sensor. And after a minute, you will have the water phantom full with water. Now, this is the leveling, the next step. But how we do it, we call it virtual leveling or uh, le true leveling. And uh, uh, the function is, uh, again, on your mobile phone, you touch the bottom and you say, I want to start the leveling of the water pad. The water sensor will move to three different corners in the water tank and will uh, simply calculate the tilt of this plane and after that, we know how we should move in the water or underwater in a way that we are always in the zero. So this is the leveling. We never move mechanically something. We simply correct the movement of chamber. It means when you tell me I want to be in the depths of 10, for example, or 20, uh, I move the chamber in a way that I always remain in the depths of 20 uh, millimeter or 20 centimeter even behind the water water surface. So I would I look at the water surface and not change the mechanical positioning of uh, of the water tank itself. Now water leveling is done. You will get also the uh, the measurements how tilted your water phantom is on your mobile phone just for your information. But then you can start with the SSD adjustment. We have a SSD plate here with a click fix. You put it on the, uh, on the a true fix that you have on the arm and you adjust your SSD. The next thing would be to take it out. You don't need any screwdriver. This is by click. And you take it out and you put uh, your true fix for your desired chamber. You put the chamber and you leave the treatment room now. We go to the next step of the automatic adjustment. You simply run the software and start the, uh, controlling the beam scan from the control room. As soon as you launch the beam scan software, you can start zeroing the electrometer integrated inside the beam scan in the bunker. You do the uh, zeroing, and the next step would be on the software, you have a button here, auto setup, and here you will see reference sun is done. Leveling is already done with your mobile phone. The next would be the beam center adjustment and the auto field alignment. And this is to finding the small errors when you are in the uh, adjustment with the laser. So you may have some millimeter left or right. And this is to find the rotation. We want to see if you have some degrees of rotation with your water tank. Um, this is again a one option that tells you you don't need to be so much careful when you put the water tank uh, in the room, so roughly uh, in, in the position, but all the rest we will find for you, we will adjust the movement of the chamber in the correct piece of water which you are 
uh, finding with these two options. Well, how you how to do that? You get two profiles. Um, uh, the, now cross now in, in these two direction with the red uh, shown here, and with that you calculate the center shift. So left or right, you get another two profiles, the blue parallel to each other, and with that you would need the, you would calculate the rotation of the water tank. And this is done, auto setup completed. Now you can start getting your measurements. You select your task list, whatever you want to measure, and start the measurement. The whole auto setup will take 15 minutes. And the unique thing with the auto setup is not only to make the job easy for you, is also the repeatability. So this is the, I would say, this is the more important than be faster. So be faster is of course a big advantage for everybody. But the good thing is that if you don't have your senior medical physicist who has done always this setup with Water Phantom and now he's gone, he's not, today is not here and he's somewhere else. And you want to let a junior medical physicist, a very young boy wants to do that, he can repeat the same and the repeatability is out of the experience. So everybody do the setup, will get exactly the same result because this is no human error here um, uh, considered. This is the big advantage for, for us in the medical physics team in the hospital to do this setup uh, without, let's say, depending on a very high skilled person who has done always this job for me, and now he is not in the in the clinic. Well, it is not all. We have uh, more points to enjoy. Uh, what we changed with the beam scan, uh, if you compare it with the older uh, generation of the water phantom PTW, like MP3 family, we changed the big uh, the wheels. So we have now big and easy running wheels, which uh, the, the the movement and driving uh, is now much faster and easier. We have a large footprint, not to touch the turntable here in the LINAC room. Uh, simply, we uh, increase the diameter of the drainage uh, hose, water hose. So with one inch, you have much faster filling time and much faster uh, empty. Uh, removing the water tank from the bunker is very fast now because the only thing that you have to disconnect is the power. Nothing more. So as soon as you are finished, you disconnect the power and you run out of the bunker. There is nothing after that. And the bottom of the water tank, uh, we incline the bottom to make the uh, water phantom completely empty. So the complete draining will happen when you have a, a bit inclined in the bottom and it helps no drop remains inside the water tank. Uh, the precision is exactly the same like MP3M, but even a bit more sophisticated. Now we have the 0.1 millimeter in the straightness of the bars, and the position error is also less than 0.1 millimeter thanks to the stainless steel bars here both. And the good thing here is that you can simply ch change this ABC arms uh, without, need to, without needing to send this water tank back to Freiburg. You can change it by yourself, just in case after many years you want to change it because of any reason. Inside the wall, you have a, a, thermo, a temperature, or better to say to a thermometer, inside the wall, touching the water always and sending the water temperature to the software, and it helps you to do the absolute dosimetry without thinking about uh, reading the temperature somewhere else. You have always the water temperature, the direct uh, reading, uh, continuous reading uh, from the water. The fast continuous scanning mode is also in integrated or added to the beam scan. Now you, have, you can uh, measure 20 millimeter per second uh, scanning, and this helps to make uh, some kind of profiles faster than before. So I come to the uh, something very interesting, which is which is added also to the software. We are talking about the Trufix, and you know the Trufix of PTW is something uh, very unique that you position the uh, effective point of measurement for a fan, for a chamber according to Dean. So as soon as you use the Trufix, you bring your chamber 
in a position that you can start measurement according to DIN. Now in the software, we have the possibility to move to chamber to other positions to, according to other protocols. And this is implemented in the software. So when you open the EMSCAN software, you will see the EPOM. Um, uh, and when you select it or when you touch it, you will see this kind of, um, let's say, uh, alternatives to select. So you can say, I want to position my chamber manually, or I, you say, I want to make it 0.5R or 0.6R or chamber access. So all of them are addressing a protocol, as you know, and you can also, as a, if, like they say, you have, you have also the visualization that you can see also what is, what is the meaning of 0.5R or the chamber access. So with the, with, the, with the picture, you can see what you're doing with your chamber and your truths. We talked about uh, uh, being wireless. I wanted to, 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 to show this slide saying that you have an access point. So you have a Wi-Fi generator here inside the beam scan, which gives you the Wi-Fi. Uh, when you, with your mobile phone, find uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi and the signal, you can get the BeamScan uh, software or BeamScan app directly from the BeamScan and control the BeamScan with your mobile phone. The signal goes also, the old measurements go to the access point, which you mount on the wall in the bunker. And this is then connected with the cable to the control room. If you have three bunkers with three Linux, you get three, three access points. And in each bunker, you would have one access point and it is enough to drive from bunker one to bunker two or bunker two to bunker three. And the beam scan will be automatically connected to the access point that you have mounted on the wall and sends the measurement to the control room. Another, another option added to beam scan, which is very interesting, is the check water level. Uh, we know we start at eight o'clock in the bunker, do some measurements and we start the commissioning or the complete comprehensive Linux QA. And after a while, we want to go to the lunch. Uh, we come one or two hours later and we want to continue. Uh, before continuing measurement, we, we say check water level. The water sensor, whenever it is, comes only for this task, comes to the water surface, and will report you in these two hours that you have not been here, you have lost two millimeter, for example, we will measure it, uh, the water. And the water surface is not the same that you have adjusted or made and at eight o'clock in the morning. The question is, do you want to compensate it or not? Uh, I would say the logic answer is here, yes, I want to, of course I want to uh, compensate, I want to come back to the the first setup that the initial setup that I had at eight o'clock. So I would touch simply the adjust, the pump starts, and you will get the last water again back in the water tank. And then you can continue the measurement. And whenever you want, you can, of course, check it. After five minutes, again, you can check it. Because of any reason, if you believe that the water surface is not the same, you can recheck the uh, water surface. The last thing I wanted to tell you, this is the beam dose. Uh, a module that you can get it with the, uh, with the beam scan together and is on the same platform of the beam scan software. You can connect this module, this software uh, to, the, to all electrometers that you have available in your uh, clinic. Beam scan itself, or even a multi-dose or a tandem or unidose E, unidose webline. Now today, Romeo and Tango. Uh, you can connect this software to all kind of uh, electrometers that you have, and you measure the, uh, let's say to start the absolute symmetry here, you can uh, consider the air density, uh, you can consider all correction factors that you would like to add to the measurement, and at the end, you will get the result, how, how much doses you are applying and do uh, a complete uh, absolute dosimetry. Here you get also the measurements, of course, from the, the temperature sensor on the wall of the water water phantom if you use the beam scan electrometer. So the correction, the temperature correction will be added here automatically. Well, 
This is, uh, it was the beam scan. Now I want to use the opportunity to come to the next product, uh, Ruby Phantom. I would say um, uh, I will finish my presentation and then I'm free to, uh, to, uh, to answer if there is any questions. I go to the Ruby Phantom. So what's the Ruby Phantom? This is also almost a new product. So about uh, one and a half year or two years uh, we are, but this is a dynamic product. Uh, we are adding every, every six months or something to this. And it, it makes the product, because of that, it makes the product very interesting. So uh, an overview about the Ruby Phantom. Why Ruby Phantom? So uh, let's start from the uh, uh, radiotherapy clinic today. We know we have not only a linear accelerator, we have also the MV measure with EPID. We have the KV system like Convium City in the room. We have the external KV systems in some clinics. And we have a patient table that can be rotated now. So this is a lot of moving mechanisms in, in the room that can, can uh, let's say, move. And uh, well, now we, we need a teamwork between all this Linux, CT, MRI, and treatment planning system and the imagers to be able to do the test, so-called end-to-end test, to be sure that Everything is rotating around one single point and we are, they are all coordinating together and we don't lose anything uh, in the measurement. And all the phantom can measure all these things, of course, must be also able to make it dosimetry for us. So we come to the solution of uh, this uh, wishes. So we want to have the, uh, to check the correct data transfer between the subsystems. We want to to, the correct, to see the correct mechanical realization of shifting. ISO center must be defined and the CT and MRI matching must be defined. So all together, you see we are thinking about linear quality assurance, the patient QA and the system QA. So there are three different things which we want to do in one phantom, how, how it is possible. So this is the Ruby phantom, how it works. Ruby phantom has a base phantom which you can take, and then there are four inserts which can be pushed inside the phantom. This is a modular phantom. Uh, according to your task, you can choose uh, the one that you want. Now I describe uh, each phantom one by one. So this is, the, this is the base phantom. You have city markers inside, and you have on the surface, you have also three marks which we will see in the next slides what, what they are for. So this is the basement that uh, you start with. The next would be, let's think about, yeah, there are the four inserts. And let's introduce these four inserts one by one. So the first one is, you tell me, uh, let's start with the patient dosimetry. Uh, this, with, inside of this, this insert, this is a homogeneous insert, you have the possibility to push one chamber inside this uh, insert and then measure uh, only one single point and compare it with your TPS. Obviously, you can use it for all non coconut art treatment plants as well. So it helps like end-to-end uh, -end testing using one single chamber, but in a homogeneous insert. So this is how it looks like. You see you have the detector holders, detector insert from here, you have a locking mechanism here, and the detector holders are available for Semiflex uh, 0125, the Semiflex 3D, the newer Semiflex from PTW, the Pinpoint 3D, Micro Silicon, and Micro Diamond. Obviously, we are using here the small size detectors. Uh, you, you never do it with the, like, with the chamber like farmer chamber. So this is thought for one single point dosimetry. So because of that, the inserts are available for smaller size of detectors. Um, this was, was for only one point. Now uh, somebody wants to make a plane verification, 2D uh, verification uh, using the film. The film insert is also available. So a piece of gaff chromic film can be uh, mounted in this insert. You push it inside and you do exactly the same a like chamber, but this time in a 2D with a piece of film, and you do the film dosimetry with that. This is again obviously for all kinds of treatments like non open and are um, applicable and possible. And this is how it looks like. 
So in the reality, you put it on the coach and do the patient uh, QA. The next one is the linear QA, how it works. We have uh, the tissue equivalent bone structure. So there are four pieces of bone here. You have also a ball, a high density radio, uh, radio opaque sphere, or so uh, as we call it, a ball here in the middle. Obviously with this ball, you can do the Winston Lutz testing. So you will, you will check the isocenter after your LINAC. And with this bones, which are visible to KV and MV imagers, you can check the alignment of the, um, of the um, system, let's say the IGRT testing. What is described in TG 179 and 142, you can simply do that, but how it is possible. In the next slide, you will see. So with this insert uh, of uh, Lina QA, you will get a tilting base plate which introduces a systematic error to the position. So when you are in the black, uh, black line, you are 100% correct position. When you are in the gray line, you are introducing a translation displacement, which is a classical error. And if you are in the red line with the lasers, you are actually trans uh, introducing a translation displacement and a rotation, a very small rotation to the phantom. And with uh, KB and MV major with the EPID, uh, if you have the 60 option coach, you expect that your system can find all these introduced errors to the system and give you the correct numbers that are all known to you. So you must be able to see that. And this uh, bone equivalent cylinders are found for, for KV major and MV measures to be seen by the system. So look at here. This is, for example, the red. As soon as you come to the red line with the lasers of the room, this is a patient which has uh, a defined error, and you expect that you can find it with your DNAC automatically. This offset. And this is the same image that you see with the Conbeam CT uh, in the room. And this is also the DRR image from the same insert. So with all equipment that you have, you are able to see the inserts and correct them in a way that you have your, let's say, correct positioning with the black line. So this shifting can be found by the system automatically. The next, is, uh, the next insert is a system QA. This is very uh, comprehensive insert. You have here the brain and lung and bone tissues inside, uh, all visible under the CT, of course. You have also MRI visible insert, which you can see with MRI. And the, one of the tests that you can do, you can simply check the image fusion between the CT and MRI is one thing that you do. And we shouldn't forget that in this insert, you have also the possibility to put a chamber between all these different inserts, plan it and check it with your GPS. So this is also a very comprehensive end-to-end uh, -end test with good challenges for your TPS as you have different kinds of tissues inside the Ruby Phantom. So you can uh, consider that uh, you are stressing enough your TPS to find the correct dose for you in one point. Uh, clear that you can do the non coponenar simply uh, with that. And this is also compatible with patient positioning system. So you can actually simulate what you are doing every day for the patients. So this is the detector insert for the dosimetry and they are the boulders. This is the MRI visible cavity. This is the lung equivalent material. This is the brain equivalent material. And this is the bone inside. And the detector is between all, all uh, these inserts. The next insert is the Multimet. This is the insert with uh, uh, position for three detectors, so three different positions for three detectors, which you can put inside. And you have then the bone equivalent cylinders uh, inside this insert. 
And again, this is for uh, patient QA, so you can, even for the TPS validation, you can check if you can, if you get the uh, calculated doses in these three predefined positions um, and check the plan and measure with the chambers one by one. The one thing which is new is we have the, uh, the uh, uh, well, let's say the head-shaped phantom instead of that, instead of the base, ba base, uh, basement phantom, the base phantom from the, uh, uh, the base root phantom. So instead of that base, you can put all these inserts which are introduced also to the head-shaped phantom according to your needs. So if you like it more, you can put all this insert is the, in the head-shaped phantom, which is more realistic from the, uh, from the geometry. So this is the family ruby, which every uh, every year or uh, every six months uh, even gets a new insert one by one. And this is a modular product. So you can start with one insert, which you need and increase it to the last, uh, to the last insert, which you believe you would need in your clinic. Thank you very much for your attention. I don't know how long I talk, but I hope I am in the frame. Thank you, Majid uh, Sharaf, for your excellent presentation of your phantom, new phantom, and uh, uh, scan, water scan. Yes, this is a very nice talk. And uh, uh, you are the only, I think, only vendors present here, and other vendors is not present here. We have today four. Uh, vendors uh, giving their presentation. Uh, this is from Timbest and from Electra and Varian and of course PTW. Uh, we have we have not seen any question. Uh, only then I have one question. Yes, you are the only present here. Uh, many countries of the world, especially developing countries, has no or few. Uh, radio di diagnostics, especially radiotherapy possibilities. And we have huge cancer patients all over the world. It is the duty of the politics, naturally the uh, international organization like WHO and IEA. Of course, the risk country has their also responsibilities and maybe also rich people. And of course, the vendors, what you are doing to spread or give help to the poor countries so that every cancer patient come in contact with the radiotherapy and radio diagnostic. Have you any plan? Well, uh, this is a very good question. Actually, we are concentrating on emerging countries since about two years. Um, the, the main point is that uh, we are, let's say, in a, in a subgroup of the suppliers. So the main thing is that we are hoping that uh, the big vendors like Electa, Varian, and other vendors can convince uh, the all involved bodies here to invest in the cancer and the radiotherapy. Uh, and all these things uh, must be done first by them. So as soon as we see that it is done and they are present and they can start treatment, they have a machine we are trying to give them, first of all, we want, before talking about equipment, uh, our main target is to bring the know-how to them because we have seen in several countries, not only one, in several countries we have seen, there is a machine, but there is not enough knowledge about the dosimetry. It's not enough to bring a machine inside the bunker and say, turn it on and you can start. This is the, and after that, before start working, they would need to know how to plan, but how to be sure that everything works well. The first thing that we are thinking at this stage is to bring the know-how to the country or to this clinic specifically. There are countries, as you said, there is only one machine, only one radiotherapy, which you can simply go there and teach these guys. You don't need to teach the whole country. So you go there and there are the few people that they are involved in, this, in the treatment. And like other emerging countries that they have several um, uh, radiotherapy centers, uh, our aim is, and we are doing it at the moment, very intensively and very, well, let's say, you know, clear, we do this, that we try to 
make a synergy between the clinics and the countries who are more advanced with the countries that they are less advanced, to share the knowledge between them. Uh, the dosimetry knowledge, how to make the dosimetry is with us. The equipment is in the field, in some countries, in some clinics. And if you are able to bring an advanced uh, and very well experienced medical physicist from this center to the neighbor country with, to show them how it works, you can simply increase the knowledge of dosimetry. And this is what we are following intensively. I can tell you, we have a long list of this uh, synergy effects. We are very happy with that. And we believe that sharing the, all this uh, information and all this knowledge between different countries can increase the quality of the life for, the, for our region. Yes, thank you very much for your comments. I think so uh, that uh, we should produce more skilled manpower uh, so that they can use the existing machine with very precise dosimetry for all the patient. Yeah. Uh, uh, I hope uh, the vendors also support in future uh, their own initiative, they can train the people all over the world, not only medical faces, also medical doctors and technician. And I hope they also support some organizations of initiative who work to build uh, medical faces, medical doctors or technician. Thank you and uh, best greetings from Bangladesh to Germany. Uh, your Corona situation, I think is not so good. <laughs> 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 in, okay. Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, a little bit best, better. Uh, thank you once again. You have new uh, government and best greetings from Bangladesh to Germany. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I thank every participant. And our next session starts in 14 hours. And uh, it is the radiotherapy, also very interesting. I, see, I can see here, Professor. Uh, Shantanu Choudhury, she uh, he will uh, take the chair of this uh, session. Please uh, participate this important session. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, the vendors, once again from our groups and organization and committee. Thank you. See you.
I still remember that morning, the day I first set foot on the campus as a student. I couldn't imagine that the campus of a private university is so large. Yes, I'm talking about United International University. Built on 25 bigas of land, 30% is built up area and 70% is open space. There was a large corridor in front with a lot of students. I went ahead with a surprised look. As soon as I entered the class, all the new faces stared at me. They were my university classmates. Sir entered the classroom, lesson started. The way of teaching was different. He explained everything in a simple way. Beyond theory classes, there were associated laboratory classes on different subjects. A large number of computer labs for meeting the needs of CSE students. Socket lab, machine lab, digital lab, microprocessor lab, communication lab. All are equipped with modern setup for producing competent AAA graduates. Civil engineer labs to prepare civil engineer students to design and build modern infrastructure. The robotics lab is the place for innovation and discovery in this era of fourth industrial revolution. In advanced intelligent multidisciplinary systems lab, researchers are exploring the application of IT in multifaceted domains including health sector. Center for Energy Research, CER, is dedicated to the research in producing clean energy. It is thus helping the country to combat against effects of climate change. It has modern servers and data centers of international standard to keep the campus live online without interruption for a second. Proverb goes that the more you read, the more you learn. There is a spacious library stuffed with so many books and a pleasant calm environment for serious reading. Spending time with friends in a lovely green environment was really very exciting. Large playground over the horizon cannot be forgotten. Suddenly, I was in trouble. It would be too late to get money from home. A friend advised me to go to the DSA office. I went and got an interest-free education loan. What a relief it was for me. There is no end to the benefits. There's a game room, gymnasium, nice canteen, large auditorium. Plenty of benefits. Is it possible to pass without good results? So, study, study, and study. I got scholarships several times along with many of my classmates. The wheel of success of this organization is moving forward under the leadership of our Honorable VC Sir, Professor Dr. Chaudhry Mafizur Rahman. And that's why United International University has been accredited by ACBSP, IEB, SEMA, and has been ranked in Asia by QS. The main secret behind this is the quality of education and all the modern facilities. Time passes by. A special day comes. I got the certificate of graduation from the Chancellor. Today, during my busy schedules at work, even though I'm far away, I still remember the key contributor of my success, the United International University. Today, graduates of United International University are working successfully in home and abroad, bearing the flag of this noble institution. United International University Quest for Excellence Launching a new era PTW Beam Scan the new water phantom, automated, wireless, fast. PTW.
beams you up to a new era in 3D water scanning. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on the 20th Asia Oceania Congress of Medical Physics. This session is on radiotherapy in online hall A. Today we have with us Chair Dr. Sandana Jodri and Co-Chair Professor Dr. Sung Yong Park. Now, Dr. Santana Chaudhary is a chairman at Pushpanjali Cancer Care Institute, India. Trained in Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, he is widely internationally acclaimed clinical oncologist who has worked in India and abroad. As an eminent ac academician and teacher, he has more than 150 original research publications in this field. He has close to 30 years of national and international experience former director and HOD Oncology Regional Cancer Hospital at Hospital Nagpur, consultant at Tata Memorial Hospital Mumbai, and part of visiting pro uh, professor program at Austin Hospital Oncology Center, Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. He's also a visiting fellowship at Christie Hospital, Manchester, UK University, uh, Hospital Frankfurt, Germany, William Beaumont, Hospital Michigan, USA, and many international sites. Nearly 150 national and international publications. He has many international and national memberships. <clears throat> and uh, our co-chair, Professor Dr. Sung Young Park, is a chief proton physicist at National Cancer Center, Singapore. Professor Sung Young Park um, is Chief Pro Proton Physicist at National Cancer Center Singapore and Professor at the National University of Singapore. He has over 28 years of clinical working experience from several institutions. During his career, he has been involved in setting up programs at two new radiation oncology departments, including proton therapy, uh, HDR tomotherapy and SRS SBRT and has been instrumental in selection, commissioning, uh, acceptance and training of staff. He has published more than 119 research articles and given more than 81 invited talks. He has also received several research grants and patents. These are our chair and co-chair and I now hand over the authority to conduct this session to them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of me and uh, Dr. Park, I thank uh, AOCMP 2021, the organizers for having invited us. And uh, also thank uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Anupama and Dr. Zakaria and the brethren of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, for letting us be the chairs here in this uh, program. Uh, I would now uh, hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Park to introduce the first speaker. Okay, thanks, uh, Professor. Okay, uh, welcome to this session. And I'd like to uh, first introduce the first invited speaker, uh, Salahuddin uh, Ahmad from uh, USA. Uh, the title of his talk is Advances in Particle Therapy Treatment for Cancer. Uh, Dr. Ahmad, please. Is he not joining? Sir, uh, we will yeah, play his recorded lecture due to time difference. He has sent us a recorded lecture. Okay. Can we take the second lecture and then maybe he can come next? No, sir. A recorded video will be played. Okay. Okay, so we can move to the next speaker then. 
Today, I'm going to talk on advances in particle therapy treatment for cancer. My name is Salahuddin Ahmad. I work at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center in Oklahoma City of the United States of America. My talk consists of four outlines. First, interaction in nature and particle classification, then history of particle therapy, physics of protons and heavy ions, and finally, Navion and OU Health Sciences Center, Cancer Center. All the phenomena in this universe that happen can be explained in terms of four interactions. One is called gravity, then weak, electromagnetic, and strong interactions. The gravity interaction is carried by graviton, which is not yet observed, and it acts on all the material particles. Weak interaction is carried by W plus, W minus, and Z0 particles, and it acts on quarks and leptons. Electromagnetic interaction is carried by photon or light, and it acts on quarks and charged leptons, as well as W plus and W minus. Weak and electromagnetic interactions together is known as electroweak interaction. Strong interaction acts on quarks and gluons, and it is carried by gluon. There are six quarks and six antiquarks having fractional electrons. As you can see, up charm top, down strange and bottom quarks. For example, up quark has two thirds of the charge of proton. Composite particles made of quarks are called hadrons. For example, proton. The charge of the proton is one because it consists of two up quark and one down quark, which is two third plus two third minus one third makes it one. There are other types of matter in nature, which we call leptons. There are six leptons, three of which have electrical charge and three of which do not. They appear to be point-like particles without any internal structure. The best known lepton is the electron. Nucleus is made of neutrons and protons when they are composite of quarks. On the left-hand side of the slides, as you can see a nucleus, which has neutrons and the proton, and the dimension of the neutron is 1.6 Fermi. And typically a nucleus, the diameter is 4.8 Fermi. On the right-hand side of the slides, you can see the internal structure of the proton and the neutron having up quarks and down quark, and the string is just like an interactional part, which is the gluon. Hadron therapy, by hadron therapy, we mean that therapy that uses proton, neutron, pion, antiproton, light and heavy ions as beam particles. They are all made up of quarks and antiquarks. Now I'm going to discuss about the history of protons and heavy ions. First, 1990, Rutherford proposed the existence of protons. In 1930, Lawrence built the first cyclotron. In 1946, Robert Wilson proposed proton therapy. In 1954, Tobias et al. treated first patient with proton at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. In 1957, first patient was treated with helium ion at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory in California. In 1961, Zellberg et al. treated patients with proton at the Harvard Cyclotron. In 1972, Mass General Hospital received first NCI grant for proton studies at Harvard Cyclotron. In 1975, 
first patient was treated with neon iron at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. In 1991, first hospital-based proton facility at Lawrence at uh, Loma Linda University Medical Center in California. In 1992, heavy ion therapy program closed at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and in the United States. In from 1975 to 1992, 433 patients were treated at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory with neon ion. In 1994, patients treatment with carbon ions at Himak in Japan started treating patients. In 1996, patient treatments with carbon ions started at PSI in Switzerland. And in 1997, patient treatments with carbon ions started at GSI, also uh, in Germany. Until 2012, 36 proton, 12 in the United States of America, and six carbon ion facilities worldwide treated patients treated over 93,000 patients with proton and over 10,000 patients with carbon ion. Until November of 2019, particle therapy, proton and carbon ion facilities worldwide in clinical operation was 99. And under construction was 44. And in the planning stage, was 25. So clinical operation, 99, out of which North America has 36. That consists of 35 in the United States of America and one in Canada. Europe has 28 facilities. Far East had 28 facilities. And our neighboring country, India, had one. Under construction, there are 44. China has eight facilities under construction. USA has seven. Japan has six. And our neighboring country, India, has two. Particle therapy facilities around the world is shown in this slice in the map. As you can see, that 36 in the North America, 28 is in Europe, and one in India. Now I'm going to go to another direction. I wanted to explain about fundamental things to remember about protons. Protons stop. As you can see in the picture, the proton curve, it stops around 25 cm depth. Photons do not stop. As you can see the photon curve, it never stops. It goes even beyond 40 cm of the depth. Proton dose at depth, is greater than those at surface. As you can see at the surface, which is as a one or two cm, for example, and then check the curve at the 25 cm. So proton dose at depth is greater than those at surface. Photon dose at depth is less than the dose at Dmax. From the curve, you can see that. And this is a comparison for 15 MeV photons versus spread out black peak protons. This is another slide showing the black peak, for example, for the proton. And here, the main interaction of proton is proton beam interact with the atomic electron of the target. For example, water or tissues fats on the target. So that is the primary, the most important interaction is the incoming proton interacts with the electron of the targets. In these slides, you can see normalized black curves for various proton incident energies. Range straggling will cause the black peak to widen with depth of penetration. So the top one is normalized at the 
at the black curves, but the bottom one is the normalized at entrenched curves, entrenched black curves for various proton incident energies. The energies are plotted here from 100 MeV to 250 MeV. These slides will show you the advantages of proton therapy. You can see that this is the depth dose curve for the photon beam, modified proton beam, and native proton beam. Native proton beam is actually the pristine black peak, as you can see, and the modified proton beam shows the spread out black peak. We use the spread out black peak to cover the tumor. On the right hand side, you, you can see on the top the conventional radiation therapy deposits most of the energy before the target, means before the tumor. On the other hand, the bottom one is the targeted proton therapy. Here you can see deposits most energy on the target and the exit dose is practically zero. There is also another type of interaction that happens in the proton that is called electromagnetic interactions with protons of the nucleus. And they are responsible for protons scattering due to elastic Coulomb interactions with the target nuclei. The third interactions is actually the nuclear interactions of protons. The certain fraction of the protons undergo nuclear interactions, mainly on oxygen, because in human tissues has water practically, which has oxygen. Nuclear interactions lead to secondary particles and thus to local and non-local dose deposition neutrons. As you can see on the right hand side, incoming proton comes in, it interacts inside the nucleus, which has the proton and the neutron, and then exiting photon and neutron. In passive scattering systems, neutrons are produced in the first and second scatterers. Also in modulation pill, aperture, range compensator, in addition to those produced in the patient's body. Now I'm going to show you in one slide what is the physics behind heavy ion fragmentation. As you can see, carbon ion therapy, projectile. So the projectile is coming with a velocity and it interacts with the target in the, in the human body, for example. This type of process, we call it abrasion. It breaks the target, target becomes fragmented. Projectile also gets broken and, and we, that will produce a fireball. So projectile fragmented, target also fragmented. This type of physical process, we call it ablation. So ablation and ablation are responsible for heavy ion fragmentation. Here we can see black peaks. So the red colors are carbon ions at two different energies, 200 MeV per nucleon and 270 MeV per nucleon. You can see the black peaks are really sharp. We also plotted the cobalt 60 depth dose curve as well as the LINAC of 25 MeV depth dose curves here. Just to compare about how it looks like uh, the carbon ion black peaks compared to the depth dose curves of photon at two different energies. Black peaks of protons and carbon ions. You can see here that the black peak of 250 MeV per nucleon carbon ion is much sharper and protons is a little wider. 131.46 MeV per nucleon. The interesting thing is the radiobiology. Of course, the carbon ions 
radiobiology is much uh, RBE uh, is much higher than the proton. Proton is 1.1 and, and the carbon ion is 2.5 to 3. So it is much better as far as the Bragg peak is concerned. But look at the tail dose. In the carbon ion, it has a large tail dose extended up to the depth of 140 millimeter in this slide. Whereas in the proton part, the tail, tail dose is practically zero around 132 millimeter in these slides. So in that sense, the normal tissues beyond the tumor has less likelihood to get dose from the proton beam than carbon ion beam. Now I'll show you some typical accelerators. Hitachi 250 MeV synchrotron where the 7 MeV is the LINAC, is the injector of the beam. Next, IBA 230 MeV cyclotrons. The third one is ACCL superconducting cyclotron, 250 MeV. Barium cyclotron, and the right-hand side of this slide has the Korean cancer center proton therapy, which is which produces 235 MeV proton B. This is the ancient Berkeley 184 inches synchrocyclotron at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. This facility was used to start treating patients with a proton beam as well as carbon ion, helium, and neon beams. I already men mentioned that 433 patients were treated with heavier ions, most of them with 670 MeV per nucleon neon beams. Total number of patients treated using Berkeley synchrocyclotron is 2,340. Now I'm going to show you about the superconducting synchrocyclotron one room facility. 10 Tesla superconducting magnet was used and enables a smaller, lower cost gantry mounted cyclotron that is available in our facility. As you can see, the total gantry rotation is 190 degree, total couch rotation 270 degree, and it provides all clinically used beam angles, a PPA, left right lateral, angled oblique tangential. A typical room, which is called Compact Monarch 250 Proton Therapy System. Now we call it Mavion. As you can see, the couch and the gantry of the, uh, of the facility. This is the, another picture, which is the proton therapy system, Mavion. As you can see, the patient is lying down on the couch and this, the beam is also rotating so that you know, it can, treat, it can uh, uh, put beams from different directions. Another pictures of the state-of-the-art proton therapy, Mavion. This is the OU Health Sciences Center where I work. As you can see, this is the cancer center where the proton facility is there. This is the main hospital where we treat our patients. Here, we have the gamma night systems. This is the Children's Hospital, and this is the Oklahoma City VA Hospital. These are the Stephenson Cancer Center at the University of Oklahoma, and this is an MCI um, Cancer Center, a cancer center designated by the National Cancer Institute. This is our proton board in the Stephenson Cancer Center. Conclusions. The Mavion S250I system was successfully commissioned at the Stephenson Cancer Center and released for clinical use, which started in January 15, 2019. Many more particle therapy facilities are under construction and in the planning stage. Future development, such as flash therapy and arc therapy with proton, are currently being considered.
Thank you for listening my talk. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmad. Uh, are you online now? Dr. Ahmad? Or maybe uh, he's not aware over here. Yeah, he has some technical difficulties. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much uh, for your great uh, talk on um, about the proton therapy system. And uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, he said uh, start the video. Okay, Dr. Ahmad, can you hear me? Uh, okay, uh, I think he has given us a very good uh, overview of uh, proton therapy from very basic physics to his systems. Uh, but um, I don't think he's available right now. So maybe we can move to the next speaker then, Professor. Yeah, I'll, yeah thank you, Dr. Park. Uh, the next uh, speaker is um, Dr. Murugan Appaswamy from Bangladesh. And he'll be talking on VMAT, a single window system for state of the art radiation techniques. So, Dr. Appaswamy, please uh, yeah. do your presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shantanu, for the great introduction. So, today I'm going to talk. Uh, uh, my uh, screen is visible. Am I right? Is it visible, my screen? Yeah, yeah, it's visible. Yeah, okay, fine. So today I am going to talk about the uh, efficacy of uh, VMAT system. Uh, as you all know, uh, there are uh, different areas in the clinics. The VMAT has its uh, definite role uh, in, con in considering radiotherapy. So before starting my presentation, I would like to thank the entire AOCMP organizing team for giving me an opportunity to share our research experience in the wonderful platform. And once again, I want to congratulate the entire team for organizing this excellent uh, conference despite of this challenging period of time. So let us move into my topic. So if you look into the role of VMAT, as we all know, uh, unlike uh, IMRT, so we have the freedom of uh, more doing the intensity moderation across the entire arc 360 degree. And uh, during the treatment, the speed of MLC as well as the gantry also can be moderated according to the need of the clinical need. So it also has certain clinical potential uh, benefits, like it has greater uh, normal tissue sparing, and we can escalate the dose uh, higher uh, when than compared with the conventional IMRT. So, uh, as I told you, VMAT has uh, many different uh, areas as its definite role in the radiotherapy. So, in this presentation, I am going to talk about the HT efficacy in the intracranial radiation as well as in case of uh, total body radiation, which we have started uh, recently in our center at Evercare Hospital, Dhaka. So, uh, if you look into the PubMed also, the uh, research articles publishing in the VMAT is also increasing day by day, I mean, starting from two, since from the introduction in 2006, and it is increasing every, every year. So, to, uh, to evaluate the role of VMAT in the treatment of intracranial radiation, uh, being an ELECTA user, uh, we have two options in our clinic, like either we can go with the agility MLC with the VMAT technique, or we can go with a dynamic conformal arc with Apex uh, micro MLC. So in this study, we have compared, dosimetrically compared these two techniques and evaluated uh, its clinical potential benefits by evaluating uh, two plants in terms of target coverage, uh, conformity and the uh, dose fall of outside the PTV, as well as the monitoring unit, uh, total monitoring unit required and uh, dose to the organ at risk. So this is the list of patients uh, which we have treated more in the past uh, six months in our clinic. So the, the diagnosis ranges from AVM to trigeminal uh, scoroma to the brain mess and vestula stroma. And the patient has a different number of lesions, uh, either single or multiple lesions. And the size also varies uh, as shown in the picture. 
So all the patients undergone the regular uh, treatment uh, procedure like intertherapy. Uh, after the patient preparation, they undergone CT as well as MRI uh, imaging. Then we fused through the MRI images and the contouring was done by an experienced radiation oncologist. Uh, we used these two MLCs to perform a dosimetric study. So as you know, Agility has a 5 mm uh, width at the isocenter, uh, and it can travel at the speed of 6.5 centimeters per second. Uh, whereas the Apex MLC has uh, almost uh, 2.45 mm at the isocenter, and it has a limitation uh, of maximum of 12 by 14 centimeters right at the center. Uh, and it can travel up the, uh, at the speed of one centimeter per second. These two MLCs we used for our study. So when we consider about the study for each patient, we uh, made two plans. Uh, one for uh, base using VMAT uh, with, uh, for SRS treatment, and other one is dynamic uh, confirmed art therapy uh, using the Monaco treatment planning systems. Uh, so we use the 6ME triple photon beam uh, for the uh, treatment plan, and we have used a unified prescription of 15 gray in two fractions. So when, when considering the dosimetric analysis, uh, we have created the two plans with the uh, equal uh, clinical uh, uh, outcome. Uh, and then we have evaluated the dose to the uh, target uh, with like a D max and a D minimum and a mean, and then those covered by the volume of 95 percentage as well as uh, uh, D95. And we also evaluated the conformity and heterogeneity index, gradient index also we have calculated. So we, apart from that, we also evaluated the dose, uh, 10 grade dose to the uh, normal prime and the other critical structures. So first, if we look into the dose uh, to 95 percentage of PTV, uh, the VMAT technique has always uh, has better coverage when compared with the dynamic conformal arc therapy. So almost, uh, uh, almost for all the analyzed PTVs, the VMAT has uh, better coverage when compared with the dynamic conformal arc therapy. Um, when, you can, when, you, when we analyze the maximum dose uh, received by the PTV, uh, here also we can see a similar scenario where uh, the yeah, maximum of 29.3% uh, dose was deposited uh, using the VMAT uh, technique when compared with the DCA. So uh, similarly, uh, the mean dose of the VMAT also uh, found to be higher in uh, many scenarios uh, uh, for uh, during, uh, when compared with the uh, dynamic control therapy using agility. So apart from this, we also did a statistical analysis and to understand how far this varies. So when we compare the uh, max dose, uh, is not varied much uh, among the analyzed cases when compared with the, uh, the DCA plan in using a, a, a proximity. So a yeah, similar trend was observed, uh, but here the thing is uh, the VMAT plan uh, where we use the agility MLC has a better coverage. That is most of the times uh, the maximum the dose deposit was almost 96.3 and it is more than 95% of prescription dose. Whereas uh, in case of uh, DCA with the uh, agility, uh, in certain clinical scenarios where the OERs are overlapping with the uh, target, so the uh, dynamic conformal arc may not be able to deliver the intent intended prescription dose to the PT. So when uh, we also analyze the, how the dose fall off uh, happening outside the PTV. So we measure the distance between 80 to 60 percentage isosceles line uh, using equivalent uh, spear method, as well as the uh, distance between 80 and 40 percent isosceles line. So if you look into the uh, picture, uh, you can very well appreciate that the distance uh, of 80 and 60 percent isosceles line in case of VMAT was less when compared with the uh, DCA plan. A similar trend was also observed in case of uh, uh, distance between 80 and the 40% isosceles line. Uh, 
so when 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 there are some uh, critical structures uh, the the dca is tend to deposit uh, more dose on the other side uh, when it was trying to spare on the one side of the uh, target where it had to it has worn up with the critical structure so uh, so the, the the higher dose as well as the uh, uh, less dose fall outside the ptv in vmat we could able to achieve at the cost of uh, more monitoring units so when we compare the monetary units required to deliver the stereotactic uh, do, uh, del treatment delivery, the VMAT requires more uh, MU when compared with the uh, dynamic control or therapy. So in many cases, it was more than uh, two to three times than the tough uh, we, uh, DCA we were uh, using. It. So this is the dose uh, we have uh, cal calculated uh, for the organ at risk. So if you look into the maximum dose received by the OIRs in case of VMAT was less when compared with the dose, maximum dose received by the um, DCA plan. And if you look into the variation among the analyzed uh, dose, the protose is also found to be lesser when compared with the uh, the DCA plans. So it means uh, the dose, uh, the, 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 uh, the VMAT has bit consistency in delivering the required dose and the less dose to the target, uh, OER as well. So we also has compared our results uh, with the published data. So uh, uh, like what we found in our study, the higher target coverage and heterogeneity, the same uh, study was reported by Moin et al. when compared with the uh, Mr. Swallow Moss, where they uh, found that the VMAT has a better performance uh, has scores higher when compared with the dynamic conformal arc. Uh, similarly, uh, low dose outside the PT also reported by the Wolf et al. in case of VMAT comparing with the DCA plans. So as we, we found in our study, the, the VMAT plan was more heterogeneous than when compared with the uh, DCA plan where we found the dose was more of homogeneous. So yeah, similar uh, yeah, results were reported by the uh, Eastern stuff as all in the literature. So the higher Vmax in the PTV in the VMA, I mean VMAX based student activity modeler was also reported by Sarkar et al. Uh, uh, in the two year, year before in 2019. So the, 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 we also found that the, the speed of the MLC makes the biggest difference of uh, these uh, two drastic uh, variations in the dose diffusion as well as coverage in case of student activity using two MLCs, Agility as well as Subex. So uh, 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 along with that, uh, we, I would like to share our initial experience of uh, treating uh, total body radiation by VMAT. So we have started uh, a year before the TBI uh, with the VMAT. So I'm, I'm going to share the process of what, how we do the VMAT uh, in our clinic. So initially, the VMAT uh, TBA start with the preparation, patient preparation, uh, using uh, mobilization devices. We use the whole body blue back for whatever uh, electa for immobilizing patient with the head only uh, mask, thermoplastic mask. So uh, typically, we will immobilize the patient from head to toe. And we acquire the CT scans in two part, uh, one up to the uh, mid, mid femur right, with head first, the other one is like uh, feet first up to the pelvis region. So then we will add these two uh, uh, CT scans to uh, get the entire patient's CT images. So this is how we do in our clinic system. So then the contour delineation was done by the radiation oncologist with all the OERs and especially uh, lungs, kidneys, and uh, lens are the important uh, organs which we will be including in our uh, optimization. So we uh, typically will have two uh, yeah, PTVs. One is copper PTV, which is uh, created by subtracting lung and kidneys and lens. Uh, whereas the lower PTV is only the legs and the, uh, uh, we, we will have almost uh, four to five centimeter of overlap uh, to avoid to take care of the uh, dose matching when we do the VMAP plan. 
So the treatment plan consists of two parts. One is head, head first and the other one is feet first. So we, in the uh, head first plan, we will use almost four to five or up to six in case of uh, patients having uh, more heights. Uh, the length depends upon the length. And we use uh, almost uh, uh, yeah, 22 centimeter apart, we will use the arts, uh, replacement of the arts. So we will prefer to have two to four centimeter of overlap. So then uh, we use the lower part, uh, we will use the extremity, lower uh, legs, the extremities, we will use 3D CRT because we found it is, uh, it reduces the treatment time drastically. So we use the bias dose technique for uh, matching the uh, junction dose. Uh, and we, we, we use the IMATRIX uh, triple of uh, uh, the, uh, dosimetric array for checking the VMAT plans. And uh, initially, we used the flints for checking the warnaps. So, this is the treatment plan showing the both head first and feet first plan. So, this is the outcome of the plan. Uh, we typically treat the toll gray in six fractions bi daily. So, we use almost five arcs, so five to six arcs for upper PTB. So, this is the statistics of the uh, treatment planning outcome. So, and for the lower PTV, uh, it consists of two things. One is VMAT, the other one is uh, 3D CRT with the FPBA for the lower extremities. So, when, can, when we, after the treatment plan, the QEA, the delivery, uh, for due, on the day of treatment delivery, we use the cone beam CT to verify the patient positioning. So the tricky part here is uh, we acquire the first ISO one, and then after that, uh, we will check the entire uh, ISO for the reproducibility. And once we acquire the CT scan, uh, the- Dr. Okay, Murugan, I would request you to uh, uh, you know, wrap up a bit early because we have crossed the time limit. Yeah, in another two, uh, two minutes I'll finish. Yeah. Thank you. So after the treating the ISO one, we can remove the head, uh, head mask for the patient's comfortability. And we use the portal imaging for the um, verification of the 3D CRT uh, extremity position. So the treatment time uh, takes almost uh, at, uh, from uh, one, or one, one hour, 15 minutes to almost one hour. In some cases, maybe the initially. And this can also be brought down significantly if you practice in clinics rigorously. So in summary, uh, I would say that uh, the, uh, sorry for, uh, for the spelling mistake. In case of intracranial SR, SRSRT, the VMAT based plan scores higher in terms of heterogeneity, higher uh, DMAX doses and the conformity. Uh, the Apex CMLC may not be uh, doing better, uh, producing better results in certain cases where there is a overlap in the OIR, uh, in the, where the PD overlap is a OIR. Uh, it is preferable to use VMAT with agility, except for some uh, peripheral lesions. So in case of TBA VMAT, it has uh, shown us the way for organ sparing TBA, and it is possible in most of the clinics with appropriate accessories and where we have set in rooms for the mission time. Uh, that means that mission should have some free time. Otherwise, we will not able to do it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, truly, VMAT has uh, come a long way uh, in field of stereotaxy and uh, TBI. And uh, nice to know your uh, hospital is doing so much good work. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll uh, request Dr. Park to introduce the next speaker, please. Okay, thanks again. Uh, for next five uh, presentations, uh, each one it consists of uh, 10 minutes uh, of, of presentation and eight minutes dis uh, presentations and uh, two minutes discussion. Okay, uh, so the next speaker is uh, uh, Miriam uh, Ecker uh, from Germany. Uh, the title of uh, uh, the, her talk is Dosimetric Benefit of uh, uh, Daily Treatment Plan Adaptation for Prostate Cancer Stereotactic Body, body Radiotherapy uh, Based on Synthetic uh, Combined CT. Please start your presentation. 
Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation. I'm really grateful for being given the chance of speaking here today. So I hope I, give you, I can give you an overview about the dosimetric benefits of treatment plan adaptation for prostate cancer stereotactic body radiotherapy based on synthetic cone beam CTs. So let's start with a short introduction about um, synthetic CTs and how they can be created based on deep learning. 15 publications alone have been available on synthetic comb beam CT since 2017. And this was um, portrayed by a review of Spadea and his research group. And this points out their increasing relevance for daily adaptive radiotherapy. In our research, we made use of a cycle generative adversarial network, a cycle gun. And this was available in the standalone module of Monaco Research Environment in the Admire interface. The original network structure can be obtained by the publication of Sue and others. Our training was based on paired combeam CT and planning CT. And we focused here on the pelvic body site, whereas the original paper also was published last year on two other body sites of thorax and head and neck. And here we see the results of the planning CT, comb beam CT, and the corrected synthetic CT. And not only visible, but also based on the intensity volume histogram, we can identify that the synthetic CT got rid of a lot of scatter artifacts and also was able to recreate the reference shape of the volume distribution of the planning CT. Whereas the Comim CT was not sufficient in any way that was important. A synthetic CT was able to be created in um, a maximum of 35 seconds and showed mean errors of 5.4 Hounsfield units. This leads us to the study design um, of adaptive replatting. So after having generated this STT model in Monaco and evaluated it successfully for different body sites, we wanted to further elaborate on that knowledge and analyze the dosimetric benefits of adaptive radiotherapy over the conventional image guided approach. We did this with investigating 32 more patients, each having five daily comb beam CT or SCT respectively. And we performed four different adaptive free planning approaches on the synthetic CT. And that were the um, image guided approach, the IGRT. And the second approach was a segment aperture morphing, a sum with a weights modification. And this basically makes use of information and plan parameters from a reference plan, being, for example, a monitor units, beam angles, or fluence. And then, as a basis on that, it uh, adapts the daily MLC positions to match the deformed target shape. This can be further refined by the application of a shapes modification. So um, actually, this um, fits better to the daily deformed target shape. And last but not least, we performed a full re-optimization denoted as DR3 approach. All was done within the framework of the PACE trial, which aims to cover 95% of the CTE with um, 5 times 8 gray. Here are the results for the mean dose volume histograms, and everything is based on a treatment plan collective of 160 treatment plans. The IGRT approach, as more or less expected, performed worst for all of the four shown organs and also um, really yielded the highest standard deviations. And especially that was critical in the region where the two organs of bladder and rectum overlapped with the planning target volume. And that was um, close to the coverage of 36 and 40 gray. Already by applying a SAM weight modification, um, a significant improvement was achieved, especially in the region of the target. Um, volumes here, but also for the two organs of bladder and rectum. 
Additionally, the shapes modification of R2 could achieve a better um, sparing of high dose here above 40 gray. And the R3 approach performed best, in particular in the uh, critical dose high region of the bladder and rectum, but also by avoiding very large doses um, above 45 gray. Moreover, we investigated dosimetric criteria, specific ones that were given by the PACE-C treatment planning guidelines. And here are the results in respect of box plots. The different um, backgrounds represent the um, optimal, the mandatory, and the suboptimal results and constraints given by the treatment planning guidelines. These are the results for the planning target volume, and we can identify that the ITRT approach performed worst and showed the largest spread, whereas all the three ART approaches performed very well and were able to restore the initial coverage, with some of them even showing um, a mean value above 95% coverage. The rectum gives more or less the same impression and here the IGRT approach even performed worse, having a um, mean value above the threshold of two cubic centimeters. And in contrast to this, once more, the R3 approach performed best, even having a mean value that was better than its reference with 1.04 cubic centimeters. On a side notice, I want to say something about the calculation time and the time for creating a new treatment plan. So by increasing the calculation grid from two to three millimeters, we were able to reduce actually the treatment time by a factor of almost three. So keep this in mind as time is of crucial essence for all adaptive workflows as you don't want to lose the dosimetric benefits you gained through all the time you spent on um, yeah, preparing your patient and uh, you taking for actual creating a treatment time or treatment plan. Okay, so the last thing we investigated was the penalty scoring system. And we did this to um, evaluate further benefits and actually to categorize them. This was handled by um, calculating a penalty score. And basically, we compared the results on the respective synthetic CT to the PACE-C criterion. And every time the criterion was violated, um, we counted. So basically, a plan that had zero counts was a plan with no violations. Here you can see the results for four different and the most relevant uh, those criteria and also an accumulated score at the uh, right-hand corner. Once again, we saw, saw that the um, IGRT approach was the one showing the um, worst results with the highest penalty scores available. And again, the R3 approach performed best, although um, that was not valid for the constraint of the PTV for 95% coverage. Also, the rectum showed um, the largest proportion of all penalty scores, and that result was not visible actually from the different analysis methods of the mean DVH and also of the box plots. Another advantage of this um, evaluation system is that we were able to categorize a percentage benefit of um, or in between the um, art approaches compared to the IGRT approach. And also, most interestingly, that was um, focused either on increasing the target coverage or increasing the sparing of the two organs at risk of bladder and rectum. To conclude, we saw that the cycle gun SCT model in Monaco was adjustable to an individual setup of a department and that image processing, segmentation, and plan adaptation were all available in one treatment planning system. Substantial benefits of warm start approaches were gained over the conventional IGRT approach, either through increasing the target coverage or sparing the organs at risk in a better way. The total time that um, we 
obtained from a three millimeter grid for treatment plan calculation was um, approximately 7.1 minutes. And so in the end, I hope that this all will function as a valuable guidance for Combeam CT based art at C on Linux. Thank you all for your attention. And I'm really looking forward to answering all of your questions. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, great talk. Um, yes, certainly we see the benefit of uh, adaptive, uh, adaptive uh, radiation therapy. Uh, just have a quick question. Do you guys perform a uh, patient specific QA during this your clinical workflow? Um, yeah, that's actually a very good question. And um, I guess that's one of the major drawbacks. So um, this was um, kind of a retrospective study I presented. And right now our research group is working on implementing a fast and also a robust QA. So mm -hmm. this is definitely a point that's missing right now. But um, for example, we are working with um, and analyzing log files. Mm -hmm. We have a secondary dose engine. I think that's a very uh, relevant concept that is going to be implemented very soon. And mm -hmm. um, so for example, in a different um, independent dose engine, we we can quickly identify if anything goes wrong with the plan. And also we want to implement a parameter check. So if everything is, let's say, sane and okay with the plan. So um, we assume that by only performing this adaptive um, aperture morphing, we actually stick a lot to the basic plan that was usually um, QA'd. And so we hope that um, not a lot has changed to being adapted to the actual uh, target shape of the day. So yeah, that's definitely missing, but we're working on it. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your answer. Okay, now uh, due to the time limit, you know, we'll move to the next speaker. I'll hand it over to Professor Hori. Thank you thank so you. much. Uh, the, this is a 10 minute speak and uh, please stick to your time. I'll invite uh, Dalia Ignatius from uh, Australia. Uh, she'll be speaking on effect of a applying CIMAR filter to CT scans uh, of patients and phantoms with metal implants or inserts on radiotherapy treatment planning accuracy. Uh, Dr. Dahlia, please. Hi everyone, I'm Dahlia Ignatius. I'm a Master of Medical Physics student at the University of Western Australia. And today I'll be giving you a brief presentation on my master's thesis on radiation oncology medical physics. This is not a complete presentation as I'm still in the process of analyzing the data measured. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that this project will be conducted on behalf of the University of Western Australia in collaboration with Sir Charles Gardner Hospital in Perth, Australia. I would also like to acknowledge my supervisors, Associate Professor Mashid Sabat, Mr. Zaid al Kadeb, Dr. Pejman Roshan Farzad, Dr. Munir Ibrahim, and Mr. Simon Goodall. So my research is on the investigation of the effects of applying a SEMAR filter to CT scans of patients with metal implants on the accuracy of radiotherapy treatment planning. Computer tomography scanning is important as it allows for the positioning and delineation of tumor and the identification of surrounding tissues and organs at risk. CT is a type of X-ray modality and imaging is dependent on the attenuation of X-rays as they pass through the tissue. So an issue we encounter is when imaging patients with metal implants made of high density and high atomic number materials as it results in bright and dark streak artifacts as shown in the image labeled A. These are due to photon starvation, beam hardening and scatter and motion of the metal resulting in incomplete projection data and subsequent reconstruction artifacts. And one way to tackle this is to use metal artifact reduction algorithms and one such algorithm is called SEMER by Canon Medical. SEMER or single energy metal artifact reduction uses iterative reconstruction technique to reduce metal artifacts. It works by detecting and segmenting corruption projection data corresponding to metallic implants. It then modifies the corrupted data by replacing them with estimates of the corrected values utilizing repetitive forward and back projections between the projection and image data spaces. And the schematic shown here explains the steps on how the algorithm works. 
So computer tomography is important because it is the CT numbers that are used to determine the electron densities, which are the most important quantity for CT-based treatment planning of RT. And any incorrect assignments of these electron density values results in errors in the dose calculation. And since dosimetric accuracy directly depends on the CT value, any improvement in value of the artifact is expected to improve the dose calculation accuracy. And so the aim of this research is to assess the improvement in treatment planning accuracy by comparing dose distribution for patients and fandoms with metal implants or inserts using CT scan images processed with and without the SEMR algorithm. And the significance of this research is that Canon Medical does not recommend the use of SEMR corrected images for radiation therapy treatment planning. Hence, it is currently used as a reviewing tool when conjuring both targets and critical structures. And in treatment planning, the artifacts are forced to have a density of soft tissue, which may not be accurate. Also, when dealing with large metallic implants, such as bilateral hip implants, and where the PTV is too close to the metal, then this current method is quite rough. And so, if SEMR is deemed fit for use in RT treatment planning, SEMR process CT images can be used in dose calculation, which will save time and the associated cost, as well as increase the confidence in organ and tumor delineation, and also in the plant dose. So there are numerous studies in the diagnostic field on the efficiency of SEMR algorithm in reducing metal artifacts on CT images, and hence the contour extraction accuracy. But there is only one study published on external beam radiotherapy. And the novelty of this research is that it investigates the effects of SEMR using two in-house 3D printed phantoms replicating spine and hip regions and a retrospective patient study using the data from two patients. Also, the Murasaki et al. paper only observed improvement for single field irradiation and BMAT for bilateral hip implants and none for the unilateral insert scenario. So this is a spine phantom originally constructed for the good old et al. paper. This phantom has 10 modules, including three PLA only body modules, six dual printed spine modules, and one dual ionization chamber holder. More information about the design and printing of this phantom is available in Goodall et al. paper published in 2021. And the second phantom constructed for this project is a hip phantom. Shown here are a few photos on how the phantom was constructed. And the figure shown here is a mean H2 values with and without SEMR processing for the spine phantom. The CT number accuracy was measured using multiple CD slices of the center region of the phantom. And the mean H2 values were determined using cylindrical regions of interest of a fixed diameter by averaging the data from five central slices. And the effect was evaluated using the paired Studenti test and the differences between the mean HU values of titanium insert with and without SEMR were statistically significant with a p-value of 0.04. The trimmer planning accuracy was verified by comparing the dose volume histograms for each scenario. Here, the DVH of titanium with SEMR is closer to the reference than without SEMR. And the dose calculation accuracy of the spine fandom was determined using film measurement. A two-dimensional gamma analysis was then performed using VMAT on SNC patient. And for the criteria of 3% 2 mil, the pass rate using SEMR was 84.9% compared to 75.9% for without SEMR. And similar results for the CT number accuracy were also obtained for the hip fandom, where the differences between the main H2 values of titanium insert with and without SEMR were statistically significant with a p-value of 0.4. Here is the treatment planning system. Thank you.
And the treatment planning accuracy was verified by comparing the dose volume histograms for each scenario. Here, the DVHs for the PTV and the OARs are similar and overlapping for titanium with and without the SEMR filter. And the PTV in the prostate was also studied using the hip phantom. And this is relevant for prostate patients who have metal hip implants. And the dose profile across the PTV shows that several corrected CT images can be used for treatment planning as there is no significant difference between several corrected and uncorrected images. And to verify the dose distribution, the dose measurements were performed using a CCO4 iron chamber. And the results once again show that SEMR processing results in values closer to the reference. And moving on to the retrospective patient study, shown here is a DVH calculated for a female patient with unilateral hip implant with PTV in the bladder. Again, the DVHs for SEMR processed and unprocessed CT images show similar results. Likewise, for this male patient with bilateral hip implants with PTV in the prostate. And so to conclude, the CT number accuracy indicates that metal artifacts greatly affect the HU values and can be reduced by using the SEMR filter. And treatment planning accuracy was verified using dose volume histograms, which does not show a significant difference between the SEMR processed and unprocessed CT images. And dose calculation accuracy was verified using film and ion chain measurements and proved that SEMR processing produces values closer to the reference. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dahlia. And uh, I think SEMR processing uh, needs to go through a long time more clinical experience because uh, PTV is close to the bones or implants or processes. Uh, needs to be much more corrective and uh, for future clinical work. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Park, please uh, introduce the second, uh, second, uh, next speaker. Hey, thank you. So next speaker is Dr. C.M. Ibrahim Nasser from Bangladesh. Uh, the title of uh, his talk is the evalu Evaluation of intra Interfraction and Interfractional Setup Variation of different anatomic sites using onboard imager uh, impact on planning target volume margins. Thank you. Chris? Ibrahim? We cannot hear you well. Can you speak up, please? Hello? Yeah, we cannot hear you. We cannot hear you, Ibrahim. Increase your micro microphone volume. Sir, uh, this is a recorded video, pre-recorded video. And okay. Sound is low there. Okay. Can you increase the volume, please? Uh, sorry, we cannot hear. Uh, Mr. Akash from technical team, can you increase the volume of this video? Or uh, Mr. Nasir is also in live. No, it's not audible. It's not audible. That may hamper the delivery of a plan. Those are patient setup variation, organ motion, deformation, and mesh related errors. Consequently, the actual receptors distribution differs from the planned reabsorbed dose distribution. The two scenarios of relevance are in are an insufficient dose uh, coverage of the targeted tumor volume and an overdose of normal tissue. Patient setup errors are due to variations in the daily positioning of the patient on the treatment couch. From session to session, variation is unavoidable, even though several measures are taken to ensure the high reproducibility. Day to day tumor motion within the patient can occur due to, um, for example, variations in rectum and bladder filling. Uh, cardiac action and respiration can result in intrafraction tumor movement. 
with modern reusable equipment, uh, machine related geometrical errors, for example, in multiple size, these sizes and uh, gantry angles are generally considered small compared to set up variations and all the motion. The objective of my study was to analyze the intersectional and intersectional perceptions of energy of the different anatomic sites with pre-treatment and post-treatment heavy heavy total images and to provide a margin guideline for these anatomic sites. A total of 95 patients were uh, considered in my study uh, starting from January 2019 to June 2021. Now all the patients were set up in superimposition. The removal system I use the QFIX for head neck and brain. I use the type headrest and with some kind of plastic mask and swing board with foot or knee rest and backlog was used in case of thorax, abdomen, and pelvic patients. Patients are positioned according to skin tattoos marked during the CT simulation. Uh, the cave images were uh, taken uh, in AP and lateral direction and fused with the planning cave stick uh, focus on both soft tissues and bone structures and 3D. Translational corrections are calculated using the linear software. Uh, in many of cases, we do it manually. Patients are from reposition to the seat coordinates and treated. In case of intersectional set of variation, a total of 2,496 reported daily shift data was collected from 95 patients. And in case of intersectional displacements, a total of 20 random selected patients was taken. And 200 post treatment KBKB setup diagnosis are performed immediately after treatment. The systematic and random errors were analyzed as per the Royal College of Regional Radiologists. And the mean individual mean was uh, calculated from the images, then population mean was calculated. Systematic error. Uh, was determined from the standard deviation of the mean of the displacement. <clears throat> then individual random errors were calculated. And finally, the population random error was determined from the root mean square of the standard deviation from all patients' data. The CTPT to PT margins uh, were, were calculated through the error formula. In the results we see in the table one mean and standard deviations of intersectional setup deviations from five 95 patients. Here we can see that the extra canal group shows a larger setup error than the intra canal group. That is, the setup uncertainties for head, neck, and brain tumors showed a smaller variations compared with tumors in the extra canal sites in this study. The extracranial group showed a larger setup error uh, and organ displacement than the intracranial group. The largest mean setup error was found in lung patients in the longitudinal directions, which may be because of respiratory movement. Uh, in this table, too, we can see that the maximum displacement was uh, occurred in case of thorax in a side in superior inferior direction. And regarding the mean 3D displacement, um, the highest possible displacement was happened in case of thorax also. Uh, figure one uh, shows the intersectional setup uncertainties uh, for each patient. Uh, in, uh, in case of superior inferior direction, you can see that in the lung, lung district, the uncertainty is four because this may be because of respiratory movement. And in case of right and lateral direction, uh, you can see the abdomen and prostate shows the highest and uncertainty. This may be because of the peristaltic uh, movement in esophagus and 
the bladder and rectal rectum feelings changes also. In case of vertical uh, erection, uh, the answer key is a bit less and all are almost same in case of lung, abdomen and prostate. Figure 2 shows the comparison of inter and intrafractional uh, shift. Uh, the inter intrafractional patient and organ movements are generally smaller than the interfractional setup error. However, except for lung in the longitudinal direction, the differences are not statistically significant. Uh, table 3 shows the significance of site dependent interfractional setup uncertainties. And uh, in the p value, you can see uh, in case of brain and head neck, there is no uncertainty uh, sig uh, significance and uh, significance of the values. And in case of abdomen and prostate, same things happen. Other than these two, uh, brain, head neck, lung, and abdomen, uh, the uncertainties are there. Uh, in case of uh, in table 4, we can see the uh, systematic error and random error values. So here we can see the random error was larger than the systematic error in all directions. This may be the uh, use of um, involution devices and also the patient compliance. And here we can see the CTB to PTB margins uh, derived from the vendor formula. Uh, it shows that uh, I mean uh, I have I got the results is that like that. Uh, in case of lateral direction, it is 4.4 to 9.7 millimeter, and in functional direction, it is 5.3 to 11.8 millimeter, and in vertical direction, this is 2.8 to 6.6 millimeter. Many authors have recommended mathematical formula for. Uh, Generating CTP to PTP margins. Uh, I said 62 recommends a margin which is calculated by a quadratic combination of both random and systematic uncertainties. However, studies show that the arithmetic consequences of systematic and random geometrical uncertainties are fundamentally different. And Strom and other in their study have suggested that system. Systematic geometric misses will cause underdosing of the same part of the CTB for AB fraction of the treatment, whereas the random deviation will cause underdose in different part of the CTB for AB fraction. Strong calculated the CTB to PTB margin recipe uh, to ensure that on average 99% of the CTB receives on the average at least 95% of the prescribed dose. A similar study by Van Hart uh, and others calculated the margin recipe uh, to ensure a, max, a minimum dose of 95% to 90% of the patients. Margin should be determined by multiple factors, including treatment of roles, tumor stages, tumor or normal tissue locations, immobilization techniques, and obviously confidence level. The margin formulas may then be used only for confirmation. In the margin recipes proposed, setup error and organ motion uncertainties were the only parameters included in the equation. Uh, it is assumed that uh, the tumor control is outlined accurately. That is, there is no CTB delineation uncertainty. In reality, CTB delineation uncertainties exist and uh, should be included in the CTB for a more accurate margin to a better tumor control. Our proposed CTB to PTB margin margins uh, were obtained from interfractional setup variations using innovation techniques reported in this study. The overall CTB to PTB margin, including tumor delineation, setup uncertainties, and the internal organ displacement should be fully investigated before determining determine PTB margin. Uh, in our study, there is uh, it, uh, it has got some limitations also. Firstly, the analysis was limited to KB portal images, although the KB portal images uses, uh, images can be correlated well with that of CT, CVCT, the treatment set of verification. Secondly, the patient weight loss during the course of validation increases the probability of errors. Uh, the, this correlation was not analyzed 
in the study. Uh, if I conclude, uh, the setup variations in all directions are randomly distributed. Organ displacement uh, should be taken into consideration in, in the PTP, especially for the lung phase. And the use of pretreatment typical PR image reduced the systematic setup error, which we have shown in the table, and showed the tumor response during the radiation course. Pretreatment typical PR image of onboard images can be used to improve the accuracy of patient position. So this is the end of my today's presentation. Thank you all for your patience here. Okay, thank you so much uh, for your nice talk. And uh, yeah, it's been always challenging uh, to account accurately, uh, account for um, for inter inter interfraction, intrafractional uh, setup variation. Okay, so he has investigated various uh, sites of uh, uh, the, the variations. Um, so due to the time limit, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties, uh, not to hear very well. So, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let's move to the ne next speaker. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'll invite uh, Kenji Nakamura from Japan. This is another 10 minutes talk, but I request the speaker to limit the talk to uh, eight minutes. Uh, the uh, in the subject is the interactively improved method with KBP to standardize VMAT plan quality in prostate cancer. Kenji, are you there? Chair Person, I'm Kenji Nakamura, PhD student of Kindan University. I'm happy to have the opportunity to share our recent findings with you today. I'm going to talk about a unique approach to standardize VMAT plan quality using knowledge based planning. Let me give you the background of our study. Rapid plan is one of the commercial knowledge based planning solutions. The key point here is the KDP model performance depends on the training plans. In other words, updating the KBP model requires the registration of beta plans to the model library. So this study aimed to propose an updating method of KBP models to standardize the VMAT plan quality for prostate cancer. Let's move on to material and method. This slide shows use treatment planning system, optimization system, and statistical analysis software. This flowchart shows how we updated the KPP model over three periods. First, we established one original model and then by updating twice created two individual models second model and third model each kpp was generated with a single optimization for the same 30 validation plans not included in main model libraries so what are the difference between each training plan? It is whether the planner who received feedback from KBP made a training plan to exceed those metric goals and to pass more strict those constraints. Here is a table showing those constraints in detail. All plans were optimized to achieve the dose constraints and or those metric goals by physicians and medical physicists, and then included in each model library as a training plan. We evaluated those volume parameters in each KBP. 
Since the subject prostate cancer, we focus on PTV minus rectum, rectal wall, and rata wall. Moreover, by analyzing regression scatter plots, the variability of the included plan in each model evaluated using mean square error and Cook's distance. Both of them indicate that a small value means a good model. Now, let's move on to results. Those following parameters of all OERs in KBP2 were significantly superior to those in KBP1, except homogeneity index. On the other hand, there was significant difference in only the V70 grain of the rectal wall between KBP2 and KBP3. Next, this slide shows regression scatter plots and MSE. From the left side, first, second, and third model, the above is rectal wall, the below is all brata wall. As you can see, compared with the second model, the regression scatter plots of the third model converged. And the MSC was also a small value. And then the result of the Cook's distance. The low Cook's distance indicates that the uncertainty of those prediction was reduced. In the rectal wall, the proportion of Cook's distance of 1.0 or less gradually increased with the model update. And the third model was the highest. The those volume parameters of KBP2 and KBP3 generated by the planner with clear goals was significantly superior to KBP1. What this data means is refinement by KBP's feedback. KBP1 without strict those constraints was superior only in the homogeneity index due to trade-offs between the target and OLs. There was no significant difference between KBP3 and KBP2, so the sparring of OLs by the model update might have an upper bound for improvement. The KBP3 had many registered plans with a low Cook's distance and a lower or comparable MSC for the regression model compared with KBP1 and KBP2. Well, the reason is that overfitting was avoided with open loop validation. In addition, what we found was the KBP3 model could make better estimation of the GVH in the model due to more strict dose constraints. In conclusion, the updated KBP models with the clear goals at each step could generate not only superior those volume parameters, but also converged regression scatter plots in the model. These results suggest our unique updating approach can standardize the inverse planning strategies. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, I, I think due to the time uh, 
restrictions. So we'll move to the final speaker. Uh, the, the last speaker is uh, Michaela Dello from uh, Australia. Uh, he'll be talking about lifetime attributable risk of radiation induced second cancer from scattering and scanning proton therapy for pediatric uh, cranial cancer, age and sex impact on uh, out of field organs. Please go ahead. Hello, and thank you for that introduction. Tumors of the central nervous system comprise of up to 20% of all cancers amongst children. Proton therapy, or PT for short, is considered the optimal radiotherapy for treatment of pediatric cranial malignancies based on the superior physical properties compared to X-ray radiotherapy. Here is a dosimetric example of the difference between the treatment modalities. Comparing the two, you can see the excess of radiation a pediatric CNS patient receives from X-ray therapy. This is demonstrated in a green color wash on the far right. PT visibly reduces irradiation of the healthy tissue, which is desirable as this reduces the risk of developing long-term side effects such as second primary cancer or SBC for short. As the radiation which is used to treat cancer can also cause cancer, reducing such irradiation of healthy tissues as seen displayed in the orange on the screen also re reduces the risk of SBC occurring. Considering children have an increased life expectancy compared to adults, their lifetime attributable risk, or LAR, of developing SPC accumulates much higher compared to adults, as a result, making them more susceptible. So you may be asking, if PT is more targeted, then why are we concerned about cancer in out of organs? Well, it all comes down to the mode of delivery and whether it's passive scattering or scanning being PT. There are components in the scanning PT nozzle, such as dose monitors and range shifters, can produce neutrons. However, this is considerably lower amount compared to passive scattering PT, which uses foils, a compensator, and collimation aperture to broaden the Bragg peak. While the doses from neutrons are generally low, these neutrons have a higher radiation weighting factor, subsequently increasing the probability of SBC effects. For example, causing more biological damage for the same amount of radiation dose. There is currently variation between these measured neutron equivalent doses reported, leaving a gap in our knowledge. Furthermore, despite the high number of pediatric patients treated with radiotherapy, risk factors to SBC are still not fully understood due to the length of long-term follow-up required and lack of clinical studies with large sample sizes. Whilst clinical evidence accumulates for the benefits of PT for childhood cancer survivors, gaps remain on how to identify the population best suited for PT. Current treatment planning systems are unable to estimate the contribution of secondary neutrons to the total dose delivered to a patient. As such, radiation biology models such as Schneider et al. are commonly used methods of determining LAR of SPC using existing second party, second, secondary particle knowledge from long-term collected data sources. <laughs> Several studies have used the model so far to investigate LAR for adult cohorts. However, few studies assess LAR comprehensively for outer-field organs for pediatric patients and those that do generally use phantoms. Therefore, further studies are required to investigate measured neutron equivalent doses and assess the influence of these on SPC estimates. The aim of this study was to estimate the risk of radiation-induced SPC as a function of age and sex for outer-field organs following scattering and scanning PT in pediatric brain tumors. Here is a schematic representation of the workflow. In blue, you can see that I robustly optimized proton therapy treatment plans in Eclipse for target volumes using age-specific pediatric CT scans of five, nine, and 13 years of age. Data was then collected as per the green workflow in order to perform the SPC modeling. And finally, in purple, all this data was calculated. So I'm now gonna break that down. Firstly, neutron equivalent dose was sourced from literature for both passive and scattering, uh, passive scattering and scanning PT. 
The measured doses, not including Monte Carlo calculations, were recreated as a spectrum. So here, each color represents a different publication's collected measurement. The square symbols represent scattering PT and the triangles represent scanning beam. Dose visibly reduces as a function of distance from the target volume. And there is a large variation as you can see. The pink and orange data points represent the worst case of scattering PT, which is a lot higher than the scanning. Then 13 organ specific distances were measured from the inferior edge of the field. In, and you can see here the CTV target volume in green. For long organs, such as the small intestine, the proximal, mid and distal distance were all measured. And as expected, organs such as the breast for a five-year-old would be, for example, five centimetres closer to the treatment area than if we were to measure that distance for a 13-year-old. MATLAB was then used to calculate the LAR of SPC per organ distance for outer field organs. These values were then adjusted for total dose delivered using Schneider et al's SBC model. So I'll briefly explain the equations here. The risk equivalent dose or RED was calculated for each organ section, given the distribution of the radiation and the volume. The excess absolute risk or EAR of the SBC, SBC for the organ for a given age attained and age of at exposure was calculated by summing the EAR of each organ section determined from the RED and weighted using the relative volume of the section compared to the whole organ. We use published values collected from the Japanese atomic bomb survivors. The LAR of the S of SBC for the organ was then calculated by integrating the EAR of the organ for all potential obtained ages from after the latent exposure period following exposure to the maximum age of life expectancy and the statistics were drawn from the ABS. LAR was then tabulated and analysed through graph pad prism for 13 organs for six patients, eight neutron data points, giving me close to 624 calculations. As mentioned earlier, no one has systematically looked at the influence of age, sex and treatment technique on the risk of SBC. This was also varied by that neutron equivalent dose as previously shown. Now I'm going to go through some of the results. So the following graphs are represented by individual organs. So for example, here I have a breast graph. On the y-axis is LAR per 10,000 person years. This is the unit of risk used for individual developing SBC. Hello, I want to say a high I'm LAR here. translates to high risk of SBC. On the x-axis is the age group from. and okay, okay. the patient. Okay, okay. The modality of is also represented by the symbol as per the key. The data point color represents the uh, corresponds to the collected neutron equivalent data. And a mean value was also added um, using either a solid line for scattered PT or a dash line for scanning. Overall, we found that scanning PT demonstrated smaller LAR resulting in lower risk of SBC compared to scattering. This is more prominent in uh, the more radiosensitive organs. These include lung, breast, and thyroid. As you can see, there was more variation among the scattered neutron equivalent doses in the pink and the orange, and the larger average uh, compared to scanning PT. In general, LAR was the highest for five-year-old females, and for example, breast LAR was 1,000 times higher than for 13-year-old. This may be because of the age and the anatomical proximity of the structure to the beam edge. There were outliers, however, for distal organs such as the stomach and lungs, where LAR remained similar across both of the age groups. Not all organs also demonstrated an improvement in LAR using scanning PT. Here I've highlighted um, on small intestine on the left and reproductive organs on the right hand side, where it actually shows that a higher average LAR for scanning PT in the dash line for the five year old um, children. Liver and bladder similarly demonstrated consistent overall LAR despite the ages. 
Overall, it was clear LAR estimates were highly dependent on the neutral and equivalent dose distributions input, demonstrating uncertainty from the published data measurements. To our knowledge, this is the first modeling study to systematically incorporate measurements of neutron dose equivalents in modeling of LAR of SPC for pediatric patients. Based on our age and sex specific SPC modeling, scanning PT reduced LAR of SPC considerably compared to scattering. This is particularly noticeable in lung, breast, and thyroid. In general, LAR of SPC demonstrated higher risk for younger female cranial paediatric patients than males, especially for scattering PT. Most organs showed a higher LAR for younger patients. However, lung and stomach were the exceptions, warranting further investigation. And the results of this study could potentially aid clinicians reducing the detrimental side effects experienced by paediatric cancer patients. We would like to acknowledge the help of St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, and in particular, the contribution of Dr. Thomas Merchant and Dr. Wa. These are my references. Thank you so much for your attention and feel free to follow up by email. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we'll uh, close the session here. Uh, we are running a bit late, so uh, no questions, timing. And uh, on behalf of me and my co-chair, I thank the organizers a second. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the 21st Asia Oceania Congress of Medical Physics. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21st Asia Oceania Congress of Medical Physics. This is the parallel mini symposium, and uh, today we are featuring. Dr. Golam Abu Zakaria and Aaron Shogule. Professor Dr. Uh, Golam Abu Zakaria is the founder and chairman of South Asia Center for Medical Physics and Cancer, Cancer Research. In, from 1987 to, uh, <clears throat> in 2001, he was the founder and patron professor and coordinator for international cooperation of the Department of Medical Physics and Biomedical Engineering at Gonobishwa Bidda Bidyale University at Shabar, Dhaka. And then he was the chairman of the DGMP task group, Medical Physics in Developing Countries of the German Society for Medical Physics in Germany. In 2003, he was the professor clinical engineering on health university he was the professor of clinical engineering on on health university of applied sciences Gwenten, germany and in 2009 honorary member of the bangladesh cancer society taka the oncology club and saarc federation of oncologists honored with a highly prestigious award outstanding person of the decade from 2000 to 2010 for his unique contribution to establish medical physics in Bangladesh. In 2010, he was the honorary advisor at the National Institute of Cancer Research and Hospital, NICRH, in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Fast forward to 2018, he was nominated as the chair chairman accreditation committee to the International Medical Physics Certification Board IMPCB and vice chair of the International Organization Medical Physics 
IOMP Accreditation Board. Then in 2019, he was awardee of the Global Radiation Oncology Distinguished Leader Award by Global Health Catalyst of the Harvard Medical School. And then he was the board of directors Global on and Global Oncology University under Harvard Medical School, Boston, USA. <clears throat> and then we have Dr. Arun Chogule, president of AFOMP. Dr. Arun Chogule is the senior professor and head of Department of Radiological Physics, SMS Medical College and Hospitals in Jaipur, ex-pro vice chancellor of Rajasthan, University of Health Science and Dean Faculty of Paramedical Science in Jaipur, India. He has served as an expert to IAEA and has been regular associate to ICTP for eight years. He has done a significant work for radiation safety training programs of VLIR, Belgium, for many years as a key resource person. He has been awarded with numerous fellowship and awards mainly IOMP, ITMP 2016 for contribution of medical physics, AFOMP member excellent presentation awards, outstanding faculty award 2019, SMS Medical College, Government of Rajasthan. Dr. Farooq Abdullah Sher A Kashmir Best Award for 2011 to 12. Recently, he has been awarded as AFOMP Outstanding Medical Physicist 2020 for his contribution to medical physics education, research, and professional development. His contribution to health sciences and award and awarded prestigious fellow National uh, Academy of Medical Sciences FAMS in 2021. He is associated with over 27 national and international scientific organization, associate editor of four international journals and editorial board of member of many journals. These are our chair and co-chairs. Uh, I hand the authority to conduct this session to them. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, good up, good afternoon, uh, everybody. We have now a very interesting mini symposium, education and training. Uh, we both, uh, Professor Chogle and myself, are chairs of this interesting uh, mini symposium. Many uh, good experts around the world. Uh, speaks in this mini symposium. I am talking direct from the venue here in Dhaka. This is uh, a virtual, uh, this is a hybrid conference. So somebody of you are staying in Europe, other in India on other countries. I miss you all in, in Dhaka. Maybe next time we can arrange a presence uh, uh, conference in Dhaka or somewhere else. Thank you once again. And I asked Professor Chogle to preside first. Professor yeah. Chogle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good afternoon to all. And this uh, special symposium is uh, regarding medical physics education. Uh, organizers have put up my camera, so I, I am not able to be visible. But anyway, uh, you can listen to uh, me. I think now, okay. okay. Uh, so this session, our first speaker is uh, Professor Franco Milano. He has uh, almost four decades of experience of uh, uh, medical physics training, education. He is very active in ICTP training program. And also the APOM has formed the task group and he is chairing that task group. Without wasting more time to introduce him, I hand over the floor to Professor Franco Milano uh, to deliver his talk and enlighten us about the medical physics education aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Could you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Nice. So uh, I don't know if I can share the presentation. Let me see. Sorry. Uh, bo, bo, bo. 
Would you see my 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 presentation on the screen? No. Still no. not. No, not it, not it. Uh, po, 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 po. How I can share? Let me see. Yeah. Okay. Condividi. Schermo. This one. Now is okay? Yeah, now it's coming at least. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay, yes. so I, I, I will try to keep the time. So okay. um, I describe why we are going to have uh, for your wonderful association uh, a new syllabus. Um, the, the, the beginning start when uh, um, we have uh, a new education and training committee in IOMP and many members of this uh, committee are also members of the, um, of the FOMP organization. Within the committee, we had the discussion and uh, we realized that which could be the task to be faced in the four years of uh, mandate of the, of the committee. The four years has become five years because of our COVID problems, but we saw that among many, many initiatives, uh, we identify a high priority, updating an excellent uh, uh, training course uh, um, um, indication given by the agency. Why we saw this priority to up to date this excellent, uh, excellent document? Because this document has been published in 2013 and uh, probably reflected the, the situation of uh, education and of uh, the equipment uh, a couple of years before. Uh, we found as IOMP committee some, we can say, viscosity. And uh, we realized that it will take a lot of time to develop uh, uh, together with uh, the agency and other international body a new syllabi. At this point, we most, uh, probably 50% of the member of IOMP committee are also within AFOMP. And it came natural to think to be able and faster to create an up-to-date syllabus within AFOMP. Of course, the situation in, uh, in the organization which are within AFOMP is quite uh, different because you can have a very advanced uh, uh, education system in some country. And together with this, you have a very, well, anyway, some country needs to up to date really and to have a, a strong contact and initiative to try to increase the competence within this country. And uh, also attending this, uh, this, uh, this Congress, uh, we see that the impact of uh, data science is uh, tremendous, is tremendous. This, uh, what I copy here, is uh, some comment by some author which were thinking the impact of data science in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the medical physicist uh, activity. And uh, probably we had to reflect this one, that the physical law we are using in our profession and activity are almost the same. We are using almost uh, uh, classic physics, fundamental physics. But what is coming in the, in the new scenario? Mechanical accuracy and precision of equipment, statistic, a different kind of statistic we are, um, we are accustomed to deal with, and uh, software. Probably we are in this point of the, uh, um, the, the age 
of these uh, um, technical emerging for 10 years. Now we are in this place. So what I'm thinking that in the very close future, we will have uh, a tremendous increase of the impact of this, uh, of this, uh, of this activity. And this activity is uh, only mentioned in the uh, uh, IAEA uh, documents, data science. And uh, if we consider which are the aspects of data science, you see that there are something more um, structure than artificial intelligence, deep learning, and so on. Here you see how we have uh, a complex science. And which is the problem? The problem is this one, that if you are dealing with training today, the medical physicist must acquire the right skill for the future, because uh, otherwise, in very few generation of scientists, uh, Medical physicists will be, I use the place replace, the word replaced by computer scientists, but the impact of data science is so high that we must introduce, this is the new, in the syllabus, uh, uh, a modern approach to training. If you see the, this is a very old uh, diagram. And uh, you see that data science cover a lot of, of, of uh, other uh, approach. But if you see domain expertise, which is uh, what we can bring as medical physicists to this process, uh, they overlap all these other specific topics. And please consider that in the, uh, in the uh, radiation protection and safety in medical use of Ionaris radiation issued recently by the agency, we have mentioned, not specifically, that specific training on equipment and software must be given to all the professionals which are working in the use of ionizing radiation in medicine. So we have this need. Uh, a syllabus cannot be something original because uh, it must take it must take into account the existing and consolidated skill, and uh, possibly we had to try with the syllabus and anticipate the novelty of methods, equipment, and application. So. Uh, probably this is an example. Uh, we can measure time, but in the past, we were measuring time with this kind of uh, device. And now we are measuring time using a, a, a atomic clock. So we had to do the same with our competence. We must keep the old competence similar to this one with the new one. Of course, the syllabus core, which uh, uh, is uh, very, very traditional. And here you see anatomy, physiology, statistic, but probably we must introduce a deeper, a deeper um, topics uh, in mathematics, uh, but, um, and computational skill and probably advanced computational competence. So here is the syllabus core that has been approved by the special committee, who, which is working uh, to, the, to the syllabus of the AFUMP. Uh, we, uh, of course, uh, there are many, many levels to make training of the medical physicist, uh, but probably the core uh, training is uh, the master. And here you see the structure, anything particular new of the, of the master. 
where we can have, of course, uh, also in this topic, computing and medical informatics. Um, so this is very important. Uh, which could be the characteristic of the syllabus? As detailed as reasonably possible, this was, there was a discussion within the, the FON committee, and we decided to have a very detailed uh, um, syllabus. Within the syllabus, we had to indicate the fundamental topic whose knowledge is uh, useful for the medical physicist. And at the same time, we had to indicate a priority for each topic of the syllabus. Why? Because the teacher, the local teacher, can select from the credit system the topic that he or she deems to deal with, because it not, um, is not um, possible to cover all the detail. Uh, topic within the syllabus. So the teacher has to select, select uh, and to draw his, uh, his uh, courses uh, selecting, selecting the, the topic. And then it's important also to establish a adequate admission criteria to master. And here I bring you some example. So, for example, dealing with uh, uh, the syllabus uh, related with radiobiology, this could be, this is almost uh, the final version. You see how many details there are. Perfect. If we go on another point, which is uh, the core topic of ionizing radiation physics and dosimetry, here you see that you have uh, a larger indication of the single topic which are entering in this core topic. And here we have another problem because you can describe the physics of uh, the uh, ionizing radiation interaction in a simple way, but also in some complicated way. So we must find the balance and this will be uh, again the duty of the local of, of the local of the local teacher and this is a matter of discussion of course if you are dealing with uh, interaction um, interaction uh, modality you can have a simple discussion but if you want to have a quantitative uh, description of the interaction you must go a little bit deeper in the in the in the formalism. Uh, here you see also the list of uh, of the um, another topic, uh, ionizing radiation detector, uh, general characteristic, and uh, different type of detector. Here I put also Faraday cap, which is in the reality not a photon detector. But for example, a Faraday cap uh, is uh, useful in the dosimetry of a proton beam. Why we have not to mention in the syllabus also this specific uh, advanced topic? Of course, it's not realistic that in some country uh, for many years uh, we will have uh, uh, proton therapy available. But again, in the syllabus, Ms we must take into account this one. So uh, as conclusion, I can say that, uh, this is an observation, that the National Advanced Medical Physicist Organization will have no particular advantage by adopting such a detailed syllabus. They can adopt the syllabus they have already developed, but the syllabus is a tool for the teacher and should be brought to the attention of the students. Why? Because it is impossible for a teacher to fully cover all the topics in the syllabus. But the information contained in the syllabus 
has to be brought to the students. Why? Because they can understand that the course, the training course they are following, cover also only some aspect of their skill and competence. And uh, this is very important. So the co text containing the syllabus must allow the students to understand what are the knowledge and skill to be acquired. Uh, those that must have already been acquired for to be able to face his her training course, but also the more advanced. And in my opinion, we must focus uh, essentially with these uh, uh, new tools, because these new tools will be, uh, can permit to make research with a relative low cost. Why? Because you need to have a computer, you need to have a software, but this very often, I mean, the software is uh, uh, available free of charge. And then you had to put only intelligence of the medical physicist to use uh, a modeling approach and to enter in the field of data science as a tool of uh, research and together a tool for their uh, professional every day for the, for the future. Thank you for the attention. And uh, I hope to have given more than um, indication uh, particular indication of the syllabus uh, give you the need and the strategy to reach uh, a good syllabus and uh, a good application of the syllabus. I am sure that uh, uh, Professor Chugule will explain which could be the action, not only in the syllabus, but of the association to have uh, an impact uh, in, uh, in training of, uh, in, of the medical physicists. Thank you again for the ascension and I'm very happy to work uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with you. Thanks. For uh, deliberating on what is planned and what is needed for the uh, medical physics syllabus in the present and uh, for the future medical physicist. Uh, uh, delegates, please, you can type your any questions or queries into the chat box. We will take at the end of the session all the questions. Now, in this series, the second talk will be delivered by Professor Jakaria, Gulam Abu Jakaria, who, with whom I have association of work three decades. Uh, he is working in Germany and his heart is in Dhaka. He is here in Bangladesh and he has given back to his country a lot. He, he has been recently awarded FIOMP and he is deputy chair of the APOM accreditation board. Without losing more time, I hand over the floor to Professor Jakaria for his talk. Professor Jakaria, floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chokle. I introduce uh, the participant or audience, a new initiative in South Asian region. Uh, we have actually presented uh, this um, center somewhere else, but now I give you once again with some new uh, new facts. This is a South Asia Center for Medical Physics and Cancer Research. I write a good example for regional cooperation. Regional cooperation actually is very important in this global world. Only through re regional cooperation, we can maintain, we can sustain in future. So you are, most of you are medical physicists, so you know this uh, diagram. It is from WHO 2004, more or less. Uh, this is the same situation till now. You see 
uh, the number of cancer deaths in the developed country more or less constant. But in the developing country, it is rising extremely. So it is our challenge in future. Excuse me, Professor Zagaria. Yeah. Excuse me. You, yeah. you have to move your slide. But we are seeing the first slide again. Yeah, sir, put it in the could presentation mode, yeah. sir. Yeah, in presentation the slide mode. First slide. Uh, presentation yeah. Could you please mode, move the next, next slide? Yeah. Ah, why? Please put into the presentation mode and then you can move. Presentation mode. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's uh, thank you. <laughs> yes, you see the number of uh, cancer not, date. You see it not yet in presentation mode, sir. It's we can still see your slides in. Hey. Uh, There's no functioning. Shemanto cannot change. Shimanto in full slide mode. Full slide mode. Full slide mode. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just press that. No? Is it changing now? N not yet. No. Or go to file and put it in slide mode. Put it slide mode. You can do the same thing by go clicking the slide so. Slide so. Just clicking the up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. From from beginning. Now it's okay. One second. No, it's no. loading. It's loading. No chance. No change. No change. But you can so still you can move yeah, uh, yeah. by clicking a down button. You can continue by clicking the down button. No problem. I think you can move on the slides and go ahead because of the shortage of time. I think you can continue with the same thing. Just you can move on the slides one by one. If it's not being come in the presentation mode. Yeah, but there's no change. Yeah, Yeah, it's fine now. It's fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry for the disturbance. I think now it's okay. Can you hear me? We Hello. can hear and the, it's a slight more. Please continue. <clears throat> so, yes, uh, once again, the number of uh, cancer deaths in developing developed country more or less is the same, but the number is actually 
uh, increasing dramatically in developing countries. So uh, the future challenge uh, to fight against cancer in the developing country is more prominent. I just start uh, some slides first about the physics in South Asia. You see, here is the South Asia eight countries. And I have given here a uh, diagram, some photos from Jaipur. I visited Professor Chokle in a long time ago, and I made these uh, slides. And you see here in, in the Indian culture, it is started with astronomy and then astro astrology and then astronomy. All the, uh, all the science development is also uh, is given in this part of the world. Here you see some many, many scientists also born in this region, but I just give uh, some example. These people you know everywhere of the world. You, you know the Jagadish Chandra Bosch, Shotten Bosch, and Raman and Abdus Salam. So there is a basis of physics in this South Asia, and then why not the development of medical physics in South Asia? Here is actually why cancer research in South Asia. You see, South Asia is a very small, uh, small area in the world map, but still here live 25% of the world population. That means one fourth of the world population is living in South Asia. And you see here the cancer, maybe five or six, uh, six types of cancer is uh, is uh, you can find in the South Asia region, so it is one of the one of the reason why we can work together and fight against cancer because we have the same types of cancer and we have the same types of instrument uh, instrument to fight against uh, cancer in this region. Here is uh, uh, you know this uh, this is a um, uh, table where you can find all the countries. Here, the number of megavolt units available now and what we need in 2030. For example, Afghanistan, there is no megavolt machine, but in 2030, we need 36. Yeah, in the number of oncologists, 72, and medical physics, uh, 45. Even in India, where medical physics or radiotherapy is developed very good, we need also, here is number of uh, megavolt 518. We need uh, more than 1,726. So it's a huge challenge for us to develop radiotherapy in this region. Uh, that is why we have this initiative, SCMPCR, you see. Uh, our motto is quality education and health science for passion benefit. And this is a holistic approach and we have started to do the cancer awareness and screening, self-help group, hands-on workshop, e-service training and e-learning program. I will show some slides in my following uh, slides. You can find uh, we have started uh, such types of activity. Here uh, in SMPR is actually is aimed not only medical physicists, but also oncologists, radiation oncologists, uh, technician, nurses, and other provider. And here I have given you uh, the different uh, oncologists, medical physicists, uh, radiologists, and nurses, uh, their care. So we have started in 2018, the SCMPCR, and first, uh, the SMPR, uh, actually, the, the uh, training program is actually the main program of training that means we train the manpower i'm just uh, giving the medical physicists radio oncologist and uh, technician you see the concept is so that we have one week one week uh, this uh, this workshop three days is theoretical courses uh, with external with uh, expert from south asia and abroad and then Two days, that means the last two days is a practical work in the hospital. And here we asked the vendor, they come their experts and train the people in the hospital in hands-on training. 
So this is our actually motivation for this uh, SMPR work. Here the second uh, SMPR training, which you see here, the expert from the industry as well as from the university and thema like dosimetry and treatment planning. And here you see uh, physicists from uh, all countries of South Asia is present there. The motivation is that when a seminar is in Bangladesh, then 50% participant from Bangladesh and less 50% from other South Asia. When it's India, then 50% from Indian and other 50% from rest country. And you see here, we have also organized uh, for the radiation oncologist. And this is a workshop for radiation oncologist target volume definition, treatment planning and evolution. Here, we have an expert from Bangladesh. He is a very good expert in radiotherapy. And of course, uh, one expert medical doctors from Germany. And uh, you see here the number of people from different hospitals. That means here medical doctors and radiotherapist. And again, we give another course. You see here uh, a topic like commissioning of a linear accelerator basic and advanced treatment technique. The first course is actually we ask uh, different countries which course is needed for their uh, qualification. So they suggest us that this is the course we done. You see here from the industry people and of course from the university. And this is our last hands-on training workshop before the corona. So you see here also expert from abroad and the industry partner. And in the corona, we cannot do such types of training. So we started with uh, e-learning program. This is also a very good uh, program. You see here different e-learning program from here. Another is uh, radiotherapy, another is brachytherapy. And you see here uh, even imaging. And this course also designed is an accredited course and uh, participants not from South Asia, all over the world, uh, they, can, they took part in this course. And this course is accredited by IOMP or European uh, Board of uh, uh, Accreditation. And in this, after this, for different days, this course, sometimes its uh, uh, duration is month and different, every week, maybe one, one lecture. And after that, we have examination. When they pass the examination, they have the certificate, accredited certificate. When they do not pass, then we give them the present certificate. So here, for example, I do not, the time is uh, short. Here we have very, very ambitious courses like SBRT, MRT, MRI guided RT, IMRT, VMAT. You see here the uh, um, tomotherapy and proton beam and artificial intelligence. So these are the uh, experts from all over the world. And then this is also a very nice a uh, nice initiative, it is actually service training in the hospital. Yeah, we, we bring some expert from Germany or the other countries and he or she or the group go to the hospital and stay with the doctors and uh, in uh, medical physicist and work there. You see in different hospital, the expert is go there and this is a biomedical engineer, he repaired even uh, different e equipments. And here is another one. Uh, one radiotherapist and one medical physicist, they came in Bangladesh and they have one week in three hospital and they give direct training and work with the patient and the personal there. This is a very uh, a good initiative when people like such types of initiative. I think we will also uh, spread this initiative in other countries in South Asia. Here is also a uh, nuclear medicine medical doctors she come there and work in different hospitals. So here awareness program screening different you see many many awareness program we have done all over in Bangladesh but awareness program and screening it is with the patient uh, and, uh, the, uh, and the normal uh, population so we cannot do it uh, all over South Asia. So we are planning every country has their own awareness and screening program we arranging such types of programs. Here you see, this is also a very good initiative. 
We have done such types of awareness program to, to the minority people in Bangladesh in hill tracks. Yeah, they are different, not Bengali, others, and uh, we uh, give them a breast uh, on Here, even the screening and awareness program, we go to a uh, community hospital and we do the VIA and CBA campaign there. And you see, this is another initiative we are taking. SCMPR has a pool from people in South Asia or in any country in South Asia or outside South Asia, they need some support to send this expert. Here in Nepal, in Bokhtarpur, they, they needed a, a, a medical physicist to go there and do the, uh, do the uh, commissioning. So one expert from Bangladesh who they, are, they, they have done, air, he has done uh, the commissioning there and stayed there one month. This is also a very good initiative, I think. And you see a simpler health self group. This is actually in Europe, it is, uh, it is actually obvious, but in South Asia, especially Bangladesh, not. that means we, we make a group of the patient of same, same kind cancer, so the patient can talk each other and uh, they uh, exchange their, uh, their experiences so they give the mental strength and it is also an initiative we have started. And uh, this is the research area or uh, the SCMPR uh, do research with the students and medical physicians and doctors with different universities in India, Bangladesh and other countries in Europe. And we have also one point the nutrition medicine for prevention. This is our research area. And uh, of course, uh, radiotherapy, different things. You see, it, there is a newsletter. Uh, many of you experts have written also articles about uh, South Asian stand of medical physics and uh, cancer research. I asked you, please write. It is uh, twice in a year. And this is also um, an initiative. You see, we have also home page. You can go there. And it is a uh, details information is there. What we have done still now what is actually the future plan. And this is our uh, upcoming, we want to welfare home and cancer apps and digital library on of course the collaboration with South Asian universities and hospitals. This is my last slide and I can conclude with a African proverb to give corn to a needy person will make him die of hunger but teach and train him how to plant and he can feed his entire family. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jakaria, for your overview of the activities in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, and now we are running short of the time, so we have to run quickly. So I uh, hand over the floor back to you to continue to speakers and then last speaker I will take up, Dr. Jakaria. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And now the next speaker is, uh, the next speaker is uh, Frank Hensley, yes? No, uh, the next speaker is Arun Chokle. Uh, yes, we have introduced him. He's actually a man of education and training all over the world. Everybody knows him. Uh, is a uh, is a very good expert. He's you have heard uh, many many education accreditation from all over the world, and he he can give actually the education training of medical faces in up home initiatives. Yes, please, uh, Professor Chocolate. Uh, good afternoon to all of you and welcome to this mini symposium on education and training in a form region. Already Franco Milano has talked about the initiative of the syllabus for the masters in medical physics. I will be talking about the education training in medical physics, what a form has uh, taken the initiatives, accept my greetings on the behalf of the form. And as you know very well, that medical physicists are health professionals. And therefore, a mere academic training will not help. 
and that is how IOMP has stressed on education and training as one of the IDMP team for the medical physics. Now, as you know, since the discovery of X-rays in 1895, and immediately after that, the radioactivity, it was put to use into healthcare. And in 125 years, the technological revolution has taken place in therapy as well as diagnosis. And therefore, we need very highly competent, clinically qualified medical physicists and therefore IOMP policy statement one also suggests about that the medical physicists are health professionals and therefore the policy statement two gives about their education and training and therefore a lot of training programs started across the world now we have to it is not just the quantity but the quality of the education programs and that is what is needed to be assessed medical physicists are working in various areas in clinical settings in academia in industry accreditation agency standard and so many things and therefore the clinical medical physicists who are working into the health environment need to have a competency because they are directly influencing on the patient management in the healthcare and therefore a standardization and harmonization of the medical physics education program uh, was initiated and done by IAEA with the report of human health series number 25, which is endorsed by AAPM and IOMP. And if you know that as this is a professional uh, uh, of health profession, and therefore the certification, accreditation, registration, licensure, as required for doctors, nurses, or pharmacists is very, very important. What does certification do? It demonstrates that individual medical physicists is qualified and act independently without the supervision. What about the accreditation? Accreditation is of a medical education program. It has a certain standards. It meets the requirement, and therefore the education program is accredited. And then after doing so, you are registered as the health professionals and you get a licensor as a physician or nurses or other professionals. What do patient or society needs from you as a medical physicist? Professional competency, educational qualification, uh, the independence of the decision making, and therefore a certification of medical physicists is very, very important. And uh, as you very well know, uh, AFORM has taken a lot of initiatives for uh, strengthening of uh, the medical physics education and the profession. And therefore, it is promoting the research and diminish, dissemination of the knowledge and expertise to the official congresses of the C symposium, like this one, which is a regular feature, AOCMP is every year held. Unfortunately, this year, it is because of the COVID pandemic, it is going to be into the hybrid mode. And we promote guidelines of practice of standards and accreditation of medical physicists in collaboration with IMPCB, that's the International Medical Physics Certification Board and IAEA. We, you, we help in strengthening a strong relationship and exchange of information with other sub-regional organizations in Asia, Oceania, and we have a collaboration with the MEPFORM also for this education training. AFORM has started Professor Sung Seel Chu Best Student Publication Award in 2021 to encourage the students to carry on the research either during their master's study or in PhD study and do the good publication. Also, we have started CV Saraswati and Parmeshwaran Memorial Lab Best PhD Award to get a quality PhDs. Again, we have started PN Krishnamurti Memorial Lab Young Achiever Award, uh, what the additional value added by a young medical physicist for improvement of the medical physics uh, technology, the healthcare improvement. 
Also, we have started Professor Kionari Nomura from Oration, Outstanding Medical Physicist from the FOM region, FOM Journal Prize for the best publication in the FOM Journal, best oral presentation awards also will be done during this AOCMP 2021, best, best presentation award, travel grant, registration amount, discounts, and all those things we are doing. Also, we have started a form monthly webinar since June uh, 2020, and 18 webinars have been successfully held. We have started a form school monthly webinar of two and a half hours to three hours since June 2021 to impart the basic knowledge. AFOM has official journal, as you very well know, you will find it on the AFOM website, Physical Engineering Sciences and Medicine from the Australia, Radiological Physics and Technology from Japan, Journal of Medical Physics from India, this. As we look at the number of medical physicists and uh, the uh, per million population, you look at uh, the 20 medical physicists per million population to 0.56 million uh, medical physicists per million population. So this is a very, very contrast and a lot of variation in this thing. Though almost about 11,000 medical physicists work in a form region for about 4.4 billion population. Most of them, almost 71%, they work in radiotherapy and only 7% work in uh, the radiology. This needs to be changed. We have almost about 106 medical education program in various countries. Mostly they are two years master's program and uh, some are accredited many are not yet accredited and that is to be needed to be done in this area. So also you look at almost about 850 medical physics students, they get admitted every year, but the demand is very, very high. But if you look at the MP residency program, medical physics, only 10 uh, the countries, they have this uh, in place, 10 do not have yet, and only nine country, there is a registration of medical physicists as health professional or as an allied health professional. I, 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 FOM has brought a lot of policy statement for education, for CPD program, accreditation. So medical physicists are facing significant changes, particularly with a quick development, and therefore our effort is to modify the syllabus coping with the region and the requirement, and therefore we have taken the initiation by considering the task force to prepare this curriculum. And a lot of changes are happening, and there's an advanced syllabus which takes into account the personalization therapy, molecular imaging, clinical. So we are uh, in two sets of the syllabus we are uh, preparing. One is a standard one, another is an advanced one taking into the advanced requirement. Our education system should be tuned to the requirement of the region because AFOM is a very, very heterogeneous region and therefore it has to be tuned. It cannot be just like uh, uh, one code for everyone. With these things, uh, I thank uh, the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk with you about the AFOM initiatives to increase the visibility of the medical physics, standard of the medical physics. With this thing, I thank uh, the participant for your patience. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chogne, for the interesting talk. Uh, we have actually a very tight program. Uh, we must finish uh, at five o'clock, and we have two speakers left. If possible, please uh, shorten to your lectures and give very precise what you want to say. Because uh, at 15, we have an inauguration program and uh, we should uh, present also there. Now is uh, Dr. Hensley. Uh, he is actually a very good expert in German. Uh, uh, Germany, and uh, he has uh, contributed a lot to do a lot of medical physics in Germany. We are very happy to have you here in this AFUM conference. 
and his topic is organization of practical training in medical physics please dr hansley good afternoon i would like to discuss some aspects of the organization of practical training in medical physics <laughs> medical physics education has two major pillars first the creation of basic knowledge which usually happens at specialized universities usually in connection with a teaching hospital this is necessary because this teaching can usually not be accomplished by classical universities since they need special medical equipment like medical linear accelerators, planning systems, CT units, and other medical diag uh, diagnostic equipment. And because academic teachers usually do not have the practical expertise to teach the skills connected with using the medical uh, equipment. The second pillar is practical experience. To make independent decisions, just like physicians, medical physicists need several years of practical experience with a sufficient number of real medical cases in the real hospital situation, that is, within the interaction of the different involved disciplines, under the real time constraints, in real patient situations and within the real workflow at a hospital. Such practical training is required by international professional organizations and described in recommendations and guidelines. For instance, the IOMP policy statement number two requires practical um, training of minimum two years, which must be supervised by a qualified um, medical physicist who is active in the trained field and which follows a structured uh, curriculum consisting of individual guidance of the trainee and hands-on training. The required topics, uh, the numbers of training cases and the organization of training programs are described in the IAEA training courses, International Atomic Energy agency training courses, <clears throat> which um, gives the topics and the required numbers of training cases and gives uh, advice for the organization of a training program <clears throat> for the different fields of radiation medicine, radiation oncology, for diagnostic medicine, and nuclear medicine in three separate reports. Still, only few countries have active residency programs. Typical reasons for that are that national trading programs have not been uh, agreed on yet, that the hospitals do not provide paid trainee positions so that physicists cannot afford um, a training, and because national regulations are missing. Structured training programs must be implemented nationally. Teaching curricula and the requirement for minimum numbers of training cases must be adjusted to the national needs and the possibilities in each country. Nationally accepted steering and supporting bodies are needed. These must ensure the completeness of curricula and provide national accreditation and provide the requirement of, of accreditation for positions in medical physics. And all this must happen in accordance with international guidelines and uh, accreditation uh, schemes. It must happen in accordance with the professional societies, both in physics and in medicine, and in accordance with national regulations. If these things do not exist, they can and they should be organized by the practicing medical physicists themselves. They can work out the training topics as needed in their country, they, and they can do this together with the medical physics professional society, if one exists, with the practitioners in the different fields of medical physics, and with the radiation oncology or diagnostic professional societies in their country. They can themselves generate a support board which gives advice for the residency program and which selects and accredits teacher. And importantly, they must work out the documentation of the training uh, so that the trainee has evidence of what he has learned 
and they should work together with the national authorities to install national regulations and, and uh, accreditation and work together with the international societies like IOM IOMP to, on the longer run, obtain international accreditation. So, in conclusion, practical training programs can be organized by the medical physicists themselves using international recommendations, by organizing a supporting board uh, themselves, by organizing a documentation of the practice, and by working together with professional societies and national authorities. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Frank, for uh, giving the importance of practical training uh, to be a clinically qualified medical physicist because he is a, he or she will be a health professional so practical training importance and you are referred to the documents of IAEA and also IUMP <coughs> too thank you very much for this thing because we have limited time because the inauguration program will be starting dear participant if you have any questions or queries please type in the chat box so I will try to collect and put as time permits. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kanchan Adhikari, who is very active in Nepal and also internationally and well-known figure uh, in uh, uh, medical physics. Without uh, losing more time, I hand over the floor to Dr. Kanchan Adhikari and request him to finish in 15 minutes so that we have some few questions, discussions, and then we have to hand over the floor back to the organizers as the inauguration program is already fixed up. So it is over to Dr. Kanchan Adhikari. Thank you, Professor Chogli, sir, for, uh, for this um, short introduction. First of all, I would like to, without taking much time, first of all, I would like to thank AFO MP Organizing Committee uh, for providing me this opportunity to be here in front of you. So um, we have started our uh, using radiation uh, in medicine since 1923. And on, uh, last, in 2015, we have uh, introduced the first blood irradiated in the country. And um, I don't want to go in detail. So uh, this might be interesting to you. Because actually, uh, medical thesis, first medical physicist in Nepal was from India, Professor Gauri Shankar Pant. He, he was from All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He was sent to run the nuclear medicine, medicine as well as CT imaging services at National Academy of Medical Sciences, BROS. But later, he, was been, uh, he has been um, actively participating in teaching for MD resident um, residency program at Tribune University Teaching Hospital. In 1989, first position for the medical physicist was created, and Mr. P. P. Chaurasia was the first medical physicist in Nepal. And later on, um, after the um, uh, B.P. Korela Memorial Cancer Hospital, Bharatpur and Bhaktapur Cancer Hospital, will uh, we, we have, will have some more medical physicists in Nepal. So, Nepalis Association of Medical Physicists was um, established in 2009. Uh, so, soon after the uh, member, uh, soon after the establishment, we became the member uh, from uh, IUMP as well as AFMP since 2010, and we we have we became the founder member of the International Medical Physics Certification Board since May 2010. So in, I would like to uh, take back, um, take a little bit back to you. Uh, I'll take um, back. So um, in my opinion, the new area, era for the medical physicist was started in 2004 when one of the um, uh, neurosurgeon doctor from my hospital became the health minister of the country. And I have, uh, did, I have had, uh, I had an opportunity to discuss with him how we can improve the radiation service to treat the um, brain tumors. And we have discussed that we, we should have some kind of law regulations and we, uh, to and also to let's let's make Nepal a member country of the IAEA. Then he was offered us some few projects to complete um, about what is the status of radiation uh, in Nepal. So we have done two, um, uh, two projects. 
back to back in 2004 and 2005, 2005 and we have completed in 2006. So we have organized the national school, national symposium in front of the policy makers and high level officials of the government of Nepal. And then we have tried, and um, I'm happy to say that medical physicians lead this project. So, so that uh, the most of the people came to know what is the medical physicist um, at that time. So we, we were able to highlight the role and responsibility of the medical physicist in Nepal in front of the high level officials. And I would like to say that 2008 was the turning point for Nepal. So we became the member country of the IAEA with, with long of, with long, a lot of, uh, a lot with a lot of involvement in this type of work. And and medical physicist has had a chance to lead the designing of the national project. So we have designed the national project for the country. So an IATC project was started first time in 2012 and medical physicist had a chance to lead the project as a national project counterpart. Under that project, we have received a lot of um, equipment as well as um, the project was, uh, it's, it's called strengthening, uh, radiation uh, strengthening radiation safety infrastructure in the Nepal. It's a NEP 9001, it was the project name was under that project we have to um, draft the nuclear law regulations and everything so, so and i and since then uh, medical physicists role and responsibilities are somewhat recognized not only in health but also in the radiation safety areas and medical physicists were trained in radiation therapy and radiation safety under the lot of fellowships by the iea fellowships training and scientific visits so uh, in, at current status, we have a lot of equipment, newer modalities of equipment are being imported in the country and also they are, they, they are being installed, but lack of regulations and lack of law and also the lack of medical physicists, competent qualified medical physicists also create a lot of problems. So in total, we are still only 19 physicists for the country. It's less than 1% per, if you compare to the 4 million inhabitants. So this is the little bit busy side. So I. I have tried to uh, show the, the institute with their equipment and number of radiation oncology medical physicians working and the service, what they are provided. So we, we are going to have some more cancer centers in Nepal. So con construction of the bunker has already completed in most of them. It's a Naval, Naval Cancer Hospital and Virat Cancer Hospital. It's a certain part of the Nepal. And uh, one, one and civil service hospital of Nepal has already uh, purchase the equipment and uh, and and the Tribune University Teaching Hospital is this is one of the biggest uh, public hospital in Nepal. They have already constructed a bunker and they are on the process to purchase the new linear accelerators. So uh, we have done a lot of activities uh, mainly uh, related to medical physics and the, during the pandemic era. So um, uh, this these are equipment we received. Uh, this is mainly physics quality control equipment we received from the IEA and we have, we have handed over to the BP Poirel and Memorial Cancer Hospital. And recently we have also handed one more um, well, yeah, 4D gating system to the BP Poirel Cancer Hospital under the uh, national project. It's, it's a strengthening radiation, the call is strengthening radiation therapy services in Nepal. So medical physicists, um, I'm, I'm happy to see that I'm um, lucky to be, a, um, I'm happy to be a, a part of this um, project. So, and we have also uh, organized just after the earthquake, we have organized one um, uh, RAS, um, uh, it's a regional cooperation agreement project um, uh, of, about education and training of the medical physicists in Nepal in Kathmandu. And, uh, and similarly, in time to time, we have um, organized um, different um, kind of medical physics activity in Nepal. So medical physicists also involved in radiation awareness program organized by the government of Nepal, Ministry of Science and Technology. So we have um, um, uh, high level, we have mainly trained the medical uh, radiation workers um, uh, in different part of the country. So we have traveled a lot to educate them how to save, how to handle the radiation sources and how how can you uh, prepare your, uh, it's, it's like a, um, a training program. So uh, medical thesis also involved in drafting law and regulation in Nepal. So we have recently completed um, the draft of, of um, 
uh, radiation uh, we have uh, we have drafted the radiation um, regulation so under that i am very happy to see it later on so we have conducted a lot of meetings lot of international training lot of um, uh, international books we have um, uh, gone through before we completed um, our draft regulation and um, recently minister uh, they, they, uh, ministry of science uh, ministry of health and population there is a one committee to above um, uh, to um, approve the import of the uh, it's it's like a it's a it's a kind of regulatory uh, service but under it's a, under the ministry of health so we we, we usually look at the uh, on, uh, their requirements and condition and will approve the import of the import they usually provide the import license as, as well as recently then the same committee has started inspecting inspecting uh, radiation bunker or in uh, the place where uh, that radiation humanity equipment will be kept in the future so not only the safety as we have we, we were also involved in security um, of the radioactive sources uh, with the because we have we have been partnership with the us government de de department of, uh, of energy it's called the office of radiological security they have provided us the physical protection management system in, in different category one sources so we have installed this type of equipment and recently we have also organized one uh, training course in Kathmandu with the inclusion of a lot of um, uh, participants from Bangladesh and Nepal they have organized for um, this, this training for the for the Bangladesh and Nepal in Kathmandu. So like other countries we have still a lot of issues like regarding the roles and the roles and responsibilities, regulatory structure, registration certification and staffing level, education and training and continuing processing professional revision but so there are some issues that non non qualified person has done some the radiation survey and uh, and he mentioned that there is a leakage and um, um, this has created a havoc in, among the radiation workers so so that 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 uh, there was also happened in nepal and what, what, these are the things which i have highlighted here so medical physician profession is yet to be regulated by the government or competent authority in Nepal, yet to have licensing, registration or certificate system for the medical physicians. And there is also the lack of medical physics position in the government system. But I am very happy to share the, my one information that recently my hospital NAMS, National Academy of Medical Science under the government Nepal, we have created three medical physics position uh, for the government of Nepal. But there are some still some issues uh, because because um, um, uh, they are unclear the uh, under which service or under which category medical physics belongs to but i have already tried my best to medical physics is its own so, uh, category so we, you have to uh, bring medical physics under the medical physics category not under the radiology or not on the radiation oncology it's, it's going on and the rules and regulations regarding medical physics are still lagging lagging lacking and we have done some work about um, are you hearing me clearly yeah 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 everything clear Fine. okay Excellent. no worries no worries <laughs> but sometimes it, it looks like i'm talking to myself you know no 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 no, no, no. <laughs> it's okay. yeah, and Nepal, i have already been uh, we we still do not have medical physics education and training but we, we are trying my my institution it's called a deemed university it's a university hospital so, because we only provide med, uh, masters uh, postgraduate education uh, for the radio uh, uh, clinical subject like uh, from pathology to radiology and uh, every for radiation oncology and and we are we are also providing bsc mi medical imaging technology and we are running uh, msc medical imaging technology but we still do not have medical physics program but we are working on that and we are parties i have already mentioned that we are participating various iarc regional project which is mainly focused on medical physics and their educations and, uh, the, these are the list and last week we have completed this sim ra6088 non it's a not uh, it's a uh, developing it's a uh, strengthening education and technical training of program for the medical physicists it's a the four year completion was a new the new project is upcoming which starts from the 2022 about the medics and also also focus on medical physics education and training and one expert mission under the IEA has been completed professor kuan from uh, malaysia he was there and we have already 
submitted uh, submitted a report and uh, uh, try to uh, convince our dean office to start the medical physics program in in the country and on the book and also uh, some uh, medical physicians are studying in abroad abroad um, uh, and some medical lot of five medical until now five candidates from nepal have already been graduated from the into ictp uh, with the help of with the with the, with the sponsorship of the uh, international atomic energy agency and some uh, medical physicians have went the completed their the postgraduate from the um, bangladesh as well some few are studying in uh, from bangladesh india as well as uh, some um, i came to know that some uh, two uh, medical physicians studying on the at uh, sri lanka right now and they are supposed to finish soon and uh, we, uh, as we all know, the newer technology are coming very fast uh, in radiation uh, therapy. So we, there, there is there are some challenges to adapt uh, and uh, adapt with uh, the newer technologies and an um, insufficient number of physics Q and quality QAQC um, instrument. And to start the academic program for the medical physics is also challenging because of because we we have to uh, first of first of all we have to create some academic posts for the medical fee system and to create the um, uh, opportunities for the scientific research and additional um, responsibility to safety and security of the radioactive sources to create more job position we have to create more job um, it's also a challenge and the main i think the one of the most important challenge is to stop the brain drain as most of the country in this part of the nepal we are facing this one before I finish, I would like to. Uh, this is our um, uh, nu nuclear law, whatever you say, uh, it's a nuclear law or radiation law, but actually the name is the Radioactive Materials Utilization and Regulation Act. And this is recent, uh, the, we, uh, we, uh, we bring this, bring out this um, uh, during the pandemic time in 2020. And, and I'm happy to say that uh, I have already mentioned that medical fees are being involved in drafting regulation. So, in the first time in the history of Nepal, we have written. What did what medical fees? Who, who does the quality control test? Who does the radiation protection? Who does the planning? We have already mentioned uh, regarding uh, medical exposure, um, uh, occupational exposure. But first time, until and unless we do, do not have any written um, uh, things about the medical fees in in the Nepal. So um, actually, then um, uh, this is happening, and then I hope you, it will continue. So, uh, in conclusion, yet to have the medical fees in diagnostic radiology and nuclear medicine because we have to. We uh, I am trying my best to uh, to bring one at least one medical fees in the field of diagnostic. Otherwise, we are going to face a problem in the future because of our technology. Technology there there are the other other technologies are upcoming. Um, so, let's hope we will have a, a diagnostic medical fees very soon. Uh, the recognition of the medical standards are still lacking in Nepal, but but I would like I have already said that I have already said that uh, situation getting better with the inclusion of the medical fees in different government committees, mainly related to radiation safety, radiation law, inspection, evaluation, and also involved medical fees in developing and drafting radiation regulation of Nepal. The number of medical fees is very uh, few. Um, is less less than one percent, and we we yet to I have already mentioned yet to have postgraduate program in medical physics. The need of medical physicists is worldwide and duly so recognized, but it's more acute in Nepal. So we are having uh, some institutes are having Indian um, medical physicists from India. So use of international recommendation guidelines protocols by the medical physicists and health authorities will contribute to patient care in radiation used in medicine. So uh, I would like to thank all the medical physicians, those who are working and they are, they are doing their best in Nepal. So these are, uh, before I complete, I would like to show the beautiful picture of Nepal. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, it's, Dr. It's, Kanchan Adhikari. Yeah. And uh, you are tempting the delegates to come to Nepal, I think, yes. by showing yes. the images. <laughs> yeah, thank yes. you very much. So you have covered the the starting of medical physics services in Nepal and yes. how we have grown. Mm -hmm. Still then, what are the difficulties and the requirement and the challenges? Thank you for covering the entire gamut of uh, medical physics growth in Nepal with the challenges and uh, the requirement. Thank you very much uh, for Thank your you. talk. So in this uh, 
uh, session, uh, the special symposium, we had uh, five talks starting from Franco Milano. Doctor, uh, he talked about the syllabus and the curriculum, what should be there. Then uh, Professor Jakaria, he talked about uh, the need of uh, Southeast Asia for the medical physics. Then I talked about the FOM initiative. Then uh, uh, the uh, the Hensley uh, Frank Hensley talked about the uh, residency program, the actually training program, how it is important. And uh, finally, uh, Kanchana Dikari talked about uh, the uh, the medical physics in Nepal, in particular and the challenges and these things. Any questions, any queries are there? I asked to type uh, in the chat box, but I did not receive anything. Uh, any one of the panelists, uh, the speaker want to add on one or two minutes because we have to wind up this session because uh, the, uh, the inauguration session is already set in. So anything additional input, uh, uh, the Franco or uh, Milano or Frank Hensley or anybody want to add up so that we can take up and then uh, we can close uh, this session. Franco, do you want to add anything after listening to everyone? No, starting no from I, you? Think, I think no, probably it's, uh, it's uh, we start a uh, the right way and I think I'm confident that very soon we will have a strong integration with uh, syllabi, practical things and so on. So the way is clear. The way is clear. Thank you. May, so I, Frank, may I add something? For oh, sure. Yeah. Actually, in my opinion, we, we have to glamorize, actually glamorize the medical physics profession. So more people can uh, come into the right and more um, people, knowledgeable people can come. So that's why I am trying my best to glamorize it in Nepal. So, so, um, so until and unless um, you, you saw what are the, uh, what are the, what works you are doing, what, what kind of um, contribution you are doing uh, to benefit the um, uh, patient, then um, more and more uh, physicists will um, um, come to our field. That's what yeah. I think. Yeah, that content I agree with you because uh, many even into the uh, university physics department, what yeah. actually medical physicists and what role they play and what future has that. So we have to go out of our uh, yes. planning room and the hospital to the science colleges, engineering colleges yeah. and the universities to tell about the prospects of the medical physicists and so that we attract good students uh, yes. into this research. I agree with you. Uh, Frank you. Hensley, do yes. you want to add something? Um, yes, maybe just on, on, on to your last comment. Um, yes, we need to attract uh, good students and we also need to make clear <clears throat> that medical physics, in contrast to many other um, parts of physics, is a um, is a field which has positions because we need the medical physicists. If you are yeah. studying physics and uh, um, and you may be interested in astronomy, that is a fascinating uh, field. But to get a, po a position to, to earn on, I think medical physics is actually more practical. So this is something we should also tell people that uh, sometime in in your career it may be worthwhile thinking of switching to medical physics. The, the one other thing I would like to mention is that, especially in the South Asian uh, region, we can see that a very important um, <clears throat> aspect that, that, can be, uh, that can be strengthened is international co uh, collaboration. And I think we've seen this from Bangladesh, where um, the institutions in Bangladesh have very many, or also in India, of course, have very many students from other countries coming over, learning there, getting practical experience going back or this, these exchange things, these, this network, I think is a very important uh, feature in, in, in the medical physics education and in developing, building up the, uh, the system of medical physics. And I think this is something we should always, always try to do as, as strongly as, as possible and really exchange people. If there's a need for a medical physicist in another country, someone from somewhere else can come over like, um, 
Abu Zakaria showed in the example of the physicist uh, going from Bangladesh to, to, to Nepal to, um, to commission a, a linear accelerator. And things like this can happen much more often. And I think it's not actually that difficult in the South Asian region. Even though it is a big part of the world, uh, people are very close, live very close to, uh, together there and, and, and communicate a lot. And we should take advantage of that. Uh, I echo your sent sentiment, Franco, uh, Frank, and uh, in my plenary talk, that's what I talked about is international collaboration, collaboration with the near neighboring yes. countries. And also during the our council meeting, I stressed much more upon the collaboration between the nearing countries. You can exchange the expert, the professionals uh, by physically going or by uh, even the technology, what you have provided. So that collaboration is very, very important. We have within our borders or boundaries, we are there. So we have to come out of the borders and boundaries and uh, impart our expertise, exchange the thing that is very, very important. So once again, I thank all the speakers uh, uh, for giving insight into the medical physics education, profession, training, and status and all. And I need to close this session because already a few minutes left for the inauguration session. Thanks, you, all the speakers. Thanks, the delegate, for active thank participation. You, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.
I still remember that morning, the day I first set foot on the campus as a student. I couldn't imagine that the campus of a private university is so large. Yes, I'm talking about United International University. Built on 25 bigas of land, 30% is built up area and 70% is open space. There was a large corridor in front with a lot of students. I went ahead with a surprised look. As soon as I entered the class, all the new faces stared at me. They were my university classmates. Sir entered the classroom, lesson started. The way of teaching was different. He explained everything in a simple way. Beyond theory classes, there were associated laboratory classes on different subjects. A large number of computer labs for meeting the needs of CSE students. Socket lab, machine lab, digital lab, microprocessor lab, communication lab. All are equipped with modern setup for producing competent AAA graduates. Civil engineer labs to prepare civil engineer students to design and build modern infrastructure. The robotics lab is the place for innovation and discovery in this era of fourth industrial revolution. In advanced intelligent multidisciplinary systems lab, researchers are exploring the application of IT in multifaceted domains including health sector. Center for Energy Research CER, is dedicated to the research in producing clean energy. It is thus helping the country to combat against effects of climate change. It has modern servers and data centers of international standard to keep the campus live online without interruption for a second. Proverb goes that the more you read, the more you learn. There is a spacious library stuffed with so many books and a pleasant calm environment for serious reading. Spending time with friends in a lovely green environment was really very exciting. Large playground over the horizon cannot be forgotten. Suddenly, I was in trouble. It would be too late to get money from home. A friend advised me to go to the DSA office. I went and got an interest-free education loan. What a relief it was for me. There is no end to the benefits. There's a game room, gymnasium, nice canteen, large auditorium, plenty of benefits. Is it possible to pass without good results? So, study, study and study. I got scholarships several times along with many of my classmates. The wheel of success of this organization is moving forward under the leadership of our Honorable VC Sir, Professor Dr. Chaudhary Mafizur Rahman. And that's why United International University has been accredited by ACBSP, IEB, SEMA, and has been ranked in Asia by QS. The main secret behind this is the quality of education and all the modern facilities. Time passes by. A special day comes. I got the certificate of graduation from the chancellor. Today, during my busy schedules at work, even though I'm far away, I still remember the key contributor of my success, the United International University. Today, Graduates of United International University are working successfully in home and abroad, bearing the flag of this noble institution, United International University, quest for excellence. Launching a new era. PTW Beam Scan, the new water phantom. Automated, wireless, fast. PTW.
beams you up to a new era in 3D water scanning. Cancer touches us all in one way or another. That's why we're dedicated to connecting all care to realize a world without fear of cancer. We're achieving that through intelligent cancer care, through building shorter paths from research to remission, bridging the distance between Manhattan and Mozambique, driving a direct link from high tech to high impact, and resolutely facing today's unique challenges by connecting the world through more personalized treatment, more data-driven decision-making, more direct access to care, and a new, more unifying, smarter standard of oncology. We're all connected through intelligent cancer care. We're not waiting for the future. We're creating it. Imagine radiation treatment that's easier, more efficient, and delivers therapies in record time without compromising on quality. Because quality of care is so important, there's innovative beam shaping technology combined with 100% image guidance and patient positioning. This is a new way of thinking, a transformation designed to help more patients enhance their well-being and comfort in less time. Together with our customers, we've led radiotherapy innovation for years. Now we're creating its future.
I still remember that morning, the day I first set foot on the campus as a student. I couldn't imagine that the campus of a private university is so large. Yes, I'm talking about United International University. Built on 25 bigas of land, 30% is built up area and 70% is open space. There was a large corridor in front with a lot of students. I went ahead with a surprised look. As soon as I entered the class, all the new faces stared at me. They were my university classmates. Sir entered the classroom, lesson started. The way of teaching was different. He explained everything in a simple way. Beyond theory classes, there were associated laboratory classes on different subjects. A large number of computer labs for meeting the needs of CSE students. Socket lab, machine lab, digital lab, microprocessor lab, communication lab. All are equipped with modern setup for producing competent triple graduates. Civil engineer labs to prepare civil